This is Audible. Zombie Lake, Still Alive, Book One, written by Javin Bonds, performed by S. W. Salzman, forward read by Kevin Pierce. Forward. I first connected with Javin online. He'd listened to one of my audiobooks and had reached out through Facebook. We connected and quickly developed an easygoing friendship online. I was touched and honored when he asked me to read and write a foreword for his latest novel. I hope I don't muck this up for him, because Javin is an extraordinary man. Despite losing his eyesight in 2010 and now losing his hearing from a form of muscular dystrophy, he keeps writing day after day. He never gives up. I really admire the guy and his work. His first novel was Free State of Dodge, a post-apocalyptic prepper story, something in my wheelhouse. So I was surprised that he was writing something else that I knew I had to read, this book you're holding right now. It's a zombie apocalypse with some pretty cool twists. Playing pirate is the way his protagonist, hardcore southern boy Mo, survived the initial outbreak of the apocalypse. Now he and his motley crew need to take themselves off the dinner menu find other survivors and family members if still alive, and build themselves an island. Now in Javin's world, there is no hard and fast rules, like some of the movies out there. Except the big one, don't get bit, because if you're bit, you become one of the particularly nasty undead peavies, and your hunger for human flesh will never be sated. That and no more Tim Hortons, which would be a serious tragedy, and you're here to read about a zombie apocalypse. With that, I hope you'll love Still Alive, Book One, Zombie Lake, the first in a proposed series that'll leave you rocking and rolling in laughter and cringing at the near misses as Javin tortures his bizarre mix of characters. Boyd Craven III, international best-selling author of the World Burns series. Introduction My name is Mo Collins. This is the beginning of a journal detailing my experiences after the end of the world. I know what you're thinking, so don't even fucking say it. Yeah, I share the same name as that chick on Mad TV. Every third person I have met since the late 90s has told me that, but I easily predate her rise to fame, so my parents didn't name me after her. Apparently, they just hated me at birth. They named me Elmo. Yeah, go ahead and snicker. I'm used to it. Anyway... I am 29 as of this writing. The company I work for is Davy Jones Locker Incorporated. Well, I guess it's not work since I don't get paid anymore. DJ's is a company that used to build and sail replica pirate ships around U.S. waterways, up and down the Mississippi and connecting rivers. The Viva Ancora is my home, a caravel modeled after the famous ships of the 1400s. Caravels were engineered with flat bottoms, shallow drafts, that way they can navigate inland rivers. We used to sail from the Great Lakes and through various rivers, then into the Gulf of Mexico, snake around Florida, and all the way up to the East Coast. The Cora would then turn around and repeat the same journey endlessly. It takes about three years to make one complete round trip. Since I have only been part of the crew for a year, I've yet to see the ocean, at least from the boat. As a side note, Viva Ancora is Italian for still alive, or technically alive still. If anyone ever told me that the ship had been named to memorialize a similar vessel that had been captured as a pirate ship, I had not been paying attention. The reason for her name was never really clear to me, but looking at the current world situation, I would say it's certainly fitting. Our crew, which was between seven and nine people depending on the part of the route we were on, lovingly called her the Cora. We would stop at ports where the crew would give tours to bratty elementary school kids and their fat teachers. I had to field stupid questions from the little brats. Do you have a wooden leg? Do you live on the boat? Have you ever had scurvy? Do you have a parrot or a monkey? And every other query they could think to ask. Yeah, kids. Since the dead started walking, I have been living on the boat. I obviously don't have scurvy yet. If I had a parrot or monkey, well, I would have had a decent breakfast this morning. The Cora was advertised as the most historically accurate sailing ship of its class. If you were to simply view it from dock, you would agree. 
because you would not be able to see that the ship features electricity, a gas-powered motor, full galley, and even had Wi-Fi. I'm pretty sure Columbus didn't have toilet paper and running water. I was thinking the same thing you are, just crap over the rail, right? That was until the captain, in one of his infamously detailed lectures about medieval sailing ships, told me that it was now illegal to defecate in the national waterways. Of course, since I no longer have to worry about being arrested by the Coast Guard, one of my favorite pastimes is defecating into a bucket and throwing it over the side. I graduated from Douglas High School, where I was a mediocre student with slightly higher than mediocre grades. Maybe it's self-embellishment, but I believe my looks to be at least mediocre. God forbid I was Mr. Future Underwear model quarterback like my little brother, Easy. But I'm not so ugly you have to tie a pork chop around my neck to get the dog to play with me. I drove mediocre cars. A red Pontiac Grand Am, for one. Later, I dropped out of community college, then failed my attempt to join the military due to a mediocre heart problem that I didn't even know I had. I was just wandering through life with mediocre jobs. You get the picture. I was basically a bastion of underachievement, a jack of no trades, and that was just fine with me. There was a terrifying alternative. I would finally land a decent job, then find a tolerable wife. Next, settle into life in Marshall County like everyone else I graduated with. As fate would have it, one day I accidentally saw an online advertisement for my current, or should I say previous employer, Davy Jones Locker Incorporated. They were looking for someone to pirate up and down the waterways in North America. I applied using my parents' address. Unbelievably, I got hired. My brother Easy is not completely bad, and I don't technically hate him, even though it might seem like it sometimes. He is three years my junior. When we were growing up, he was my best friend, even though once I moved out, I only saw him at family reunions and some holidays. It just so happens that for the first time since I joined the crew, we are docked at Guntersville Lake on the Tennessee River, only 15 miles from where I grew up. My parents guilted me into promising to call them any time we anchored on the Tennessee so we could have family time. I would have called just like I promised, but it slipped my mind. I had decided to stay on board and couldn't get cell service from the lake. In hindsight, I guess that was probably for the best. Staying on the ship is most likely what saved my life. If I had been able to let them know I was in town, we would have been out at the steakhouse or sitting at home on the couch when the shit hit the fan. That means I'd be among the undead like the majority of the crew. I do enjoy my independence, but they are still my mama and daddy. I should have seen them once we docked. Since you're reading this journal, you're most likely a local, so you know that everyone from Alabama refers to their parents as mama or daddy. This is not something only small children do. My daddy calls his father daddy. I choose to believe that they have survived. My mother is pretty good at growing a garden. My father is what I would call a casual survivalist with a few rifles and shotguns, so I guess they could have grown a little food and protected their own space. Plus, they live out in the boonies, away from the riot zones, so they could still be alive. Anyway, unless we find someone to operate the TVA dam, which is not likely, I am probably going to end up dying right here in the backwater that I tried to get away from my whole life. The damn dams have us trapped in large man-made lake. We could travel north up the Tennessee River, but we would just come to another dam, wedged between the Guntersville Dam and the Nickajack Dam, damn it. Well... Y'all know I'm from Alabama, and while I do have a heavy southern accent, our can't rhymes with our ain't, I'm not some stupid redneck. I've actually met stupid rednecks, and those are people you never want to be compared with. Another stereotype I need to dismiss, not all southerners are racist. In fact, not many are, and I certainly am not. Also, you will notice that I enjoy pepper in this journal with four-letter words. Mama hates to hear it and refuses to acknowledge that I use this kind of language. Of course, there's a good chance she'll probably never read this. I hope. I guess you could say I'm lucky that I'm poor in a tight wad. That was the real reason I stayed on board with our American Indian cook, Crow. The rest of the crew went out to celebrate our dear Captain Barr's 15th anniversary on the Cora. That was a few days ago, the same day the zombie virus reached this far north. Either the crew actually gave a shit about that evil little man, or they simply wanted some Japanese food. Either way, while the crew was eating raw fish, it just so happened that the dead sauntered into town. 
our beloved shipmates have yet to return. My guess is they are naked, blue, and crapping in the woods. Crow also seems to dislike everyone with a penis. She stayed galley-bound. I was not willing to spend my money so that I could fellowship with those some bitches. Lucky us, we were not on land when Guntersville was washed pale blue and covered in shit. We survived, and can now share one another's company. Oh, joy! Crow is about my age, and claims to be Kiawa Apache. You can tell she is an Indian because of her straight black hair and her somewhat darker skin but also because she can predict within the hour wherever we are and whatever time of day or night if it is going to rain. That sounds Native American to me. I don't know what I was expecting, but her voice does not indicate her plane's ancestry, at least not according to every movie I have ever seen and the few real-life examples I can recall. She just sounds like your typical Jenny from the block. To be fair, I've never had much of a conversation with her. I have no problem living with a chick who doesn't talk constantly, but it is a bit creepy to be around a female that speaks even less than most guys, except to offer these fucking cryptic one-liners of hers. Fortunately, she is not disgustingly ugly either. I'd rank her at a 6.5 or maybe a 7 out of 10 on the hotness scale. Of course, the longer we're alone on board, the more I think I wouldn't mind hooking up with her but I don't think we could ever actually connect like that. She's just not my type. And besides, she bats for her own team. She is a rarity, one of those lesbians that are actually attractive to men. I'm not sure of her real name. Everyone simply calls her Crow. I never got it. She's not particularly bird-like, though she can be as irritating as a loud scavenger bird when we haven't had much to eat. I assume it's just some tribal nickname. It's too bad about her obvious sexual preference. I know that in every TV show, movie, book, there is a statistically overproportionate number of homosexual characters, when really something like only 3% of the American population is openly gay. Hell, if you go by the entertainment industry, then 75% of the population is wearing an earring in their right ear. I suppose it's just my typical bad luck that my only crewmate is a girl that eats pie. Since the plague hit Guntersville, the two of us had had a few clipped conversations about getting injured or even bitten. While she agreed to crush my white boy head like an overripe watermelon if I got an obvious bite, I understand that she knows some type of Indian shaman mumbo-jumbo. And can sit a broken bone with spit and mud or some shit, so that's a plus. It's too bad I didn't go to nursing school like my perfect brother. Skill with medicine might have come in handy right about now. We haven't had many face-to-face -face encounters with the PVs yet and there's enough food on board to last for months, if you add the fish we catch. We live on a boat, so naturally every member of the crew had a fishing rod, and there's not much else to do. Anyway, I've been busy scavenging, so I don't have to exist solely on Crow's fish. We are actually pretty happy about being on the boat. As we have seen countless times in the past several days, Peavy's can't swim, and Crow and I each handle three rods simultaneously. If you're a child or just childish, like I am, you probably laughed at the mention of handling rods. But enough with the lame introduction. I just figured you should know something about the person who wrote this journal. If I make it long enough, these pages will serve to detail the trials of a survivor near Ground Zero, Mobile, Alabama, of the terrorist manufactured virus that was unleashed on the American continent. I am going to store this book in a locker underneath my bed in the captain's quarters on the ship. It will be as you guessed it. If you're reading this, then I am probably dead. Hopefully not undead. 1. Mo. Journal Entry 1. So just over a week ago, the ship arrived in Marshall County. We docked at the pier beside the big bridge on the northeast end of Guntersville Island. This description has always pissed me off, by the way. Guntersville is not an island. Downtown is a man-made peninsula attached by concrete bridge on the north side by U.S. Highway 431, and there's a causeway, basically a land bridge to the east, south, and west. There's a huge-ass section of land on the southwest corner. The city is surrounded by water on three sides, making it, yeah, a peninsula. People from Guntersville have always spoken as if they were superior to everyone else from Marshall County because they have an island. Suck it, islanders. 
close, but no cigar. For days following the outbreak, every news network had doctors, scientists, military tacticians, and other pseudo-experts as commentators. They were analyzing and debating the sick, infected plague victims, PVs for short. They talked about an inevitable cure, but no one's come up with anything yet. I am so glad I never have to watch TV again. These guys refuse to just call PVs what they are. The blue lunatics are nothing but dead, soulless zombies. They are untreatable monsters that can't be reasoned with. Peavies are dead. Whatever it is about them that keeps them walking around is hell-bent on making everyone else just as dead. During whatever last television broadcasts, a reporter stated that the term zombie was insensitive. It was something only a hick would call one of the infected. One was ignorant if referring to any of the plague victims as anything but what they were, diseased. You know what? Fuck you, Piers Morgan. I'm not going to keep reminding myself that they are helplessly compelled to hurt others by some sickness. I'm going to think of them as mindless, ravenous, undead husks. On top of everything else, I don't need to feel guilty about murdering innocent people to survive. You'll never have to worry about having to fight for your survival anyway. You stupid British bastard. You couldn't imagine the horror of defending yourself with a firearm. More than one talking head has theorized that this could possibly just be the next step in human evolution. We should not even try to stop it. That is the most ridiculous thing that has ever been said. I'm no scientist, but I can sure as hell tell you that these infected zombies are not on a higher evolutionary plane than we are. We bathe, cook our food, and we don't make a habit of shitting ourselves. Oh, and we don't eat human flesh either. Even considering my passionate hatred for Piers Morgan's worthless news anchoring, I have to give credit where credit is due. He was the first to name the afflicted Peavies. Morgan was one of the first media retards to demand that the undead be called plague victims, rather than pop culture names like zombies, walkers, undead, etc. His name was quickly shortened to P.V. It ultimately became P.V. Ironically, the father of this nickname would probably compare it to a racial slur. Hopefully, he died a horrible death at the hands of these nudist cannibals. Pierce still deserves a nod for coining a new term to insult these mindless monsters. I know this sounds like complete fiction. Hell, I know I wouldn't believe it if they weren't walking around right outside after dark. If you are reading this and there are no P.V.s, then you are obviously from the distant future where they finally came up with a way to stop this plague. Either that or you're what humanity became post-apocalypse. Maybe you're a space alien that happened to stumble upon this journal. But if that's the case, then how the hell are you reading English? Okay, never mind. I tend to overthink shit. The virus spread a lot quicker than expected. Four days. It literally took only four damn days for the plague to surge across the state. Happy Independence Day, Mexico. Apparently, Patient Zero was a chimpanzee in Mobile. It had been shipped over here to be housed at the Birmingham Zoo. The monkey had been deliberately infected with a mutant virus. It was a perfectly delivered bioweapon that no one has claimed responsibility for it yet. Of course, the adorable rabid primate bit the zoologist. He must have received the monkey like it was some kind of big-eyed orphan. You can guess how it spread from there. Johnny comes home with a chunk out of his arm, saying that a crazy monkey bit him. But yeah, not the poor monkey's fault. Just like in the movies, his mom keeps him in bed to rest and recover from the fever the bite gives him. She comes quietly into his room to give him some soup and BAM! He bites her. She eventually turns, runs outside, and bites the neighbor. He was just standing there, ready to help the sweet old lady next door. He turns and bites his wife and kids. Then the damn kids go to school, and the scene repeats itself and multiplies exponentially. The rest is history. The story plays out exactly like in a horror movie. The virus does what it was made to do and becomes epidemic before people even know what's going on. What happened to the monkey? He's gone, man, preying on whatever creatures Alabama can offer up. The Viva and Cora arrived in Guntersville on May 1st, the day the zombie virus first struck Mobile, so my apocalypse code word is Mayday. Now that's funny, just another reason to hate communism. And by the 5th of May, it was all over Alabama. 
I seriously doubt any of our local Mexicans will ever celebrate Cinco de Mayo again. That reminds me. I wonder if Bob made it. With the excessive media coverage and super popular series The Walking Dead suddenly becoming a reality, you would think people would have reacted more quickly. It took them a whole fucking day just to quarantine Mobile, and by then, hundreds of bitten but as yet unturned peeves had gotten on trains, buses, international and transcontinental planes, just trying to be helpful in spreading the virus across the entire world quicker. It was worse than Pandemic 2 on Addicting Games. Bitten people went nuts. Unbitten folks didn't know how to react. I kind of wish I was in Madagascar right now. They don't even have an airport and have surely closed their single seaport by now. Oh, come on. You know what I'm talking about. Especially if you wasted hours of your life playing shitty Flash games. Remember in 28 Days Later, I'm Legend, Night of the Living Dead? Basically any zombie movie you can think of. Infection takes weeks if not months, to spread across the globe. Maybe it was just Alabama. But everyone seemed to be in a state of fucking insane denial. Despite decades of literary prediction and warning, they still refused to accept that they were just speeding up the fall of mankind by going about their business. They chose to completely ignore the ravenous blue nudists sweeping northward. Like, if you just ignore them, they'll go away or some shit. The fact that the light-sensitive peeves only traveled in the open at night should have given people time to prepare. They could make a plan, at least. It was almost as if God was saying, Hey, dumbasses, I'm giving you nearly 14 hours every day to save yourselves. Get a move on. But no, everybody ignored the apocalyptic signs. Their messed up neighbors, even the TV coverage of mayhem and destruction. It was just more nightly entertainment streaming into their safe little homes. The city government of Guntersville did get some kind of clue a few hours before the zombie horde overwhelmed the choke points of the causeways and invaded the island. But yeah, too little, too late. Again, this nearly seemed choreographed for a really bad cult film. The unimaginably gormless law enforcement officers believed they could hold back the insane cannibals with tear gas, rubber bullets, and riot shields. You can guess how long they lasted against starving, crazed animals that fought back. Seems only primates can actually get the infection, and then they will completely devour any animal they can catch, except other humans. It's complicated. What happens is they never get more than a single bite from a person before the virus sours the milk. I guess that just irritates them and drives the hunger for a long pig beyond that of Hannibal Lecter himself. It was almost comical watching someone turn during daylight hours, at least from a safe distance, that is. First, there is a slow color change in an infected skin to this crazy bright blue. Then he or she rips their clothes off, covers their eyes, and stumbles around like a drunk. Then they collapse as if dead. After rising again, they bite every human within reach. It doesn't have to be a bite. The infection is nearly instantaneous upon the transfer of any bodily fluid. It can be nothing worse than a scratch, any break in the human skin, and a little zombie saliva. There have been reports of people catching the plague just by being downwind and close by when one of the monsters sprayed its putrid mustard gas-style shit into the air. Fuck, I hope that's not true. That's gotta be the worst way to go. The Peavy's eyes are the main reason they stay nocturnal. UV light doesn't actually burn their skin like vampires or I Am Legend type zombies. I think they just have a problem with permanent pupil dilation or weak corneas, or some other medical ailment that I can't even pronounce. I gotta see an anatomy class. Sue me. Anyway, they seem to tolerate being in heavy shade. I've even seen them wandering around on extremely cloudy days. They'll come out just before dusk if you piss them off or entice them well enough, but so far it looks like they pretty much stay hidden during the bright daylight. Of course, I'm not taking any chances. I haven't been stupid enough to be anywhere but safe on the boat after four in the afternoon. I stayed informed using the TV and the radio until the electricity went out. Crow makes runs whenever she wants to. I don't like going out very often because I'm a, quote, motherfucking pussy white boy, unquote. Sometimes she brings reports. I know the question has already crossed your mind. You're wondering if any were immune to the disease. I can't say for sure. 
I never saw anyone like that interviewed on TV. But I'm thinking having immunity to the zombie plague would be fucking terrible. Think about it. Bodily fluid transfers the virus, right? So these rabid, starving animals would bite you. You'd remain uninfected. You wouldn't discover your immunity until you got bit, about the same time the PV figured it out. When your tasty meat didn't instantly become nasty, the monster, overjoyed, would proceed to eviscerate it and gnaw you to the bone while alive. I wouldn't doubt that my perfect brother has some type of immunity. He can save the world with a blood sample. But me? I will probably die a slow and painful death. Hell, I might even just keel over from starvation before I find him. Things got a lot quieter after the first few days of chaos. Since then, we've heard no vehicles and we have seen absolutely no one living. It's become so quiet that the only sound is waves splashing against the boat or shore, or when the noise of some random animals looking through trash. This is usually followed by screeches, moans, or the clumsy footfalls of the peavies catching them. Oddly, there are no bird noises. Despite what we've all been told, zombies do not constantly moan. They make noise when they see something that might be tasty, just like any other wild animal. Only the occasional howl or grunt can be heard during daylight hours. At night, sometimes a random car alarm sets off. I remember watching specials about great apes on the Discovery Channel. The special detailed how they communicate mostly verbally. Maybe these damn murderous nudists have some form of guttural language. They just ain't loud about it. Yeah, I call them nudists. As I mentioned, this particular virus makes them frantically strip naked upon turning. It's like they can't stand having anything touching their skin. Just think about the horror of being torn into while staring at a blue penis that's probably covered in excrement. Yeah, there's that too. They splatter rotten baby diarrhea with nearly every step. But I'll detail that pretty fact later. I don't want to rile up the fish in my stomach. Once you are bitten, the virus disseminates into your bloodstream. Immediately, the PVs see you as a fellow undead and summarily ignore you. Great. Only you're still scared shitless because you don't turn right away. They walk away, and you run like hell, until you start to turn blue, sleepy, and get very, very hungry. No, I'm not speaking from personal experience, dumbass. We've seen it happen dozens of times from out here. Everyone on the dock was bitten, begged for mercy, prayed to their god, and eventually turned. Once things quieted down, Crow and I decided to do a little scavenging for weapons and supplies within close distance of the ship. When I joined the crew, the contract I signed mentioned something about weapons being forbidden on board. I debated stowing away a little pistol, but I was afraid I would get caught and thrown off the boat. Now, I seriously wish I had hidden my gun. Damn it, I could have had at least snuck a hunting knife into my footlocker. Forgive me, fellow country boys. First decent job. Couldn't afford to lose it. But now that I think about it, what good would a fucking hunting knife do versus a zombie? I'm not stupid enough to get that close to one. Since we were basically unharmed, save some fish getting equipment and a couple of kitchen utensils, our only defense was to run back to the ship and not make a sound until the damn zombie got bored and walked away. Believe me, we have done that more than once. That made staying within a block of the boat a pretty easy decision. Okay, I believe I'm fairly intelligent but I have no fucking clue what a city block was until a few years ago. I spent my entire life in rural Alabama, except for a few out-of-state trips. So no one I know has ever used the term block. I know now that this is a developed area on either side of a road between two intersections. There are many instances of this in cities, even in the cities of Marshall County. I don't recall a single person ever referring to these spaces as such. Maybe that's because I've always resided on back roads. Where I grew up, a block could have been anywhere from a half a mile to three miles of possibly nothing but cattle pasture. Yeah, I'd heard that term used in movies, but didn't really comprehend the space. I now do. I don't know why, but when Crow ordered me to stay within a block, I grinned. It's amusing to me when people assume words are common to everyone. In my vernacular, we call all soda pop coke. It doesn't matter if it's Pepsi, a root beer, or a fucking Dr. Pepper. It cracks me up to hear anyone call an 18-wheeler a semi. And Yankees, yep, our word for East Coasters, actually say yous instead of y'all. 
In fact, it makes me laugh just to hear anyone speak the name Matt Diamond. While I was laughing about this stupid shit, I realized Crow had given me an order. I'm the fucking acting captain. I forget it. I don't give a shit. Pretty sure the world doesn't need another dictator. Speaking of dictator, isn't there supposed to be a fascist nutcase in every zombie story? I'll be sure to look for Hitler Jr. while scavenging the city. Or at least my own block. Damn it, enough rambling. I need to move forward with this entry. So we were tasked with searching the nearby surrounding area for weapons. We decided to remain close enough to watch each other's backs. The storefronts closest to the dockside were an antique store, a Salvation Army, and a stockbroker's office. This didn't seem likely to procure anything better than an old flannel shirt and a couple of pens. We needed a car. If we had no luck with securing one, we would try those shops anyway, though we both agreed they were assuredly empty of firearms. If all else failed, we could creep to a police station a little farther down the road. Pretty sure we'd find some weaponry there. We spent most of the day searching the block, thankfully with no zombie encounters. When we met up and showed our treasures, I was disappointed to discover that our booty consisted of three pocket knives, a pair of brass knuckles, and a hammer and a crowbar between us. Obviously, almost no locals prepared for fallout from Mobile. They claimed Guntersville simply because everyone thought they had more time. After all, the problems were happening hundreds of miles away. A sadly overconfident citizenry figured that their island was pretty defensible. Boy, were they fucking wrong. The population had been driving around like it was any other day. There weren't people biting other people and shitting themselves just a few hours down the road. We could find very little weaponry of any kind in any cars. There was one car abandoned on our block. All the rest were neatly parked and completely empty of firearms. As we began our long, sad walk back to the ship, an idea came to me. I was pretty excited about it. We should search the other boats in the dock, I told Crow. I'm not sure why, but until then neither of us super geniuses had paid attention to the boats moored all around our new home. Crow made it seem like she'd already thought of it, but just failed to mention it. She sarcastically congratulated me upon my suggestion. Good thinking, white boy. So you want to use the buddy system again? I asked. I don't think either of us considered the other a buddy. We were only staying together out of necessity. But she agreed that it was a good enough plan by simply nodding her head. We began with a small yacht farthest from our ship, each searching different rooms simultaneously. Besides a few expensive fishing rods and a decently stocked tackle box, the first three boats contained nothing useful except a couple of flare guns. I couldn't see us fighting off hordes of zombies with flare guns, regardless of the box of extra signals that came with each loaded gun, but okay, at least we could send a signal if a larger ship passed by. The fourth vessel was a pontoon boat. I'd hoped to find at least some booze or something, but there was nothing on it other than a crappy fishing rod that wasn't worth taking and some life jackets. The fifth and final yacht, the closest to our ship, naturally contained something that almost made Crow squeal with delight. Hell, I almost squealed myself. A beautiful-looking compound bow with an accompanying quiver of arrows was carefully displayed above a leather sofa. This bounty was literally next door to where we had been living. Neither of us had bothered to look for the justifiable stock of projectile weapons kept aboard boats. We can't believe our luck. It was like we were supposed to find it at that time. I figured when I noticed the spool of fishing lines sitting beside the quiver that this had been used for bow fishing. I had never participated in this sport, but had friends that tried it out. They said it was fun. Hell, I don't even find traditional fishing that enjoyable. I only started fishing a lot when I joined the crew because there wasn't anything else to do. Now I do it for fucking survival. I had never used a bow for any type of sport. When I went deer hunting, it was with a rifle. Can't even remember the last time I shot a bow and arrow. High school, maybe. After we got our new weapons back on the ship, I spent the next couple of days practicing my aim. And before you think it, no, I'm not fucking retarded enough to waste arrowheads. I made sure to take them off. I faced the bow of the ship from the poop deck as that would give me more area to screw up and not lose a precious arrow. I know you're laughing at the mention of poop deck, but get over it, it's not that funny. I will admit that at one time I had no clue why it was called that. Apparently it has something to do with a poopa, 
a doll in the form of some ancient Roman god that sailors put in the back of the ship to watch over them. Either that or it was something about the French word for rear. I guess I didn't give enough of a shit, pun intended, to listen to what Captain Barr droned endlessly on about his beloved nautical trivia. God knows he had enough of it. Now, I do enjoy history. Social studies was my favorite class in school. But his stuff was beyond useless. And really, I was only there for the money. So don't expect a lot of knowledge about sailing ships from this journal. Even though I would not be winning any archery contests, practice paid off. This morning I hit something the size of a shoe about ten yards away. I was pretty satisfied with that, actually, and I was fairly certain that I wasn't going to get any better. I began wearing the bow and quiver of arrows slung over my shoulder. Who was I trying to impress with my badass sense of style? So unless a deer decided to wander slowly, very slowly across the bridge, the bow and arrows weren't going to do jack shit for us. 2. Mo, Journal Entry 2 I'm guessing lesbians enjoy fishing. Whenever she wasn't sleeping or cooking, Crow was casting at least one line into the water. I know she would call me a sexist white boy for ever having that thought, like she does every day. I'll just hold my tongue and let the girl fish. Doing my normal perimeter walk, I moved along the poop deck while my crewmate was in her chair at the bow. I was trying to think of anyone I knew who lived close by with some guns. Not that there was any hope they'd be alive. Maybe they would have left a couple of rifles or a shotgun on the rack. As I rounded the poop deck for the third time, there was a noise like the sound of an elbow or a knee smacking into a car exterior. Distinct. It sounded hard enough to dent the panel. I froze. This was immediately followed by a harshly whispered exclamation. My fucking piece of bitch. I was shocked at hearing another human voice. You could say I was a bit taken aback at the strange profanity. Quickly, I lifted my bow to aim in the general direction of the sound coming from somewhere down on the bridge behind the boat. With as much authority as I could muster, I gave a command. Phrase and put up your hands! I actually fucking said that. Unsure what to expect, I paused. I must have sounded like a real badass, because I heard something metallic clatter to the pavement. Shortly after, two meaty hands rose into the air. He slowly stood and there was an awful lot of him. Dude, what are you doing out here? I questioned him. Brah, I'm gonna find me a pimp-ass ride and take myself to find my peeps in Huntsville. This a ghost town, yo. I consider it more of a zombie town or graveyard. Details weren't worth arguing. I was having a hard time picturing this guy out running PVs. His voice almost pushed me over the edge of laughter. I don't know if I'm the only one, I compare every person I meet with actors or characters from various forms of entertainment. I was filled with a sense of pride when the survivor rose. My estimation was not too far off, and I didn't have to noticeably adjust my aim to put him in my sights. Though not a monstrously muscular linebacker, he was pretty monstrous in another sense. He was a black man a few inches taller than me. I found out later that he was just a few years younger. He had short cropped hair, wore an excessive amount of golden chains around his neck, and would have been considered clinically morbidly obese. This dude looked as if he had been on a strict diet of McDonald's and oatmeal cream pies since he was able to walk. He made me think of the kid from the blind side. He sounded exactly like Chris Tucker, and the red t-shirt incited thoughts of Fat Albert. Immediately, I wanted to make prank calls with this guy. Hands raised, he turned to face me squarely. It took me a moment to realize he was wearing a red fox t-shirt. Friends of mine wore the shirts for years. I have absolutely no fucking clue what fox is. It must be some type of company or product that teenagers and young people find attractive. The fuck you smiling at? Dog, you sound like a young Tommy Lee Jones hillbilly style. He raised an eyebrow at me. Apparently, I'm not the only one that compares people to celebrities. I don't hear the resemblance between my accent and Texans' accents. I had never thought of this comparison for myself, but I think Tommy Lee Jones rocks, so I wasn't complaining. I stood up a little straighter. He looked down at the item he had dropped at his feet. Lifting his gaze, he appeared disgusted. Man, put that shit up. This ain't my fucking deer hunter. Instinctively, I had raised my camouflage bow, pointing an arrow at him. Whether the arrow would actually hit its intended target was to be seen, but it was sufficiently scaring him so it was doing its job. Completely unafraid, he shifted his stance to lean on the hood of the car beside him. You one of them gay rapists? 
He paused as if to allow me to defend myself. Before I could protest his assumption, he cut me off. You want me to come on your little cruise ship and drink some Jesus juice, right? You like what you see here, don't you? He said as he rubbed down his body with his hands. I was a little disgusted at his petting of himself. Also a bit offended at his assumption. I was not sure how to answer him. I'm not gay! I shouted in an unconvincing tone. Lowering my voice, I continued. I'm just happy to see another survivor is all. Looking at his still unbelieving face, I finally ended his accusations with a threat. I'm not gay, and I'm pointing an arrow at you. I narrowed my eyes threateningly. He threw his hands back up in a surrendered gesture. Okay, bro, we cool, we cool. We seemed to move forward pretty quick in our relationship. My new acquaintance was trusting me. I swear I'm not gay. Though I didn't relax my bow entirely, I was not holding the string as tightly. I asked a question in a friendlier tone. What's your name, man? Smokes. There's nothing wrong with using a nickname. It's still nice to know the given name of a person. I felt compelled to press. What's your real name? Smokes rolled his eyes and mumbled. Motherfucker. Maul. My eyes widened. Intrigue crossed my features. I was trying to put the two words together. Black like Marlboro? He sighed and seemed to shrink. Shit, man, I wish. It's Marlin. Marlin Williamson. It was obvious he hated his real name, even more so than I disliked mine. I opened my mouth to tell him it was okay, but wasn't fast enough. He continued angrily. Listen, cracker, you start your queer ass giggling, and I get some of my hard hitting niggas in the cribs to take care of you with a pair of pliers and a blowtorch, hillbilly boy. Smokes thought I would make the same kind of name jokes I endured all my life. I really couldn't help it. Raising an eyebrow. You mean the bloods? Dude, I'm white and I even know that. I gestured to his red t-shirt. Everybody knows bloods wear red and crips wear blue. Before he could launch into another insult-laden tirade, I stated, Anyway, it's cool, man. My name's Elmo. Some bitch immediately chuckled hysterically. Why ain't you fuzzy? I'm gonna tickle the shit out of you. Hearing this one so many times, it had no effect. I visibly drew tension on the string. I'm still pointing an arrow at you. Chickle dog, you know I had to. He put his hand on his hip. Your mama must have hated you if she gave you a name like that. I was more at ease now, having to agree. Finally, letting the bow go slack and drop, smoke seemed like someone I would have hung out with before the end of the world. I figured I might as well invite him to join my merry little band. Sometimes I think the same thing. You want to come out to the boat? We got food and shit. I made sure to throw that little teaser out on the end. The mention of anything edible obviously sealed the deal. All right, home slash. I ain't putting lotion on in front of you, gay raper. I almost laughed. Okay, maybe later then. You got any guns? He raged for what he had dropped to the ground earlier. Show his shit, brah. He lifted a Mac 9 or Uzi or something. It didn't appear as intimidating as it was meant to. He held it loosely between two meaty fingers, showing it to me like a toy. I'd only asked because I was hoping he actually did have some sort of firearm. At least there would be one on the ship, even if it was only short range and probably didn't have more than one magazine of ammo. Smokes didn't strike me as the type to gain my good graces and murder me in my sleep. It took a lot of effort and an excessive amount of sweating to walk the several hundred yards and make his way onto the ship. Smokes finally stood before me on the deck, doubled over and gasping for breath. I considered making a remark about my surprise that the boat did not start sinking when he came aboard, but I remembered the machine pistol he had placed in his waistband. Even though he didn't seem like the type of guy that would react violently to someone just making a joke, I didn't know him very well yet, so I wasn't sure what his reaction would be in this exhausted state. In fact, I realize now that I knew very little about him. Who that fine-ass bitch? He threw a thumb over his shoulder in the direction of Crow. She was so quiet I had forgotten she was there. I had not thought of introducing him to her or even mentioning that we had a guest on board. Looking over his shoulder, I raised my eyebrows, wondering how much shit I was about to take. He cut me off before I could speak. This was the start of something that would happen fairly often. You hitting that ass, my brother? No, man, I don't think... If you ain't getting none, you mind if I tap that? I opened my mouth to reveal my suspicion that Crow liked women. Screeching, he continued. 
She and the brothers? I'd give her jungle fever. Mm-hmm. Thankfully, he finally stopped speaking. I gave him a few seconds before I attempted responding. I don't think she's into our kind. I really didn't give a shit if Smokes got some from her, but I was confident he didn't have a chance, even if she was straight. Before I could say any more, he cut me off again. She racist. I was flabbergasted. Did he think I was black or that I thought I was black, or was he referring to her being Indian? I was so confused that I completely bypassed his question. I don't think she likes any kind of... mate. He stuck his hands in his enormous pants pockets, whistling loudly in realization. Shit, bro. Reckon you ain't the gay in our little crew. It was heartwarming he finally came to the conclusion I wasn't the gay. I had no idea if there were others somewhere on board, but he already grouped himself into our little crew. I fully expected him to continue before I could respond, and he did. Every group of main protagonists in every zombie movie has a gay. He raised one finger as if counting off characters in the script. I wanted to ask him how our situation seemed like a movie. This was something I had been considering myself. I thought better of trying to get a word in when he raised another finger. For sure. I was the token black guy. Just before I could ask him what role I would play in this film, he lifted a third digit. And you is... He trailed off thinking so hard the action was almost audible. You white, and you pretty average. I suppose you could be the main character. Some kind of hero anti-hero. I was about to thank him for deciding I was not the surprise axe murderer. I was just an average nobody. That kind of made sense. Since this is my journal, obviously I am the main character, the hero. I was perplexed. Are you a film student or something? I noticed how he spoke knowledgeably about plot. Smokes dropped the whole gangster slang whenever he felt like it. He chuckled. Hell no, dog. I sell dope. I just watch movies and shit. I was hoping for a little more wisdom on our situation. At least we'd be given our respective roles to play. Now we just needed an audience. We discussed a few more characters he assured me we would undoubtedly meet. I was skeptical about a few. The expert driving a fully loaded Humvee for one. So sincere was he, it was hard to disagree with him. Plus, it was fun having someone besides Silent Fishing Woman to talk to. Who knew? Perhaps we were unknowingly involved in some type of epic fiction and had already read the script. Science fiction is loaded with stories about people trapped inside other beings' plotted universes. Just pawns in creepy worlds. Either he had skipped the last page, or it hadn't been given to him because he was not forthcoming with an ending. I could not bring myself to press him on the issue. If he was some type of fortune teller, I didn't want to hear about my future life as a zombie. After having less than a fraction of a conversation with the nearly mute crow, talking to Smokes was more enjoyable than I would have expected. He talked faster than an auctioneer, especially compared to my slow southern drawl. I was so interaction-deprived that I had neglected to properly introduce my sole surviving shipmate to our new recruit. I had not worn a wristwatch since before I got my driver's license. My shitty old flip phone had become nothing more than a paperweight. There was no way to know what time it was when Crow began coming our way. She was heading below deck to get some rest before her busy day tomorrow of sitting in a lawn chair fishing under an umbrella. Apparently she had watched the original encounter and entered our little powwow with the understanding that our guest was a friendly. Just as I expected, she said not a damn thing. The moment Smokes noticed her nearing, he grew almost painfully silent, stood ramrod straight with his hands clasped behind his back, sucked in his immense gut, and blushed. Yes, I was utterly surprised to learn that black people can blush. Are we in fucking middle school? I don't know how Smokes normally acted around women. He clearly liked Crow as if he were a twelve-year-old with a crush. I broke the uncomfortable silence. Crow, this is Smokes. Smokes, this is Crow. I paused for the two to exchange greetings. As expected, Crow simply remained where she was. With arms crossed, she nodded. Smokes offered sheepishly. Hey. I continued with a sigh. Smokes is going to be staying with us for a while. I'll show him the ropes and teach him how we do things. He will pull his own weight. There was no smart-ass comeback about my underhanded slight on his bulk. It must have flown right past them both. Smokes had his eyes on the deck since Crow had gotten within spitting distance. I decided to remember that around women, or at least around Crow, Smokes became speechless. 
Perhaps this little trick could come in handy someday. You know what time it is? I asked her, attempting to break through the silence again. She finally replied, Yes. Waiting for a few more seconds, I was met with more awkward silence. Apparently she was being a fucking comedian. Or is it comedian? I blinked. Well? She didn't miss a beat. Time for bed. Right, I said. It must have been getting late. Now dark, the only light was that of the rising moon. I walked right past her into the bowels of the ship. Smokes would get a tour and it would be free. Motherfucker, I don't want to sleep in no bunk bed. He glanced around the communal quarters in the four stacked units. How many people's y'all got up in here, anyways? And I call tops. It wouldn't be a problem. There were only two of the original seven crew members remaining. I briefly thought about messing with him, telling him the top bunks were all spoken for. Relieved I wouldn't have to worry about sleeping below him, I smiled. Like, I give a shit, I don't sleep in here. The fuck you sleeping? Barr had been MIA since the PVs got to Guntersville, leaving me as acting captain. I was, after all, the senior member. One of the perks that came with the duty was that I claimed the captain's quarters. It had a queen-size bed. Upon my telling him the short version of this, he was filled with shock and fear. Where she sleep? He raised a finger to point toward where he had last seen Crow. In response, I pointed to one of the beds on the opposite wall. He belted out his quick and angry complaint. Fuck you, cracker. I ain't sleeping in her with a female. Not understanding why it mattered, I replied. Come on, man. She's not going to care if you sleep in your boxers. He opened his mouth to speak. I guess what he was about to say and astoundingly beat him to the punch. And no, I don't know if she sleeps in her underwear or what kind she wears. Even when I did sleep in the crew quarters, I had never stayed awake to have pillow talk with the rest of the crew. I always just stripped down to my boxers, fell into my bunk, shut my eyes, and was asleep within minutes. My dad had the uncanny ability to fall asleep after only a few seconds of closing his eyes. I suppose I inherited some of that. I never really paid attention to the other members of the crew while they slept. Hell, for all I know, Crow slept in the nude. If she did, I actually would be somewhat sorry that I'd never noticed. This is the way I think of it. If she's a lesbian, that means she likes chicks. Let's give Smokes the benefit of the doubt and say that he's straight, which means he likes chicks. Follow my logic here. They're both playing for the same team. Neither should be bothered about being in the shower at the same time, right? I retract that statement. I'd feel uncomfortable in the shower with any girl. It wouldn't bother me if she saw me in boxers and a t-shirt, though. He argued with me for a few more minutes. Smokes watched the closed door, expecting Crow to enter at any second. He whined like a petulant child, nearly sobbing. Please, cuz, let me stay with you. Did he really think I would accommodate him? Now was a good time to assert my authority, I reckoned. Dude, I'm not having a fucking slumber party. I softened. Smokes, man, it's all right. Trust me. I used to sleep in the bed right across from her and it didn't kill me. My new friend didn't appear very consoled. He hesitantly resigned himself to sleeping with a girl in the room. Fuck. Fine, but I'm a member of this white bread. I smiled at this fake warning. My friends and I have made similar threats to one another over the years. Obviously, Smokes wasn't being malicious. I still didn't feel sorry for him. The sleeping situation had not been a problem for any involved parties in the past. Once he got over his initial fear, I was betting he would not even think about it. You better go ahead and get in bed before she gets in here. I fought the urge to laugh as he scrambled to drop his enormous blue jeans, climb into bed, and pull the blanket up to his chin. I turned back to him before leaving the room. I guess I've got to show you some of the stuff we do in the morning. Get some sleep. You know? My tone grew dark as I shut the door. This ship is haunted. I just couldn't help myself. 3. Mo, Journal Entry 3 all y'all do is sit on a boat fishing and shit? I shrugged. That's mostly all we have done since the shit hit the fan. Smokes appeared incredulous. Cause, ain't you never seen no movies? We're supposed to go get survivors and shit. There's some more main protagonists to rescue. Waving a hand in the direction of town. Laughing was all I could do. Did he think we were living some type of screenplay? I believe in God and that he is omnipotent. So he knows what's going to happen. 
Things never play out like we mere mortals expect, though. I rubbed my neck, considering if we should make any attempt at finding and saving others. Smokes pointed his finger and narrowed his eyes. Listen, motherfucker, even if you don't want to be one of the main protagonists, y'all better be loaded down with ketchup. I ain't eating no fucking fish, lest you got fucking ketchup. That was a good point. We had salt and pepper, but it would be nice to have a few other condiments with which to season our fish. I conceded. Okay, there's the Magnolia Diner down the highway. I'm sure they'll have stuff that goes with fish. Plus, there are a few other places on the way that we should visit. I added, Oh, and if we see any protagonists, we'll see what we can do for them. This seemed to appease Smokes for the moment. He smiled, approving of my humanitarianism and willingness to play the hero. The Magnolia was located on the southern end of the island near the causeway. There were several grocery stores, gas stations, and restaurants that would be in our direct line of travel. I was doubtful that there would be any PVs out during the day. If we did see infected, at least we might have a chance to use Smoke's gun. Smokes reminded me. Matt, you wasn't planning on finding me, but every zombie movie need a sidekick. How's yours, bruh? I was still baffled that he had so quickly placed himself in this role, or any role for that matter. All I could do was grin through my confusion. After all, who doesn't want a sidekick? Walking the crow, fishing rod balanced gingerly in her hand, I explained to her where Smokes and I were heading. Even though I planned to be back by the end of the day, I couldn't make any promises. It's not like she'd come after us regardless of how long we were gone. She didn't give two shits if we came back at all. The entire conversation was one-sided, and other than an occasional head movement or grunt, one would have guessed she were asleep or a deaf mute. As long as she could fish, I guess our fates were not worth a thought. My story was that Smokes believed that we might find other survivors to bring back with us. She still didn't care. Perhaps if I'd hinted that one of our survivors could be an attractive female who could gut and fry a fish, she would have shown a little more interest. The two of us began our journey by leaving the ship with our weapons. Smokes had his machine pistol in the back of his waistband and an aluminum baseball bat stuck through a belt loop. I wore my compound bow and quiver of arrows over my shoulder. On we soldiered. There were absolutely no goodbyes from Crow. Of course, she didn't even ask us to bring back any ingredients. She would have been damned happy to eat completely unseasoned fish at every meal for the rest of her life. That is, as long as she wouldn't be bothered by motherfucking white people. Once we had exited the marina where the ship had been docked for days and began walking towards Gunter Avenue, I realized that every car in sight was facing north. 431 was a divided four-lane highway, divided at least across most of the island. Gunter Avenue formed the southbound lanes, while Blount Avenue ran parallel and made up the northbound lanes. Both avenues met near either end of the island, once again becoming U.S. Highway 431. Now both avenues were obviously routed for northbound traffic only. Smokes had briefly described his residence on Guntersville Island. The city's occupants hadn't given me any news about the blue swarm that had swept over the island. They were too busy running away or being attacked. It was good to know I had a reliable source if I should need more information about what had actually happened. We traveled south on Gunter against north-facing vehicles. There were nowhere near the number I had been taught to believe I would encounter by pop culture. Sure, there was an occasional car standing abandoned on the side of the road, the rare pile-up wreck scene. Later, near the southern end of the island, we would find a single police barricade. It must have been positioned to check travelers coming onto the island for signs of infection. A lot of good that did them. One other thing that was unexpected... There was trash strewn everywhere. There were almost pristine backdrops in zombie flicks, besides the drop belongings, maybe. Otherwise, things appeared almost untouched by whatever horror has befallen the city. Sometimes the grass even looks mowed. If you were to isolate this typical outdoor scene from the plot, you could briefly forget that the entire citizenry was dead and think everything was right in the world. Now just picture the complete opposite of that and you might come close to the reality we were facing. The ground was covered with random garbage left in the wake of a vast, migrating horde of people. And there was a ridiculous amount of zombie shit. This is something you don't hear much about in pop culture. Zombie shit. 
Very rarely has any mention been made about any type of excrement from the undead, even though they seem to eat constantly. There was no way I could have been prepared for the gut-wrenching, horrendously putrid aroma of the Black River that follows all of them. I am guilty of taking the occasional picture of a noteworthy log I dropped. Admit it, men. We all do it or think about it when one is exceptionally huge or nasty. Nothing I've ever plopped come close to the size, consistency, or vomit-inducing smell of the ass nuggets they leave behind. After experiencing the stench firsthand, you will never have to worry about becoming a cannibal. If human flesh is what causes their shit to reek as it does, I know why the Spanish killed the Aztecs. You don't even have to see a zombie coming. You can smell it from a mile away. I pity canines, especially bloodhounds. A nightmare plagued me the other night about trying to strip down a fully clothed peavey. Think about it. You're welcome. Even for someone who grew up in the boonies, the lack of city noise in an area that was pretty well populated a few days ago was definitely disturbing. Smokes was taking it pretty hard after spending most of his life in this city, having graduated from Guntersville High School. We spoke about our previous lives, what we did before May Day. He continued his explanation of how our zombie apocalypse tale would play out. It was impossible to disagree with him. He was so certain about everything. It was good we encountered absolutely no movement for the first few blocks. I can guarantee I couldn't hit a moving target that was smaller than a house. Smokes graciously informed me after we departed he had never actually fired his submachine gun, though he would have been willing to, quote, bust a cap in one damn blue motherfuckers, unquote. The first few blocks we passed were mostly residential. Some of the houses had obviously been looted or otherwise trashed. A couple were still smoldering skeletons of blackened wood. I wasn't even considering scavenging these homes until I was sure it was safe. Smokes knew without even asking that our first goal would be the CVS a few blocks ahead. There would not be many supplies we would need to take with us all the way across the island both ways. We needed to at least scout the pharmacy and decide what to grab on the way back, though. When the two of us stepped into the parking lot, we immediately noticed that the place had been looted. Most of the glass windows and doors had been shattered. There was a single car in the parking lot with both front doors open. Bloody handprints were smeared on the inside of the windows and windshield. I moved low to the front door with my bow at the ready and motioned for my companion to group with me. He paused a dozen feet behind me. He shook his head and spoke a little too loudly. Man, you's fucking retarded if you think I'm a walking dead and let zombies fucking ambush my black ass. This brother ain't gonna be the first motherfucker to die in this one. He had been referring to our situation as this one as if it was our own particular zombie movie. He had yet to think up a clever title for our feature. I would need to brainstorm on this with him later. We could write a script, or maybe some studio would turn it into a film or at least a book. Hell, we might even hit the bestseller list on Zombie Amazon. He still appeared reluctant to enter the building, as I stopped just before my boots crunched onto broken glass and grinned maliciously. Don't be a pussy. I'll go first. Besides, what if there's someone trapped in there? You're the one that wants to save everybody. Man up. I've never really been one to motivate others. Live and let live is my motto. I had to light a fire under his ass because I sure as hell wasn't going in there alone. Smokes cussed unintelligibly, stuffing his pockets with disposable lighters while looking for precious tobacco. Cautiously darting from cover of end caps to displace, I realized there would be no ambush from human or formerly human attackers. Once I was satisfied that we were alone, I rose and casually made my way to the pharmacy counter as if this were any other day. I was just another shopper, right? The closer I got to the back, the more obvious it became that the pharmacy had been completely ransacked. I noticed trash displays and random destruction in aisles before my intended destination. I could see cash, prescription bottles, pills, and shell casings littering the floor. Had there been a gang fight in the CVS? All of the narcotics, Sudafed and antidepressants were missing. This was expected, but I was surprised that I could not find a damn bottle of Tylenol or even aspirin. I took a mental note of things like antibiotics we could scavenge later. I found a shit ton of mite, though. Crow would surely want that. It's a medicine that you need if you have a vagina. 
I have absolutely no idea what it does. I just know that girls take the shit. Earlier I mentioned that smoke's cussed. I feel the need to elaborate. Here in the South, we do not curse or swear. To use profanity is to cuss. I swear on my mother's grave is the phrase that immediately comes to mind when someone refers to swearing. When one mentions cursing, I think of a nasty magical spell being placed on someone. Voodoo type crap. If you're a Yankee and talk that way, it doesn't bother me. Just don't bitch because I use the English language the way I want to. Four. Mo. Journal Entry 4. Didn't you see the sign? We're closed. I almost screamed and nearly pissed my pants. Not expecting anyone to be alive in this ransacked building, I wasn't ready to defend myself. There was no point in putting my hands up. The gangbanger was going to fill me with bullets regardless. I just turned to the pharmacy counter to face my executioner. It was getting pretty late in the afternoon. Naked people started running down the streets and screaming. Good Samaritans would stop to see if they could do anything to help the new lunatics and get bit themselves. The crazies barely slowed down when they took a bite of someone. They would just bring their teeth down on an unsuspecting bystander's arm and then go to the next person. Of course, the victim would normally just stand there shocked. There was no screaming, immense pain, or immediate turning. Civilized people just couldn't believe that another person bit them. He shrugged and shook his head. Anybody that had seen TV in the past week knew about the infection and how it was transferred. I really have no idea what these Samaritans were thinking. Did they not know there was something wrong with the blue, yellow, eyed naked people? The man paused again to let a bloody cough out into his handkerchief. I wouldn't have had to hear this guy's story to know that he was exceptionally old. Who carries handkerchiefs unless they are at least part of my grandparents' generation? Mr. Sislaw had been the pharmacist at this CVS for nearly ten years. I wasn't aware that pharmacists went down with the ship. He was infected. The old guy had obviously just not turned yet and was still coherent enough to carry on a conversation. I would show some respect and lend him an ear while he still had time. You could bet your ass I would make sure to get the hell out of here before he started ripping his clothes off and throwing himself at me. I wasn't into geriatric guys, and I really didn't want to confirm that I couldn't shoot a bow and arrow for shit. His color was fading and his hands shook like he had Parkinson's as he put the bloody snot rag back into his pocket. A few people started coming into the store to get away from the monsters running through town. We tried to convince the manager to lock the doors. He said locking up in the middle of the day would seem unfriendly to customers. I don't know what that idiot was thinking. The way things were going, there wouldn't be any customers left by the end of the day. He wheezed out a laugh. The old pharmacist got a faraway look in his eyes. There were about a dozen people that came in before this lady started telling me that some crazy guy bit her baby. She started asking me if we should call poison control and if I had any antibiotics. I almost laughed at her stupidity and told her she needed to rush the kid to the emergency room in Huntsville. She raced to her car with infant in hand and I immediately felt guilty. I never know if she made it to the ER or not, but I like to think she had a better chance going north than staying here and dying with the rest of us. Mr. Sislaw adjusted himself in the office chair he was sitting in behind the pharmacy desk. He was noticeably sweating. I thank God he didn't wipe his face with his handkerchief. This was all interesting, but I kind of wanted to get a move on so me and Smokes could make it back to the Cora before dark. So did someone break into the store? The old man rose and looked at the floor surrounding me, covered in shell casings, broken glass, and loose pills. He didn't have to say anything to make me feel like a fucking idiot, just glancing at the floor, sighing when he looked at me. Are all senior citizens assholes in their last few hours? He picked up his story at a later point that day the zombies had come to town. After a while, I made my way to the front to lock the doors, regardless of what Jimmy wanted. As I passed the checkout desk, the infected burst through the doors. Being the closest person to them, I became their target. Three naked people dripping in blood and every other body fluid you can think of made a beeline at me. I didn't have any sort of defensive weapon. So I just grabbed a magazine rack from in front of the register, scattering papers as I brought it in front of me. One of the zombies threw itself at me and I knocked it to the floor with a magazine rack. It started to pick itself up and I kicked it in the balls, putting it out of the game for the time being. The wailing and screaming of the downed peavey, you know, that's what the young people call them, drowning out the roars of the other two as they charged. 
My flimsy magazine rack couldn't hold up to the onslaught of two of the demons, and they easily got through. One of them tackled my legs and knocked me onto my back, while the other one slammed into the magazine rack, shoving it against my chest. It leaned forward to rip the muscle from my shoulder, and as soon as its teeth broke my skin, it stood and looked around as if I were no longer on the menu. I was just stupefied. It was barely a break in the skin, and I could only watch while the monsters ran through the store attacking everyone. When they got bored and all the customers stopped crying, the people eventually wandered out to go somewhere else. To turn, I guess. I chose to stay here. My wife passed a few years ago and there was no reason for me to go home. I wouldn't have to deal with anyone in an empty store and I was content to spend the time I had left on Earth alone. Well, that was kind of depressing. He was clearly turning. I was just amazed it hadn't taken this long. It usually only takes a few hours for an infected human to become a ravenous nudist. But the pharmacist seemed to have passed the normal time limit. Maybe he was one of those slow burns they had been talking about on the news. And then you got robbed? I said. He laughed. Well, yeah. I locked myself in the vault in the back of the pharmacy when I started hearing punks come into the store. They tried pulling the door off and even shooting the lock before finally giving up. I reckon they were loading up on pills when some of their rivals showed up. Of course, they weren't going to share, so a gunfight broke out. I could hear automatic gunfire before things started dying down. Of course, pharmacies would be the first things looted. The Walgreens across the street had to be in the same shape. The opportunists obviously ran straight back to the pharmacy desk. I could imagine a car pulling up with three or four guys jumping out and running to the door. After a few vain attempts to crack the safe, they just got what was easy to get. They had bags full of painkillers and were probably headed out as an opposing gang pulled up. They waited in the shadows near the back and opened up on the enemy as they closed. The scene unfolded in my mind, bullets impacting soft flesh, tearing through muscle tissue and bone. Yet there was no blood or gore on the floor. The campers had successfully ambushed their foe. The victors made a clean getaway with a good amount of drugs and had apparently left at least one alive that they thought they had killed. I'm guessing that's where the bloody handprints on the car outside came from. I just wondered if the person died and the peeves got the body or he decided to walk off. I found it somewhat strange that there was no blood in the store. I wasn't expecting bodies, but did zombies also clean up blood from their already downed males? While I pondered all this, Mr. Sislaw had grown somber. Listen, son, I know I don't have much time left. I don't want to turn into one of those things. Can you? He trailed. Knowing exactly what he was asking, I immediately wanted to tell him no. How the fuck was I going to mercy kill anyone? All I had was a fucking bow and arrow. I would probably miss. Even if I did hit my target, imagining what would happen is indescribable. Even shooting an animal with that thing would feel bad. It would be horrible. More blood than a scene from Kill Bill. The damn arrow wouldn't go deep enough to put the guy out of his misery anyway. God knows how many times I'd have to shoot him. He'd look like a porcupine before he finally bled out. Scuffing my boot on the floor, I clicked my tongue. I only have a bow, I'm not sure. He interrupted. Good God, son. That would be a horrible way to go. No, I have a derringer you can use. Hell yes. After I put a bullet in this guy's brain, I will at least have one shot from a decent projectile weapon that had reasonable accuracy compared to my pointy stick shooter. See, I can think positively in the face of death. The pharmacist crushed my dreams. It's a forty-five. It's only got one shot. Damn it. Why the hell would anybody have a Derringer with one shot? I was about to ask him just that question when he continued. I'll put a pillow between my head and the gun. That way you won't get messy. Well, that was sure considerate. He was thinking ahead and about my hygiene. So it had probably been him that cleaned up the blood from the floor. He and my mama would have gotten along fine. It was amazing to me that anyone would ever be ready to die. I mean, yeah, there's being content and at peace having lived a long life. And then they're saying, yeah, it's cool. Just put a fucking bullet in my head. And oh, let's keep the mess down, shall we? Well, I guess he had lived a long life. Now he wanted to go out on his terms. So you're sure you want to do this? He seemed frustrated that I was not saying, hell yes, hurry it up, like he didn't want time to think about it. Son, I just want to go home and be with my Edith again. I'm ready. 
why the fuck don't you just do it yourself instead of making me feel like shit? Was a question I wanted to ask. Maybe he was a Catholic and believed suicide was a damnable sin. He would rather me spend eternity in hell for committing murder. I'm not condemning someone for offing themselves after being wounded on the battlefield rather than being tortured to talk. Someone dying for a cause is all right, too. It just seems like assisted suicide is still suicide. Why was I willing to do this? Having just met this old guy, I was planning to shoot him in the head because he asked nicely. Maybe I'm playing the hero as Smokes had dubbed me. I was willing to go above and beyond the call of duty to keep the story entertaining. He wanted to get a move on. I'll lay my head here on the desk. He pulled the cushion out from under him and demonstrated. Then I'll put this cushion over my head and you can just press down on the center. Forcing myself to stay calm, I sat beside his chair and started humming. Fucking really? Knocking on heaven's door is a song that comes to mind right now? Jesus, I need a counselor. Everything happened fast. He pulled the cushion tight over his sweat and skull, offered a weak thank you, and dropped silent. The only sound was his muffled breathing from below the seat cushion. It was hard to believe I was really okay with this. My body moved as if I had no control over it. Pressing the muzzle of the pistol into the cushion, I pulled the hammer back and looked up before closing my eyes. This was going to do more damage to my psyche than it was to Mr. Sislaw's head. I squeezed the trigger. Bringing my head back down, I discovered I was not covered in gore. Until this moment, I had pictured a bullet to the cranium causing an explosion like a piñata full of raw meat. Thank God the old guy wasn't breathing when I placed my hand on his back. Could you imagine if he were still alive? There's no way in hell I would pick that cushion up. I don't even know how I'd finish him off. Or that I could. Involuntarily, I shivered. Nothing was on me, but I still felt dirty as hell. It might have had something to do with the fact that I just ended the life of a thinking and fully clothed human. Keep on trucking, right? I looked up to gauge the time of the day by the sun. We needed to get moving. Maybe we wouldn't have to deal with the lunch rush. Shoving the empty pistol in my pocket, I made my way to the front. This scene would never be spoke of, but would be forever burned into my mind. I didn't need smokes reminding me that I shot a senior citizen. Wanting to bury the body or set it out in the lake or something, I couldn't bring myself to lift the cushion. I don't guess he was worried about a funeral, but I suppose you could say I was being an environmentalist, leaving some food out for the animals. Fuck, that joke was in poor taste. Sorry. Looking through the broken glass windows, I could see a KFC across the street from the fucking pharmacy. Why the hell didn't we just get our damn condiments there? It must not have been part of the plan. We had to go to the Magnolia or we would be going off script. Trying to shake off the mercy killing I had just taken part in, I continued to the front of the store. I knew it would haunt my dreams for whatever was left of my entire pathetic life. 5. Mall. Journal Entry 5. As I left the pharmacy, I stopped and took a few paces backwards. On a rack before me sat a line of untouched boxes of Nicorette patches. Opening a box, I pocketed a couple sheets. Smokes would be appreciative. It was doubtful he would find his precious nicotine sticks, and we wouldn't be stopping at the discount tobacco outlet anytime soon. I knew exactly why these had remained right where they had been when the CVS was operating. Even a 12-pack-a-day smoker wouldn't be able to put himself through the unbelievable pain of using one of the damn things. I used to use smokeless tobacco, dipping from the time I was 17 until I signed on to the Cora. Smoking the occasional cigarette or cigar, there always was a can of Grizzly in my pocket. Honestly, I started dipping because it was cool and rebellious and continued using it simply because it was a habit. It was easy to quit once I realized it would not be readily available once I was recruited to sail on a replica pirate ship. Like most addicts, I wish now that I had made the choice to end my habit years ago. All that money I would have saved not nursing my nicotine habit could have gone to buying a fucking car that wasn't disgustingly offensive. Yeah, I knew why the patches had not been stolen. At the ripe old age of 19, I got my wisdom teeth removed. The doctor told me there would be no dipping for at least a week after, so I bought some nicotine patches. I'll admit a patch does give a kick-ass buzz for about 15 minutes. After a few short moments of bliss, you would tear your arm off to make the pain stop. 
If someone gave you an Indian burn on your other arm to the point of bleeding and then rub salt in it, you'd thank them for the distraction from the patch. Maybe I sound like a pussy, but I don't particularly enjoy causing myself immense pain. Hell, I couldn't even finish an entire sheet. Unless you're a Phyllis Diller and these were the only nicotine supplements in the world, it wouldn't be worth it. I will toss them to Smokes, who might just use them. Either that or he will pretend to be eternally grateful and throw them away when I'm not looking. It's good big pharmacy chains like CVS and Walgreens have become like tiny Walmarts. They basically stock everything. Glancing through each aisle where the shelves had not been knocked over, I was able to grab a couple backpacks. Then I found bottled water and began putting several days' worth in both. When I finished looting, I turned to see Smokes at the register. He was throwing a temper tantrum, destroying shit after having no luck finding cigarettes. There was no way of knowing if he was screaming, sobbing, or both as he beat a checkout counter with a magazine rack. I made some noise on my approach so he would take control of himself. Cracker, there ain't no fucking new points up in here. He spoke with his back to me, clearly wiping his eyes. I got them candy bars and shit you was looking for. They on that counter. My new friend pointed to where he had gathered what he could find of the items I listed. It was disappointingly pathetic. Up for salvage were things like an almost empty box of Snickers bars, three paydays, and some teriyaki Slim Jims. There was one pack of Reese's Cups, which he was currently devouring. Of course, there were two things I should have realized would be the last edible stolen during the rush on convenience stores at the onset of any sort of apocalypse. Visible were an unmolested box of York peppermint patties and a box of those beef cheese stick combos. I would rather slurp down zombie shit with a straw than eat either of those torture devices with which they use to interrogate terrorists. The only person I've met in my entire life that likes York peppermint patties is my mother. I do not even want to know the kind of person that eats those other items. I'm not sure they're technically food. It's beyond me how York peppermint patties keep getting restocked since nobody ever buys the damn things. Do they have an expiration date? Sighing, I spoke to no one in particular. Well, shit. You only get what you get and you don't pitch a fit, right? Smokes agreed even if he did butcher the quote. Shit, scats. When life gives you lemons, just make lemon juice. Brave confusion crossed my face. I decided not to call him on it. He seemed confident that he had just given me a few words of wisdom. Plus, I guess that was closer to what we had. Shaking my head, I groaned. There's not much good stuff to take with us. We'll stop here on the way back and get a bunch more shit. Looking at the meager supplies he had scrounged, I rubbed my neck. There ain't any gum. He smiled goofily and shot a finger pistol at me, patting his pocket with the other hand. Not for you, sucker. It's bubblicious and I call dibs, bitch. Motherfucker. Before leaving the CVS, God granted me a small reprieve. Smokes licked his lips. Oh, shit, homeboy. I love me some York peppermint patties. I wish I could crawl up inside one of them and eat my way out. Well, if I were to be forced to survive on our scavenged food, at least I would not have to suffer anything worse than malnourishment and heartburn. Our journey was so uneventful, we relaxed and lowered our weapons. As if I'd hit anything, or Smokes was actually going to fire his machine pistol. My companion was obviously bored. He had uncharacteristically stopped talking. That was as scary as being surrounded by ravenous cannibals. Every business and house appeared merely abandoned, with not one boarded up window or barricaded door. They just seemed to be dark, empty buildings. Empty of humans, that is. Obviously there had been more than a robbery attempt here, rather a full assault. It was unknown if the defenders or the attackers were victorious. Either way, I wasn't going to enter a place where a gunman could be hiding with a fucking armory of weapons. Over the next rise was downtown Guntersville. I could imagine what lay before me. Mental images of what I expected to see in a city after the end of the world. Most of the buildings would be burned. Bodies littering the streets. Zombie search parties scouring for innocent children. Yeah, my imagination runs away from me sometimes. To be fair, it's what our legends have led us to expect. Guntersville has no skyline, busy boulevards, cineplex or five-star hotels. At five stories, the courthouse was the tallest building while most were no taller than two. I could have convinced myself that it had all been a dream. Maybe there had been no sweeping apocalypse that had turned almost everyone into blue carnivorous apes. Everything was right in the world.
Cars were parked on the street in front of stores as if it were just any other day. No gore strewn over sidewalks, only litter and zombie shit was sprayed haphazardly to remind me I was in hell. Traffic was not backed up, but it was facing the wrong way. What had to be tons of reeking fertilizer made my shitty situation clear. Only a few things told me I was in a world of figurative shit. None of the buildings had electricity. There was absolutely no traffic from any direction on any roadway, and I was standing in the middle of what should have been a busy avenue with the guy who played one of Jim Carrey's fat sons from me, myself, and Irene. All that in the complete silence. Even a small city in Alabama was fairly noisy, but there were not even birds chirping. The only thing I could hear was the wind and smoke smacking the hell out of his watermelon bubblegum. The lack of sounds made this country boy uneasy. Smokes didn't seem to notice until we reached the large complex of the First Methodist Church of Guntersville. Its parking lot was packed bumper to bumper. So that's where everyone went, I said. He spoke. Them peoples? Lowering his voice to a reasonable volume, Smokes continued. Having revival or some shit? I knew exactly what this was. The same scenario had been beaten like a dead horse in nearly every zombie movie. Granted, I don't have the wisdom of George Romero as Smokes claims to, so maybe I'm totally wrong. Even a guy that is not a follower of The Walking Dead could picture what was inside that church. The fact that my friend did not seem to outwardly realize it made me question his true understanding of the zombie lore he preached. This is one of those places where the faithful go to seek refuge and ask for God's guidance. Guess what? Some member of the congregation is infected and believes God will heal their sickness. The poor bastard turns and infects most, if not all, of the other faithful. Prayers for healing go unanswered, so the pastor decides to close his infected flock into the basement. He spends days fasting and praying for a miraculous healing of God's chosen. Astoundingly, his fruitless petitions also go unheeded. The next scene begins with the hero just minding his own post-apocalyptic business. Typical of the movie, he finds some obscure reason to go into the church. Complete surprise overtakes the hero when zombies are discovered. Possibly losing at least one comrade, he's horrified to learn the lunatic preacher of the church is corralling the damn undead. When ending the life of this deranged man of God, the hero will feel completely justified. The hero then ends the chapter by barely escaping with his life and perhaps one other unimportant and unnamed character that does not affect the plot. The not-really-worth-it point of entering the damn building full of monsters in the first place is completely forgotten. Roll credits. Yeah, I just described an archetype every other screenwriter for every zombie movie in the past decade has used. See? I was completely mentally prepared for this apocalypse. That's why there is no way in hell I'm going anywhere near that place so I can barely escape with my life. Fuck that. Just by the way he was standing, I could tell Smokes wanted to go inside for at least a raid on the kitchen. They got to be some... I was not going to let him convince me to go in there. Think about it, dumbass. Do you really want to get eaten by an old lady in a choir robe? Fuck no, cuz. But what if... Feeling confident about interrupting him like he constantly did me, I knew it was really pissing him off. Hey, if you want to be the first to die like you say most black guys do in the movies, go for it. I'm not going through those doors. Smokes often spoke of us as if we were movie characters, and all our actions were predestined in a script. Obviously, he compared possible outcomes to circumstances we'd seen on the screen. That's where I wanted my practical belief to stop. So whenever he gave me the opportunity, I was happy to throw his movie shit right back at him. He rewarded me with a raised eyebrow. Touché, brah. After deciding I wasn't going to interrupt him again, he haltingly continued. Listen, you stupid son of a shit fuck. This ain't how it's supposed to happen. You gots to be adamant about charging in to save some minor or insignificant characters. Then load up on the supplies we find. His inner city speech patterns were some bullshit way to act tough. The sometimes strange profanities were used with such certainty I was impressed by the force of them. Regardless, he wasn't going to convince me. I wasn't going in there, ever. This was a community gathering place. Who knows? Maybe they did store useful supplies inside the church. I just wasn't going in right now. And not because of my own movie-born trepidation. Until the next excuse left my mouth, I didn't realize I planned to recon the property later. D 
Dude, there are two of us versus God knows how many zombies. The only weapons we have are a fucking bow and arrow and a submachine gun that you've never even fired before. After we find some guns or reinforcements, then we can go to church. We'll wait and see how long it takes for you to get bit. I smirked with my final jab. There was no way to explain how. I just knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the building was full of pavies. I continued to reiterate my point until my companion relented. Smokes finally conceded he wasn't going to force me to go inside. There was no glint of pride in his eye when he realized I spoke like a faithful follower of his Hollywood zombie gospel. For a minute, I didn't know if I actually believed we were living a movie or if it was just appeasing him. The line between simply using reverse psychology and agreeing with his insane notions was definitely becoming blurred. On to the Magnolia. When we were directly in front of the church, I stopped to look back for some reason. Come be washed in the blood was crudely written in bright red lettering on the formerly electrified sign. Fucking creepy. As I stopped and pointed, Smokes followed my finger and read the message. He glanced at the church building and prophesied, We be back, fools. I dropped my head and turned to leave. Deep inside, I knew Smokes spoke the truth. Walking on past the church parking lot, we followed the paved sidewalk. The next building on our left was the city police department. It was tempting to stop and see what could be had for grabs. Didn't I hear somewhere that Guntersville had a SWAT team? After trying to find my phone to check the time and cursing myself for still being dependent on technology, I looked up at the sun to guesstimate the time. The decision was made to save this possible treasure chest of firearms for another trip. It would have been nice to have a couple of shotguns, but there weren't yet any raiders from which we would need to defend. On top of that, there was nothing in which to carry a bunch of weapons in, and we still had hours of daylight left before the infected were comfortable coming out. Too bad they were not like vampires who burst into flames when touched by UV rays, or even like the gay-ass vampires from Twilight who sparkled and shit. Though still dangerous, it would have at least been amusing. It had to be the PV's eyes that were bothered by UV light, or maybe they heard the John Tesh radio show stories about sunlight and skin cancer. Of course, as I said, it was not impossible for them to come out during the day. The motherfuckers had chased Crow and me one sunny afternoon. They almost caught us, too. We barely made it back to the boat. I guess they're just more comfortable in darkness. Over my shoulder, I could see Smokes had tired the bubble gum and was already tearing into a peppermint patty. Have fun with that, big boy. I laughed, reaching for a Snickers bar. My large friend stopped what he was doing when he noticed me watching him struggling with the rapper. The fuck you staring at, penis junkie? In another time, this childish insult would have been amusing. Smokes, generally easygoing, would suddenly become serious with certain strangely misused or mixed profanities. It was almost like he had to really push it to be intimidating. Since this Jekyll and Hyde feature was frequent and unpredictable, I concluded that moving forward was the best way to handle it. The insult did not faze me in the slightest. I smirked. Nothing, cockwaffle. The reason I turned around was because I expected him to complain about not going inside since I basically beat him with a newspaper when he argued with me about going into the church to begin with. I guess he was just too wounded for round two. Maybe he was just too distracted by his packaging dilemma. We continued uneventfully through downtown. Eventually, Gunter merged with Blount to again become U.S. Highway 431. I don't know if I realized it before I agreed to go on this stroll through zombie land, but almost directly across from the Magnolia is Bottom Dollar Pawn. A native like Smokes must have figured the pawn shop was my reason for suggesting a trip all the way across the island. Whether I had foreseen this as a part of my master plan was no longer in question. We can now run through the restaurant and pick up our condiments, then browse through the shelves of the advertised biggest selection of firearms in the county. Hopefully we could jog back to the boat before sundown. I control my own fate. This wasn't part of the plan or anything, right? Okay, never mind about jogging. My extremely unhealthy companion would probably collapse if he were forced to move faster than a trap. At least we'd have more guns. Maybe I could even find an awesome wristwatch. Uneventful were the last couple blocks of Gunter Avenue. No sound or movement was detected, except when Smoke swore to black Jesus that he heard a kitten crying. This little diversion took half an hour and turned up neither kitten nor useful resources whatsoever. Maybe it was fatigue, 
but I was starting to see Smoke's point. Our lives were looking more and more like a B-movie. Where was the rampant chaos? There was no one left to form a crazed stampede. Where were the marauding hordes? I don't see cameras or the film crew. Most automobiles we passed were totally undamaged, probably had full tanks of gas, and I never thought to check any for keys. A day-long hike like this could have been turned into a minutes-long car ride if I had the foresight to look in the fucking ignition of the few cars. Of course, that would have been too safe and easy. Maybe the lack of imminent peril had made us complacent. Perhaps we could just take a break and things will go back to normal. That could be what Crow was doing, just fishing and waiting the whole thing out. Naively, I agreed to take a walk across no man's land with a bow and arrow, a guy I just met, and without even a poorly thought out plan. Somehow this had to be Smoke's fault. He had obviously used hypnosis or Jedi mind tricks on me. There is no way I'm this thoughtless. Really, I'm not normally stupid enough to walk unarmed across an island full of rabid animals. On second thought, my intelligence is debatable. I thought about the excitement of my favorite action heroes had experienced. The life and death chases, the near escapes, the devastating losses. All that happened according to a screenplay. Obviously, Smokes would say it was right up the road for us, but I wasn't so sure. It was disappointing to see no real signs of struggle or very few minor accidents. I wanted to get caught up in Smoke's Hollywood scriptural predictions, but it's better to be more of a realist and understand that life doesn't follow a script. Reality was somewhere in between. Some things were obviously occurring as if they had been set up by a film crew, while others were noticeably absent. No one knows whether life imitates art or the other way around. Perhaps what was happening here was just a mixture of real life and dark imagination. Also, I realize that almost all zombie movies follow characters in large metropolitan areas. Perhaps things were more dramatic in San Francisco or Tokyo than they were out here in Podunk, Alabama. It goes without saying Atlanta was infested with walkers. By the time we got to the Magnolia, we were both extremely bored. Not that either of us was in a hurry to face unimaginable horrors, it just felt like nothing at all was happening. We were just two guys walking around downtown on a lazy afternoon. Stopping in the restaurant parking lot, we noticed it was half full. Seemingly, most people had not taken the spread of the infection seriously. They had gone out for lunch. The city government prepared at the last minute, but not in time to make a damn difference. The civilian population had taken no action to defend themselves from impending doom besides running away and screaming. Law enforcement had opened all four lanes of the highway across the island to northbound traffic only. I noticed the hastily erected barricades blocking vehicle traffic from all roads leading to the city from the south. Apparently incoming people were being checked for bites. Or maybe they were just flat out denied entry onto the island. Who knew? These barricades had been nothing more than the cop cars lined up bumper to bumper across all four lanes. Hazard cones were randomly thrown about. The barricade seemed fairly tight. It'll remain a mystery how the infection broke through. Never mind, crazy blue people just jumped the cars. The police officers stationed at these checkpoints were undoubtedly caught completely off guard when the zombies attacked. Cars had not been moved to retreat or evade. After we finished our search of the restaurant, I would need to make sure to give the police cars a once-over to search for weapons and try out the radios. Just before entering the front doors to perform our cautious, threatening-looking, yet completely harmless sweep of the large entrance room, the two of us heard a distinct echoing shout from the vast expanse of silence. Definitely human. Only one voice. It sounded more like an excited roller coaster enthusiast in the theme park than a lone survivor of the Azampocalypse. The whooping cry sounded like it was coming from the south. Fucking awesome! The two of us made a mad dash through the decidedly empty restaurant. Scavengers we were, filling our backpacks with salt, pepper, ketchup, mustard, hot sauce, tartar sauce, coffee creamer, fuck if I know, and any other package that appeared to be a condiment we could grab. We literally hit the swinging kitchen doors at the same exact instant. Until that happened, I didn't think it was possible. Ebony and Ivory were wedged shoulder to shoulder. Both stepping back, I gestured for Smokes to go through the doors ahead of me. Fuck your mama, white bread. You just waiting for the black guy to get eat first. Dude, there's nothing in there. Plus, there's no difference in being up front or watching the rear. Go on. 
When I repeated the gesture, Smoke shook his head exaggeratedly. Mimicking my hand movements, he spoke cartoonishly. No, sir, I let the massa go first. Fuck you, jackass. Unwilling to argue this point any more, I wouldn't even dignify it with a comeback. I just wanted to hurry the hell up and get back to the boat. Hearing him mumble something about slavery and racist motherfucking cracker, I passed through the door ahead of him and knew he was just trying to bait me. 6. Mo. Journal Entry 6. Most of the kitchen was too bathed in shadow to be thoroughly searched. Plus, there wasn't a lot we urgently needed on the Cora. No way in hell either of us movie fans could be bothered to search for some type of marinade or herbs in the walk-in freezers, despite my constant diet of unseasoned fish. Yeah, ketchup would have to do. More terrifying movie scenes are in meat lockers than in boiler rooms. Walking down the hallway to the side exit, I heard my companion make an interested noise behind me. I stopped and turned around just as he veered off to his right. Directly in front of him was what I realized was an industrial upright freezer illuminated by the waning sunlight through a window. This guy was not only a dope-dealing, gang-banging, Guinness Book of World Records obese zombie prophet, Smokes also had the nose of a bloodhound for sweets. Opening the freezer door, he found eight buckets of unmelted but softened chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream. Hopefully there were no real eggs in it. If the look on his face was any indication, it was still edible. The power had only been off for a few days. A lot of the stuff in the freezer was probably still good since it had remained closed. Standing in the doorway, I was dumbfounded. Smokes desperately shoved aside more mundane, more nutritious items to reach the shining yellow and white buckets of treasure. Watching my husky friend reach into a nearby drawer for a spoon, he then dove into the gooey treat like Scarface on a mountain of cocaine. Time to take what I wanted, I suppose. Opening cabinets like a burglar, I grabbed boxes of pancake mix, instant mac and cheese, canned beans, veggies, powdered milk, Cheerios, and Fruit Loops. Plus my own treasure. A huge bag of tortilla chips and a king-size jar of salsa. We also found something that I believe Crow would appreciate, a bag of mini marshmallows. If possible, they might make her smile. Or at least she could use them for bait. Okay, I know that was a weird thought. Once my pack was stuffed, I turned to Smokes. He had cookie dough all over his mouth like a toddler caught in the act. Dude, we kind of need to make our way back to the boat. I spoke haltingly, afraid to startle the hungry beast. No response. He was too busy driving himself to early onset diabetes or blinded by the sugar rush to even acknowledge me. He continued shoveling mushy ice cream into a bottomless pit. Maybe he figured he might as well get it while it lasted. I stepped closer and tried again. Hey, you fat piece of shit! Thankfully, he turned to that because my next attempt at getting his attention would have been to throw something at him. I knew it wasn't a good idea to throw things at a guy with a gun. Looking back, it's not smart to insult a guy with a gun either. He probably wouldn't have known how to take the safety off even if he had decided to raise it. Of course, he probably didn't know what a safety was. That's how people get shot by accident. Good Lord, oh mama sweet Jesus, land of milk and honey. He screamed, licking his lips in the spoon as if I had not even spoken. He looked at me like I'd interrupted him mid-coitus. I lick your sister like this if you don't get fuck out of my face, cracker. I knew he was just trying to scare me, and he might have, if I had a sister. I was about to say something else as he irritatedly asked a question. The hell you want, jizz goggler? I raised a thumb over my shoulder, indicating the fading light through the window. We ain't got time for any more fucking ice cream. Before I said it, I knew there was no way I would get his fat ass to budge. Looks like we will be spending the night in a powerless kitchen. Moving chest and shelving units to barricade the door, I bickered with him for a few more minutes. Was ice cream that important? To him, I guess chocolate chip cookie dough was. Smokes continued to shovel cookie dough into his maw in total darkness as I fumbled for the small flashlight I kept on my key ring. Yeah, I know I don't have a car or a house door to justify having a key ring. I do keep the keys to my parents' house and the key to my footlocker. So where else would I keep my tiny flashlight? Wearing a key ring since I got my driver's license, it always comes in handy at some point. Mad as hell, I was pretty much throwing extra shit into my barricade. 
having what I thought was a pretty good haul and we hadn't even been to the pawn shop yet. Now I would be forced to sleep on a concrete floor. Planning to sit in silent outrage until he was finished, I forgot I was stuck with a guy that found it impossible to stop speaking even when he was dumping food into his trap. Who do you think we gonna run into first? He suddenly asked, as if we were deep in conversation. Responding sarcastically, I acted like I knew exactly what he was talking about. Well, for your sake, I hope it's not the Pillsbury Doughboy. For our sake, I hope we meet an armed Navy SEAL team. He looked at me with a raised eyebrow, asking if I was serious. In a voice that was almost not his, he fake laughed. Ha ha, very funny. I suppose that's possible, but it will not happen. At least not yet. We will start by meeting main protagonists on our journey back to the Viva Encora. After I was certain the door was secured, I started looking through the deep pockets of my backpack. It seemed to have been a back-to-school item. There was a package of pencils with erasers and a small notebook. Erasers were exactly what I was looking for as I didn't have any and the spare paper might come in handy. I made a mental note to pick up a couple more on the way back to the boat. The fine softened my mood a bit. Smokes continued as if this were a teachable moment. Can you list any of the core group of main protagonists? I was surprised and he hadn't yet decided on a title for our living movie. I refused to look at him or say anything. He would correct me or feel the need to explain further, regardless of my answer. Yep, I was pouting. Predictably, he continued on as if my silence indicated rapt attention. There are three types of characters. The first type is major, which are also known as core or main. The second type is minor, also known as secondary. You will also see a third and final type, insignificant, extras. They will most likely die horribly, and usually within just a couple scenes. With no more than a total of ten main protagonists at one time, there will obviously be main antagonists. The core characters fill the majority of this, well, any story with action, some personal history, in humor, or unforgettable drama. Minor characters may come and go, but they will rarely play a crucial role in the story or attempt any real quest of significance, and they don't usually last long enough to start any type of romance. Not forgetting the final class, I must cover insignificance. Least important, they have no backstory, and very few lines. Maybe an opening for a joke, but the punchline will come from a main. The audience may not even know their names. My husky friend paused here, and I realized that this was going to be a very detailed lecture. His posture became even more respectable. His accent was changing to something a lot more educated sounding, and he suddenly took on the aura of a scientist or Ph.D., as if he had pulled a nutty professor, except he became a genius and remained ridiculously fat. He cleared his throat. Any major character can naturally have one or more minor traits and will possibly take on additional major trait. Smokes again stopped as if to let this information sink in. This was going to be something that needed to be archived. I opened my new notebook and prepared to transcribe everything Smokes said. It would be called the Book of Smokes. I could read it back to him if I ever needed to call him out on his gangster crap. It was beyond luck that I just so happened to pick up the backpack with writing material tucked inside. I was starting to envision predestined events. Before I began transcribing, I prompted, So who are the main characters in, in this one? Smokes laid everything out and it made perfect sense. When we made it back to the ship, I will tuck the Book of Smokes transcription into my footlocker with my journal. After sleeping several hours, the alarm of one of Smoke's many wristwatches, none of which he would share with me, played, I believe, in miracles. It was alerting us it had been eight hours since I instructed him to set an alarm. Taking a quick look through the door, I could see it was now light outside. We collected our gear, new bounty, and headed out. 7. Mall. Journal Entry 7. Prophecy from the Book of Smokes The expert is one of the lead characters in the epic and should join the main protagonist soon after the beginning of the saga. This person is usually either retired military or law enforcement, at least middle-aged, and always has first-hand experience in firearms and survivalism. The character has always lived by the laws of both. 
the expert has been predicting and hoping for some type of catastrophic national or preferably worldwide disaster. The event horizon could be economic or social, man-made or natural. Whatever the cause, it will disrupt civilization and bring things back to a simpler time. Wipe out technological advancement, big business, and bloated corrupt governments. Finally, society is reset, with the experts' help leaving only the worthy to rebuild some new world order. Off in a gun nut, the expert is a true believer who sees Doomsday as Independence Day. Naively, most of the other survivors assume that everyone who's left will form a collective of peaceful, cooperative humanitarians who just want to get along. They never take into account the villain element, but the expert does. This character will step in, an encyclopedia of common sense, loyal heart, and confident leadership. The expert is capable of great self-sacrifice for the safety of the team. In fact, it's the way this person hopes to go out. Guns blazing while his or her buddies take the hill or make their escape. As the sun peeked over the mountains in the distance, our shadows crossed the parking lot. Cautiously, we directed ourselves to our goal on the other side of the highway. It was quiet. Some might say too quiet. So quiet, it once more made me briefly wonder if there had actually been a widespread Armageddon event that killed everything. What if we were just two psychotic mental patients that had been kidnapped and placed in the middle of a film set, like a fucked up hybrid of Candid Camera and Survivor? Maybe a twist in America's funniest home videos. Bob Saget's probably the mastermind. Only the fact that there were stinking piles of zombie shit splattered on the ground at random intervals as far as the eye could see reaffirmed this was reality, or at least a very good imitation created by very sick individuals. Crossing the four lane, Smokes followed me closely. The bounds of dairy and sugar on his stomach kept him fairly quiet. Adamantly, I instructed him to zip it while outside. For the first time on our quest, I took in corpses, well over a dozen. The closer we drew, the more evident it became that most, if not all, of the bodies had been wounded by at least one high-powered projectile. Besides the nearly naked or the few with shit overflowing their pants, it was difficult to tell how many of the bodies strewn before the entrance to Bottom Dollar were peevies, and how many had been uninfected humans. I know intellectually, real zombies are not technically undead reanimants. They are just infected with some sort of doped-up rabies. The fallen were not necessarily dropped by headshots. Ravenous animals weren't affected by pain like those uninfected, but they can be crippled or bleed out just the same. Smokes and I had already discussed raiding this pawn shop. My friend had given me plenty of grief over skipping the last building, so I decided we were getting in this place no matter what. Slowing my pace, it crossed my mind the bullets lodged in these bodies might have come from bottom dollar. Thankfully, the parking lot had a few cars in it. A couple of people must have gotten smart and decided to arm themselves. I guess they were a little too late. Keeping cars between me and the entrance up to the building face, I felt safe for the moment. It seemed a little too convenient to me at the same time. All the windows remained intact, and I ducked down a couple of yards from the storefront until I was able to stand against the solid wall between the line of windows and the door. It was a good thing I emptied my bladder outside of the restaurant this morning. I still almost pissed myself when I turned to locate Smokes in the parking lot and discovered him less than two feet away from my face. Not always hyper-attentive to my surroundings, I was stupefied. Holy shit, there was not even a damn bird chirping in this city, and a guy the size of a fucking elephant had snuck up on me. Those Reeboks did not appear to be noiseless ninja moccasins with wings. There's no way he got that close to me that fast without me hearing him. Barely able to swallow a shriek, I tried to regain my composure while chancing a look over the lip of the window. Of course, Smokes appeared completely unaware, and he made me almost shit my pants. Obviously, I didn't receive a bullet in the head, so the coast was clear. Most of the gun racks looked empty, so if Bottom Dollar did get a lot of last-minute business, it must have remained civil. No shell casings littered the ground, and the windows had not been broken. It was good to know that Bottom Dollar Pawn Shop had not become someone's, probably the owner's, private Alamo. I watched through the window a while longer. Once satisfied the building was free of hostels, I stepped over to the door. It was conveniently unlocked. As I gently pushed it open, a bell sounded, causing me to hit the deck. Smokes nearly fainted as he fell over onto his ass. Holding a prone position for what seemed like an eternity, I was scared to move. 
Wasn't sure nobody was around to alert. I lifted my head to make sure Smokes had not had a stroke or broken a hip. Intact, he dusted himself off and tried to regain his dignity. Guardedly, I moved to the checkout desk where I was sure I could find ammunition for any of the weapons we bought with our five-finger discount. In high school, I stole tobacco a few times from the gas station in my hometown. We all did it. Not considering myself a thief, I wouldn't normally take things without paying. At the moment, the circumstances were entirely different. Anyway, there wasn't anyone to pay. I felt the state of affairs justified my thievery. You could say my survival depended on it. In hindsight, I wish I'd taken a shopping cart from the CVS. I laughed to myself, picturing my large friend and me masquerading as bums pushing shopping carts through town. Just a couple of homeless people who had raided a National Guard armory. Also, I didn't think to simply stuff a damn vehicle with firearms and drive back to the fucking boat. I guess I'm kind of new to this looting thing. Maybe we would at least find long guns with shoulder straps that we could carry back. Can't forget about all that food we grabbed. Who knows what else we might find in this place. My runaway train of thought was halted as I heard a noise that was all too familiar. I mentioned that I used to dip smokeless tobacco. Well, once you try it, you will always be able to identify the sound of a person spraying a stream of tobacco juice from their mouth. The sound cannot be described, but I knew instantly what it was, almost screaming as the stream impacted my right boot. Gotcha. In the endless nanoseconds between the spit hitting my foot, Hearing those two ominous syllables, I looked up to see my executioner. For some fucking reason, I had the time to be offended that someone had just spit when I automatically realized was red man chewing tobacco on me. The person about to blow a hole through my skull sat in a tree stand attached to the wall, only a few feet above eye level, pointing a mean-looking AR-15 at me and wore camouflage from head to toe. The building was dimly lit and the camouflage made this obvious antagonist difficult to spot. But shit, it's unbelievable I didn't notice a figure pointing the gun at me. Not that it would have done any good if I had seen the person. I wasn't even near ready to defend myself. The ball was held casually in one hand and I was daydreaming about buggies. Hell, I deserve to be shot. Maybe it would be quick and painless. Who are you? My soon-to-be killer asked. Where did you come from? The gunner continued, And what are you doing in my shop? My murderer pulled the camo turkey mask up to reveal flowing and ridiculously red hair dropping below shoulder length, a camouflage pattern in pink eye patch over her left eye, and a wad of chewing tobacco sticking out of her smiling mouth. Don't just stand there peeing your pants. Answer my questions. I just looked at her, dumbfounded. My imminent death would be at the hands of a woman that appeared to be about my mother's age. Though there was not much physical resemblance, I could close my eyes and picture her as Kathy Bates. She should be screaming, Tawanda, and repeatedly ramming her car into another. Or she should have been warning me about the dangers of foosball. Well, didn't you see the closed sign? We are closed, and you are trespassing. She prodded, emphasizing by jabbing the rifle in my direction. She said the same thing Mr. Sislaw had, reminding me of what went down at the pharmacy. I finally stupidly stuttered. I'm, I'm Mo. And now that I think about it, I wish I'd added, No, ma'am. Sorry, I wasn't really concerned with the working hours of a store that I thought was abandoned. But that would have been too smooth. She must have been surprised a retarded person could have survived the outbreak. The redhead laughed sympathetically. Well, howdy, Mo. I'm Petunia. Now would you mind telling me what you're doing here? Yes, she really admitted to being named Petunia, same as Porky fucking Peg's girlfriend. Her accent was obviously local. It appeared through the camouflage that she was physically fit, at least for her age. I'm not one of those weirdos with a granny fetish. I could tell that she had been pretty hot when she was younger, judging from the neck up. The AR-15 was pretty hot anyway. I started to explain, but it was more like rambling. We were just going to grab what we needed. We had no idea anyone was here, or we would have... She interrupted. We? Not even thinking to see where my companion was, I turned to see he'd magically transported to wherever he wanted to be. Not right behind me. Motherfucker, was I going to have to make him take the lead from now on? How the hell did someone that huge manage to completely vanish at will? 
I turned from looking over my shoulder at the empty sidekick space behind me to once again face the crazy woman with the wicked rifle. A mix of terror and confusion crossed my face as I was about to apologize for losing my behemoth of a compatriot. She turned the muzzle of her rifle to the ceiling and fired a single round. As if it could possibly help had the bullet been aimed at me, I dropped my bow which was hanging uselessly at my side and jumped in surprise, holding both hands up in surrender. The blast also startled Smokes. Standing from his crouch between displays, he put his hands up. Jesus, lady, that shit loud up in here. My head rotated to see that he was standing only a few feet from the door, as if he had not followed me at all. The some bitch could have probably made it outside with a little more effort. Gazing in wonderment at the ceiling and then at Petunia, she read my mind. What? It's just a ceiling. I don't think I'll get charged with firing a gun in the city limits. She gestured to Smokes with her free hand and spoke across the building. And now the gang's all here. Come on up here, big boy. Petunia cackled as Smoke slowly crept to my side. So you boys were just dropping by to steal some of my guns? It was like she was an adult scolding two unruly children she busted in the middle of being mischievous. I had to say something before my inconsiderate and sometimes disrespectful friend got us both killed. Honestly, ma'am, we didn't think that there was anyone left in town to steal from. We was just going to grab a few guns and some ammo. If you'll let us leave with our lives, that would be much appreciated. I would have been happy as hell to go back out to the boat with nothing but ketchup in my worthless bow. She must have known I was thinking of home. What would you do with the guns if you had them? The woman was angry we were about to steal from the store that she owned, or at least laid claim to. I fully believe she was going to shoot us both dead. What was the damn point in having any sort of conversation? Just kill me fucking swiftly so I could be done with this shit. I tried to explain our entire predicament in the shortest way possible. We were going to use them to defend the Viva Ancora. She seemed intrigued, relaxing her grip on the rifle. Viva Ancora? Oh, God. I really didn't want to detail all this shit to my executioner. She could just read my journal after she blows my head off and commandeers our ship. I almost rolled my eyes at my own stupidity. I continued talking anyway. You see, I work for a foundation that sells replica pirate ships in... Hot dog! I didn't know the Cora was in town. It's always fun to get a tour. Why, we used to book up the whole ship when the family came up. You still got that crazy captain... What's-his-face running the ship? There was no point in explaining that every member of the crew had basically been glorified volunteer hobos whose payment for manual labor was room and board. The ship was as abandoned now as the rest of the town. Trying to stick with what was simple, my answers had been pretty clipped thus far. For some reason, she just didn't fucking shoot me. Her inane questioning continued. Does she still have a working motor? I cocked my head in bafflement as she followed this line. She asked the basics. Is the boat passed up? The captain, is he aboard? Do you have beer? Those were only a few of her stupid questions. Maybe I had been too pessimistic. We might just get out of here without being splattered across the floor. It will be easier if I could just show you. Would you like that, ma'am? Bringing both hands together in a quick clap, her rifle dropped to her side on its strap. Oh my gosh! That sounds great. I've been so bored sitting in this store. Going for a sale would be amazing, she said and then stopped. Petunia squinted her one eye and asked, For free, right? No, fucked hard, I'm gonna charge you money. I'm only offering this while at gunpoint. And what do you mean you're bored? You haven't been fighting for survival against insane cannibals? Petunia's utter bubbliness and seeming acceptance of humanity's near extinction irked me. But I had to smile. Here was the expert a gun dealer who took this catastrophe in stride, even seeming a bit jolly over it. Every time I began to question the validity of the zombie gospel of Marlon Williamson, it became evident that events were indeed following a script. It was entirely too convenient that she so readily agreed to travel to the boat with us. Smokes had predicted that all of our incoming characters would be more than happy to join our band of survivors. Though not really convenient, it was proven to be part of the plan. I'm acting captain now, and this here's my first mate, Smokes. We'll be happy to give you a tour. Quickly adding, 
We'll just need to take a few guns with us and anything else that you think we might need to defend ourselves on our journey home. I didn't want to seem too exuberant about continuing to do a shit job even after the end of the world. Either she was extremely lonely or had suffered severe brain damage. She listed our needed firearms and corresponding ammunition, doling out the weapons without question. The expert brought out tactical vests and Kevlar helmets as she dumped water purifiers, long-range scopes, night vision goggles, assorted knives, and other quasi-commando gear in front of us. As she worked, she filled us in on a little bit of her personal history. She told us that she had joined the military during the Cold War. Though women had not been in combat roles, her left eye had been taken by one of those Soviet pinkos that came at her with a dull bayonet. Never specific, her unit had been some kind of black ops, special operations, Delta Force, super secret squad that was part of the Marines or no official military branch or something that Petunia captained. After a few minutes of listening to the disjointed autobiography of this patriotic heroine sprinkled with a lecture on the evils of communism, I realized both of us remained planted. It was funny that Smokes was now outfitted in a tactical vest. Surprisingly, there was one in his size in existence. What was really cool was that both of us had been armed to the teeth without realizing it. We'd gained a real warrior. I was about to ask Smokes why he was grinning like a damn clown when my friend exaggeratedly mouthed, The expert, Holmeslice! Though a bit ditzy, Petunia was not ignorant to the fact that there was some kind of infectious Armageddon right outside her shop. She knew the best way to deal with hostiles was kick-ass firepower. As she continued to hint about her history and outfit us with gear, I decided that I couldn't call this woman Petunia indefinitely. Aware that I'm a shallow asshole, my regional heritage trumps my attitude. It requires me to respect my elders, especially military service men and women. I politely cleared my throat to interrupt her. So what should we call you, ma'am? Now that I think about it, I could have just called her by her rank. She picked up my trailing question. Captain Petunia Sledge. The captain extended her hand, giving us the choice to call her by any of the three. Smokes grinned. Sledgehammer? The captain smiled. That was my daddy's nickname. Everyone just calls me Hammer. I thought I might have heard of her father and was about to ask if he was also a veteran. Hammer began an introductory conversation with my comrade. She would be a welcome addition to the group. It seemed we had come across the only living person that could go conversationally toe-to-toe -to -toe with Smokes. She seemed perfectly capable of keeping him busy most of the time, and my husky friend looked pleased to oblige her. Evidently, there wasn't much more any of us could carry. Even with the large duffel bags Hammer had packed, we were over-encumbered. When I turned ahead toward the exit, I noticed my bow on the ground. Though I could barely use the damn thing, I didn't really want to part with it. Someone at some point in the future might find it useful. Picking it up, I clipped it to the quiver of arrows that still hung over my shoulder. The male portion of our trio was almost out the door when Hammer excused herself to go potty. Dropping my bags, I was glad to think about being loaded down by firearms. I wanted to bounce a few questions off my, well, he was really more of a prophet than a sidekick. That all this was strangely working out just as Smokes had foretold didn't escape my notice. A former killing machine had accepted us as instantly trustworthy, offered more weapons than we would ever need, and ultimately agreed to join our little club. There was no way it could be luck. I spoke without looking up. Can you believe this shit? He misunderstood my question. Hells yeah, cuz! I got me a fucking M16! He slapped the barrel of the AR-15 hanging from his shoulder. There was no point in arguing firearm labels. The gun was cool and he was close enough. Why did she want so much tourist information about the ship? She was obviously familiar with it. She called it the Cora. Did she really give us enough guns to invade a small country within the first 15 minutes of our meeting? Maybe we just give off a vibe of being okay guys with nothing but good intentions. Well, Smokes might give that impression at least. I've never felt people automatically liked me or even assumed I'm a good person. If they did, it seemed like I'd occasionally get a girlfriend. Turning back, sunlight illuminated the checkout desk through the glass door. There were several Mountain Dew bottles emptied of drink and at least a quarter of the way full of dark substance. Hammer was definitely a heavy chewer. This woman's more of a man than most men. Especially me. 
Though tobacco-free for years, I think occasional cravings for a pinch of sweet cancer will be with me indefinitely. I'll have to bum some from her. Maybe it won't make my insurance go up again. I was about to ask Smokes which main character from the list we would come across next. Hammer reappeared from somewhere within the store. She was now carrying a much too feminine pink handbag with a large gold ball on the strap. She tossed each of us a small bag of Doritos. Damn! I want me some tacos at midnight! Smoke smiled. While I was fairly certain that flavor no longer existed, I had to agree with Smoke's sense of taste. Those were some pretty good corn chips. Hammer walked with a purpose towards us. She asked excitedly, So, where's the Viva Ancora? Mentally, I rolled my eyes again. Where else could it be? The city dock. By the way she nodded her head, she knew as I did that it would be a few hours' journey. We might not get there before sunset, especially with Smoke's drag assin. Maybe Hamer could promise him another bag of Doritos once we got to the boat. That might get him moving. Writing this entry, I'm fucking sick and we never even consider finding a vehicle. You'd think at least the fat guy would suggest we find a more luxurious mode of transportation. Hell, he was in the middle of picking one out when I met him. What the fuck? We three idiot amigos walked around the maggot-infested corpses in the parking lot, stopping at the curb of the highway. Hammer's flaming red hair was almost painful to look at in the sunlight. It was noticeable by the way she carried herself in a soldier's posture she was experienced with firearms. My father, the prepper survivalist, would have had a few interesting discussions with her on military tactics. So how long was you going to stay in that place? I knew Smokes would begin conversing with the expert. The jabbering would inevitably last throughout most of our trek across the city. He completely disregarded my earlier warnings to remain silent when not within the safety of the building. Hammer was happy to respond to everything he said in a much too loud tone of voice. Stealthy we were not. She responded in an equally loud pitch. I didn't have a reason to leave until you boys showed up and offered me a ride on your boat. I could have lived in there for as long as I needed to. Did we really? I was debating whether it would have been less annoying to be stuck with an entire field trip of elementary school students. It was doubtful any six-year-olds carried assault rifles, though. What the number of motherfuckers get killed by you? Dear God, the heaviest number of our trio was going to ask pointless random questions over our entire trip. She answered his question with two questions. You mean in the service? Directly or indirectly? Hammer didn't seem like the type that would shy away from talking about her kill ratio. Smokes didn't understand what she was asking. He stammered an answer that sounded like a question. Both? The expert let out a long sigh and appeared to be counting. Well? She began as our group stepped out onto the highway to head north. I could only shake my head as these two chatterboxes carried on loud enough to awaken every bloodthirsty monster still on the island. Eight. Mo. Journal Entry Eight. Prophecy from the Book of Smokes. The old friend becomes part of the group of lead protagonists, someone the main character has known for a great number of years. This companion may be a co-worker that was introduced at the beginning of the tale, a former classmate, a distant relative, or any fellow met by chance that hasn't been seen by the hero in considerably long time. Recognition will be mutual and almost instant. Even if they do not share viewpoints or values, the two will find plenty of common ground. Though they may not have formally been close, their camaraderie will be seen as time-tested, and they may appear to be, or even become, better friends than they ever really were. Perhaps the dire circumstances allow them to put aside whatever had kept them apart for so long. Just as my foot touched the center line of the highway, Hammer tensed. She whispered urgently, Five o'clock. She spun on her heel, dropped flat on the pavement, and aimed her rifle in that direction. Smokes and I were not sure what to do, scattering to either side of the road. My friend took position behind a light pole that covered an infinitesimal fraction of his bulk. I took a knee in the deeper, more protective ditch on the opposing side from bottom dollar. We both glanced back and forth from each other to the direction the expert indicated. A single figure was moving in a police car in the causeway barricade to the south. If this lone individual intended to cause harm, I'm pretty sure we were easy to spot. The largest target, Smokes, had not yet been shot. No bullets had been fired. 
We saw no other hostiles. Creeping closer, we made out a man pulling himself through the car. We stopped at the intersection of the four lane and the road that followed the peninsula on the southwest, Highway 79. From this distance, I could easily make out the interloper's features. I instantly went back in my time to my senior year of high school. I could hear the crowd like I was there. Go easy on them, easy. Yay, go Eagles. Engage them, Gage. The cheerleaders continued their customary rah-rahs while the fourth quarter of our homecoming football game went on. Never much of a sportsman, especially when it comes to football. I know that it's a good thing when my team has a greater score than the opposing team, but I have no idea what's happening beyond that. During my senior year, my freshman brother, Ezekiel Easy Collins, became the all-star varsity quarterback. That year, our school saw its first positive football season in almost a decade. Although I had been present at almost every home varsity game, I could not tell you much more than that our football team fucking sucked before that season, making Easy a local hero. I spent the majority of every game with friends, sneaking around the parking lot thinking we were badasses, smoking cheap cigarettes and occasionally coming up with some precious beer. Because this was my senior homecoming, I had taken a break from my normal routine of getting into trouble to sit in the stands and catch most of the end of the game. I supported my class. Of course, Douglas was tied with whoever we were playing. I heard someone say that the Eagles were going for a touchdown. The whistle blew. Guys ran around and into each other. I recognized our running back moving to the end zone. He deftly caught a pass that was thrown to him by my perfect brother. There were only seconds left on the clock. Douglas won the big game. Big fucking surprise. It wasn't difficult to pick out our running back, Bradley Gage. He was 6'4 and lean. His only competition of getting laid by any girl he winked at was my brother. Bradley was in my class. My class was a typical small-town Alabama high school class where everyone knew everything about everyone else. There were not many different cliques. The only thing I knew for a fact about Bradley, other than that he was always had a really hot girlfriend, was that he didn't have a nickname. Where I'm from, most people are either given a nickname or they don't have any friends. I suppose Mo counts as a nickname for Elmo. At least I was likable to a few acquaintances. It was rare that a football player went by only his full first name. Over the years, people tried to give Bradley a nickname, but nothing stuck. Not Mossberg, Buck, or even Brad. Bradley and I had never been close. He was one of the cool kids who wore polo shirts and ripped and faded jeans. Though we saw each other nearly every day at school, occasionally at parties, and were always pleasant to one another, no one would have considered us buddies. After games were over, a lot of the student body would hang out at the football field and congratulate players on a game well played, give words of encouragement after a loss, or having nothing better to do, loiter, as I did. Although I did not give a rat's ass about football, I felt duty-bound to congratulate some of my classmates, this being our final homecoming. Bradley had completed the winning play and I decided to tell him he had made a good catch. It was difficult to see past the countless back slaps and handshakes my brother was receiving from everyone. Finally, I saw the black-bearded visage of my classmate. I shouted to him. Bradley? Yeah, man. He asked out the window of the cop car. My jaw dropped. Here was Bradley Gage. He still had a beard. It was thicker now, but easily recognizable. His twin full-sleeve tribal tattoos, Herculean arms, and braided ponytail were new but this was definitely my graduating classmate, the receiver who had won our senior homecoming. Once he had gained the passenger seat, he stretched through the open window and reached out onto the hood of the squad car to grab and pull onto the ground a wheelchair. This was also new. Originally missed, taking it as part of the barricade, I was confused as the former running back lifted himself from the car and into the wheelchair. Most of my classmates had moved away for work or more exciting surroundings and not remained close after graduation. The last time I saw Bradley was at graduation day and I would have noticed the chair. What happened, man? He obviously misunderstood my question. Hell if I know. Some kind of mutant rabies or something. Climbing out of the ditch, I stood on the bank. Hammer was still crouched and guarded at my side. Smokes was farther back down the highway. He was using a deserted car in the Best Western parking lot as reasonable cover. Walking towards him, Hammer watched our perimeter. Glad to see an old friend, I was about to ask how he had gotten here when a monkey appeared from within the car and perched on his broad shoulder. 
No, I'm not shitting you. A fucking monkey. He saw the question on my face and pointed at his furry little companion. This is Mary. And Mary, this is... He stopped to allow me to finish the introductions. A member of my 120-person graduating class had no idea who I was. I don't think I look a whole hell of a lot different than I did just a few years ago. While I'm not exactly memorable, I again point out that I graduated with 120 people. Come on, Bradley, it's Mo. I tried not to show my exasperation as I nodded when he asked his next question. Collins? He rolled closer to us. As he and Mary neared, it was plain to see that he had made the three of us, armed and armored like crazy militia members, look like kids with Nerf guns. Strapped over each of his muscle-shirted shoulders was a loaded automatic pistol holder. A stagecoach shotgun rested on the outside of both of his calves. The tips of countless long guns pointed over his shoulders. Undoubtedly, the undercarriage of his wheelchair was also packed with firearms. Dude, how the hell are you? What have you been up to? He bellowed. It'd be great to reacquaint myself with my fellow graduate, but there would be plenty of time later for a high school reunion. Trying not to go into too much detail, I responded. I've been around. Got a job about a year ago sailing on a pirate ship. When I tell anyone of my job, the most often asked question I receive is the one I got from Bradley. I've heard of that. Where's your boat? Unsure of Bradley's plans, I intended to be safe on a boat before sunset. My explanation was given in shorter terms than usual to save time. In hindsight, I must have come off as a complete asshole to everyone I've met since the zombie apocalypse began. Every time I made an acquaintance, I've been in a hurry to get back to the Cora. It's easy to see they've all thought of me as less than a desirable dinner date. Not usually this much of a dick, I'm just willing to postpone insignificant conversation until I'm no longer in a life-threatening situation. Scratch that. I'm always a bastard. Why isn't everyone trying to get to safety as soon as possible? It's as if they enjoy standing around waiting to be eaten. Should I still use the word standing now that Bradley's in our party? Now I feel bad for even realizing that. I introduced Bradley to Hammer, looking over my shoulder to see my husky friend doubling over, gasping, but still slowly approaching, I decided to introduce him before he arrived. As to why he had so many guns, Bradley explained he and his father had been in several tactical shooting tournaments. Mary was a Capuchin monkey, a service animal given to him by a charitable organization called Helping Hands. He described this foundation as a non-profit that partners monkeys with disabled people free of charge. It sounded like a worthwhile cause to support, you know, if it wasn't for the death of civilization and everything. Like the monkey from Monkey Shines? That old George Romero movie. I spoke slow, low, and wistful to no one. Smiling, I realized it couldn't just be mere coincidence. The three of us silently agreed to meet our slowly approaching companion halfway, making our way to the unhealthy behemoth. Moving now, I felt more comfortable with taking part in superficial conversation and catching up with Bradley. Unsure if I should offer to push him, my attention disappeared as he more than easily kept pace. Plus, I didn't want to upset the tiny demon on his shoulder, which already had murder in her eyes. So how did you... I wanted to find out when and how he had lost the ability to walk, uncertain how to ask without seeming to be a jackass. It was apparent that he was not too touchy about the subject. He helpfully supplied. How did I get crippled? It was a swimming accident a few months after graduation. That was the end of his story, and I was happy to never broach the subject again. Where are you headed? I asked my old classmate. He replied, Well, I figured I would head north until I found some sort of safe zone with survivors. He left the sentence hanging, but I filled in the blanks. And you are a group of survivors, obviously with some sort of security to keep at bay the infected invaders. You will accept any wanderers without question that wish to join your group. Yesterday, I would have found it laughable that anyone would suggest that I would be decided the fate of others. The wisdom of the prophet Smokes had convinced me of my part in the grand scheme of things. I filled my former classmate in on our living arrangements on the boat. Confidently, I detailed my newly forming plans to turn Guntersville Island into an actual island, with no connection to land whatsoever. Looking at the rapt expressions of my fellows, I noticed they were listening intently. Until this moment, my grand plan had been to have ketchup with my fish and stay put until the Marines landed. There it was. 
a proposal for a real survival project. It just seemed to take shape as I spoke. I guess I was channeling the driving impulses of the hero I was destined to become. As usual, Hammer brought up the rear of our trio, scanning the causeway behind us, leaving Bradley and me to recount our histories after graduation. Bradley's accident had put a wrench in his plans of secondary education. Only in the past few years had he been able to attend college. He had almost earned his degree in gunsmithing, but another wrench got in his way, a PV wrench. The story of my young adulthood was not nearly as interesting as his. Since I have already detailed enough of it in this journal, I'm not going to bore you with it again. My original sidekick was on his hands and knees, vomiting profusely the raw dough he had consumed the night before, giving a new meaning to the phrase, toss your cookies. Did you need more proof he was no marathon champion? Glancing up, he gave an okay hand sign. Jack Sparrow? Smokes glanced in Bradley's direction, asking between gulps of oxygen. Bradley gave no response. The silence gave me enough time to realize that he was referencing Johnny Depp's character from Pirates of the Caribbean had the same kind of monkey as Mary. My classmate did not catch the joke. Uh, no. Bradley was gearing up for introductions, still confused. As he knew only what I had briefly told him of Smokes, I feared that this conversation would be convoluted. Bradley was not accustomed to the humor and racial bashing between Smokes and me. Knowing nothing of our official roles, he would most likely take some casual insults too seriously. Ultimately, I concluded he would become offended and end up disliking Smokes, and possibly me for some reason. Quickly, I began speaking before the former football star could. Bradley, this is Smokes. I told you about him earlier. Then I briefly filled Smokes in on how Bradley and I knew each other. Though it was obvious that he wanted to, Smokes was unable to bring himself to ask how a star running back became a paraplegic. I was staying away from that subject. Not introducing Mary, I was leaving that honor to my former classmate. This would give Smokes something to consider on our homeward approach. Past implying that the man was a pirate, I could only hope he would keep his speculations to himself. Days ago, it was Crow and me, the sum total of our survival camp. Guided by the motivational speeches of my personal seer and through our short travels, I had admittedly become optimistic about meeting others. The clan had already increased by three. I was confident we would soon encounter several of the other important characters I had been made aware were queued for entrances. There would eventually be enough individuals to populate our future stronghold. I'm going to tattoo the inside of my fucking eyelids, so that next time I go out, I will remember to get a damn car and stop all this walking shit. You'd think that one of the geniuses in our quartet, which featured a veteran senior citizen, a dude in a wheelchair, a guy that probably has a couple of heart attacks every year, and a man too lazy to fish, would have complained about our idea of a day trip. Without question, we started walking. It occurred to me once again that not all of our delegation was actually walking, making me feel more assholish than normal. As we passed gas stations, the Waffle House, Sonic, and the First Bank of Guntersville, Hammer and I must have had some sort of psychic connection. On the same wavelength, we silently gestured at different items that would be worth salvaging later while our extremely talkative companions spoke to each other with no attention to volume. Apparently, our party failed to realize the enemy was sensitive to sound, as Smokes repeated the character listing, their respective roles and likely lifespans for the benefit of Bradley who seemed interested and even had a few details to add that put Mary in the picture. But for God's sake, they could have been heard by any conscious being on the island. I swelled with pride as the nutty professor glanced at me when speaking of the hero. Hammer probably grinned when he told her she was the expert. He then named Bradley as the old friend. Though I was not going to openly question his prophetical wisdom, I would have to later speak to him about that title. While I had mentioned earlier that my classmate and I had never been anything but cordial to one another, we had not been true friends. Like most high school classmates that meet years after graduation, it probably did seem that we had been closer during school and that we had at one time hung out. In fact, with a school that size, I'm sure we did. Still, it made me wonder whether Bradley had been properly cast. After all, we had yet to meet any of our minor characters and certainly one of my old crushes popping up would have made my existence more interesting. During one of the brief pauses when Smokes quit talking, 
I heard Bradley tell him excitedly that he had freewheeled down the mountain in his wheelchair yesterday. It was fucking awesome. The old friend said he stayed in the pet store at the foot of the mountain until morning before meeting up with us. I realized after his mentioning his ride, that must have been the loud exclamation we heard yesterday evening. Bradley spoke of staying in the pet store overnight. He was keeping a list of supplies that Mary could use. We had made reasonably good time. So far, there'd been no real distractions for most of the journey, unless you count Smokes asking an insane number of questions about Mary and getting formally acquainted with her. The salvageable resources Hammer and I mentally marked were stacking up. If we could snag them, they would keep our crew relatively comfortable for an indefinite period. As I worked things over privately, reveling in one of the rare moments of silence smokes aloud, I gave a start of surprise as a hand touched my shoulder. I realized my big black friend had made his way to my side as we moved. The expert wasn't really paying attention to any of us, constantly scanning the perimeter for ruskies and tangos. The old friend was busy speaking sweetly to Mary as if they were intimate. Relatively alone while still in our group, Smokes leaned into my ear. The fucking monkey, he said conspiratorially. She the innocent, cuz. Not denying I'm a giant pussy, I'll say the hand landing on my shoulder wasn't the reason I startled. Coming to the same conclusion at almost the exact instant Smokes told me Mary played that role, I had chills. After some brief contemplation, I further reasoned that not only did Mary represent the cute pet that almost always plays the innocent, America's known patient Zero was a primate, meaning of all animals she was the one type at risk of being infected. Could that mean she might also become the sacrifice? That is unthinkably horrible. For whatever reason, it seems so much harder when animals are victims of evil. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I feel most people kind of brought it on themselves, you know? Considering myself a dog person, I'd rather kill you than see my dog hurt. Now imagine how that would be compounded when it's nearly human companion that is helping take care of you. Fuck. Poor Bradley. Not normally so lost in my thoughts, I finally regained awareness of my surroundings about the time the company was crossing an intersection on Gunter. It bothered me that I had basically blacked out for something like a half a mile. Anyway, I abruptly came back to Earth at the appropriate time. Shortly after, Hammer raised a fist indicating stop, as we all heard the apparent turning over of a metal trash can. 9. Mo, Journal Entry 9 Prophecy from the Book of Smokes The tech will always be some sort of mechanic, engineer, or general handyman. Except in very modern scripts, they may be a computer whiz. This important character will be able to solve impossible problems, use completely self-invented tools, and build things all other characters cannot logically imagine. The tech will always be supremely knowledgeable about their field of expertise, as well as have a broad general knowledge of many others, allowing the character to deal effectively with obstacles so the plot can move forward. A real know-it-all. If this happened yesterday, I guarantee you my ass would have been cowering on the boat by the time the noise disappeared. But yesterday was a long time ago. In less than 24 hours, I have come to understand that I am living out a movie script. It's too early in the plot or the day to be confronted by the villain or the main antagonists, the zombies. We don't have enough characters yet to battle them effectively, so it just made sense that the noisemaker would have to be a friendly, not an enemy. Smokes was a sanctified believer in his own gospel, merely looking toward the sound expectantly. Hammer crouched, moving to the tree line across the street, her rifle already raised and pointed in the direction of the sound. Bradley threw his chair into reverse and readied one of his shotguns. Smokes and I remained unmoving in the middle of the road without preparing any defense whatsoever. We glanced to one another and silently agreed that this was not an attack. It didn't fit the plot line. I smiled, expecting another useful companion to emerge from the shop across from us, Excelsior Comics. My smile vanished when a blue, filthy, yellow-eyed, and nearly naked teenage boy came into view and began pounding on the large display window. Shocked back into reality, I ready to raise my rifle. Smoke spoke in a low tone. Fucking patience, grasshopper. Before I could bring my weapon fully to bear, a blur of motion came from around the corner. 
an indescribable wave of noise sounded. All movement ceased. It took a moment for me to believe my own eyes. The peavy was now dying and tacked to the brick facade by its neck with a pitchfork. After a few halting blinks, I realized it was not a pitchfork, but something all too familiar. The mighty claws of Wolverine. Before I go any further, I have a fairly well-kept secret to confess. I am a closet nerd, a secret geek. Honestly, I can't speak Klingon, I don't often masturbate to pictures of Princess Leia in her slave girl getup, and I've never played D&D. I do enjoy reading fantasy and admit that I follow Star Wars and Star Trek, up until Enterprise. Movies, though, that's always been my downfall. Remember that show Beat the Geeks? It was a sort of jeopardy for, yeah, you guessed it. I could hold my own against them, especially the movie geek. Also, call me a music enthusiast. In fact, I take pleasure in lots of media, but I have actually been called in the middle of the night by intoxicated friends to settle debates on movie trivia. My near-photographic memory of dialogue could be used to count cards in Vegas, or at least should have made me an honor student. Alas, I'm the go-to guy for pointless shit. On our initial meeting, I caught Smoke's Pulp Fiction reference. Possibly I'm the only person he knows that appreciates as many movie quotes. Wolverine pivoted the corner. His claw still lodged through the neck of his victim and into the brick. Once he was fully revealed, it became obvious that that figure was not actually Wolverine, but a conglomeration of several sci-fi characters. In this montage of everything nerd, I immediately recognized, in addition to the Wolverine claws and their iconic slitted gloves, a Starfleet captain's uniform tunic, a red cape that once belonged to Superman, and for some strange reason, a gas mask. Topping it all off was a gray Mass Effect N7 baseball cap perched precariously on his head. This sent my inner geek into an envious tailspin that was screaming, Oh my god! As the figure turned to face the two stupefied idiots standing in the intersection, he said something muffled by his gas mask. Of course, the words became crystal clear to me when he raised his hand and spread his fingers in a Vulcan greeting. Absent-mindedly, I lifted a hand to respond in kind. Dropping it quickly to my side, I looked askew at Smokes, who didn't seem to notice. Looks like I dodged a bullet. Before the amazing freak reached up to loosen his mask, I noticed that his eyes appeared Asian. There weren't too many Asian people living in Marshall County. The only Asians I knew personally growing up were the Korean lady my dad's first cousin was married to, their kids, a few Filipino doctors, and a Japanese tattoo artist. I didn't think any of them were this skinny nor flaming sci-fi enthusiasts. Upon revealing himself, it was clear that he was not Asian. He was just a plain old white dude with thick rimmed glasses and a Spock haircut. Retracting his claws before speaking, he kicked the twitching body on the ground beside him. Relaxing, he slowly moved in our direction. This guy wasn't an idiot. He knew that we, just as we knew that he, were not infected. But he could also see that we were armed. It was strange he was willing to walk up to us without even knowing our intentions. I mean, for sure this guy had seen Mad Max, and therefore was aware of how dangerous post-apocalyptic humans can be. For all this geek knew, we could have been those hostile sadist survivor types, minus the hockey pads. Now that I think about it, he could have been planning to murder all of us, and was currently making the first move. But I was so fascinated, I just stood there like a deer in headlights. I think now that he must have noticed our harmless demeanor and hoped for fellowship, especially since I had attempted to throw him a secret greeting, as it were. Regardless, he was taking a leap of faith by approaching us. I was too stunned to think of any non-Trekkie grating. As he walked across the street, I just asked the only thing I could. Were you chasing that thing? This seemed like a reasonable question. It looked like the damn zombie was running away from him. I envisioned a zombie hunter. Something like that. That was my first successful test subject. It seems I've created a working attractant composed of tomato paste, molasses, vinegar. Are you shitting me? It was astonishingly unbelievable that any thinking person would want to attract fucking zombies. Professor Van Helsing, vampire hunter over here, was baiting them. He continued the list of ingredients as he came towards us, but the first three had already caught my attention. My 12th grade chemistry teacher was a basketball coach who liked to show his students how to make manly shit in the chemistry lab. He once showed us how to use chemicals to make vinegar. Then we combined that with molasses, tomato paste, and several other ingredients to create a decent barbecue sauce. That was one of the few classes from which I still retain any learning. 
Everyone used to joke that Coach Shields would have been just as good as a home ec teacher. Super Geek finished revealing his secret formula and paused. I tried to shake away my dumbfounded expression. Why did he deliberately concoct the reverse of zombie repellent? I said the first thing that came to mind. Barbecue sauce? He brought his attention back to us and sheepishly nodded. KC Masterpiece seems to work best. I understood. Of course zombies enjoy the high-quality ambrosia that is KC. He was almost upon us now. Holding his mask in his gloved hand, I could make out his features. The Coke bottle glasses and haircut gave him a retro 1960s vibe. The scrawniness and nasal voice reminded me of a white Steve Urkel. His completely smooth face convinced me that he was probably young. Okay, I'm not Grizzly Adams, but within a week of shaving, I believe I have somewhat noticeable facial hair from certain angles and in certain light. My mother's family swears to have American Indian ancestry, so I use that as a reason for growing little more than a thin goatee and a few patches on my jawline. I normally keep those trimmed. Smokes mentioned something about grooming, especially shaving being a huge morale boost for male survivors in almost every zombie story. Something so trivial won't matter to me in the days ahead. It takes weeks for me to grow a decent five o'clock shadow, and anyway, I don't think having unkempt facial hair is going to turn me into a bitch. In high school, my friends all had full beards while I looked like a smooth-faced 12-year-old. Although having a beard does not make a person a badass, it seemed important as a teenager. In any case, I don't see why I should give a shit about my outward appearance. I'm alive, and that's all that matters. There is no one important enough for me to impress anyway, so I'm not going to be vain, and I don't have to prove my masculinity. At least in my mind, there is a huge difference between vanity and superficiality. I don't believe I'm overtly caught up in my own looks, or in the opinions of others regarding my looks. However, I do freely admit to being superficial as hell and extremely judgmental of the appearance of all women. I decided to be polite to the guy with warm, infected blood dripping from his retracted steel claws. Awesome get him, man. I'm Mo. His mismatch of costumes was kick-ass. Stanley. Gene Stanley. Did I detect an attempt at a British accent? Before he could continue, Hammer spoke from her position a few yards back. Eugene? That's my daddy's name. I was fairly certain who her father was now. I'll have to remember to ask her if he's the World War II memoir author of With the Old Braid. Unlikely, but that would be pretty cool. That lady with the AR is Hammer, and this is Smokes. I gestured to my closest companion and then introduced Bradley and Mary. Jane gave an equally nerdy greeting to each and stopped at a casual arm's length away. He reached up to adjust his Mass Effect cap. So, do you bear the ring? What? This was a strange question. I assume your fellowship is traveling to Mordor to destroy the One Ring. He grinned. Holy shit. This guy is a white nerd version of Smokes. He could definitely go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me on the cultural reference field. I'm just grateful that he did not refer to Smokes as the Fat Hobbit. Yeah, our quest isn't quite that crucial. I said. We're heading to the Viva Ancora. He cut me off. It pisses me off that everyone is constantly interrupting me. I know I talk slow, but damn, have patience. The Viva Ancora? You mean the pirate ship? Frackin' sweet. I go there every time the boat's in town. I'm a sucker for replicas. If any of the crew's still alive, it would be stellar if I could get a tour. This was fucking ridiculous. Jane was obviously fully aware that humans are an endangered species, yet he, just as Hammer was so fascinated by a fucking wooden sailboat, he was more interested in checking it out than simply reaching safety. Certainly I'm going to be the cautious one in the group. That worries me. Unsure if I contained the sigh, I hurriedly explained my relationship to the Korra to the exuberant fist pump of the Starfleet officer. Our group stood in the middle of the street, welcoming its newest member. Apparently the only requirement for joining our band of brothers was to ask for a damn tour. There was no need to ask Gene if he wanted to join our crew. He had already been cast as a friendly before we met. It was impossible to do anything other than automatically accept him. As we continued our journey homeward, Gene detailed his daily life since the plague had struck Guntersville. I own and manage Excelsior Comics. I was rearranging some collector's edition Transformers trading cards when all southbound traffic came to a stop. 
Cop cars started speeding north of Gunter with lights flashing, and after a few minutes, civilian vehicles started pouring through, going the wrong direction. I had been watching the news about the terrorist's biological weapon, and a few of my friends on Xbox Live had heard rumors that it was spreading north at an alarming rate. I was just thinking about that when the first infected man I had personally seen ran past the store. I didn't dare go to the window, so I have no idea where he was headed. It was clear that he'd been infected because not only was he shirtless and running full tilt down the middle of the street, he was a shade too blue, had blood all over his face and a large bite ripped across his tricep. After I was sure that the creature had not turned back around, I walked to the front door and locked it. I barred all the exits and made my way to the back room to play Xbox. I never noticed the power go off because the shop is 100% solar. Unfortunately, my internet connection was lost less than six hours after that first zombie sighting. He stopped to collect his thoughts, then continued. After about 20 hours of playing games solo, I decided to go have a look around. The whole town was deserted. It was like being on a planet that had been wiped out by some alien energy bomb. Or, you know, like the population had been assimilated by the Borg. This guy must really miss his television. I decided now was the best opportunity I was going to get to live out one of my scenarios my friends and I played at with metal pieces and graphics. So I geared up and went hunting. I discovered the Blues love a sweet sauce and started leaving it around, like drawing an E.T. into my house with Reese's Pieces. Smoke's interest was piqued. You got any more damn pieces? He asked. No, Gene said. I mean, there might be some back at the shop. I used an old bottle of KC Masterpiece left over from an all-night magic tournament we had a few weeks back. While Gene told his tale, I made a mental list of questions to ask at the end. The first thing I wanted to know was why the hell he was wearing pieces of random fantasy costumes. He explained like it should have been obvious. The Wolverine claws were part of the display in the store advertising the upcoming Marvel Con in Atlanta. They are surprisingly sharp, probably the best weapon in the whole shop. He looked at the gloves, still dripping with blood like they were the Holy Grail. The Superman cape, he continued, was part of the costume I wore at the most recent Comic-Con. It's made of pretty thick material that protects from attacks from behind. This guy in Japan custom makes them. I don't really remember why I had the gas mask. I think some dude traded it for some Warcraft figures. Anyway, it looks cool and it protects me from getting any infected blood in my face. He smiled and waved the mask around. Clearly this all made sense. Seeing I was waiting for him to explain the rest, he continued. I was already wearing the N7 hat, and the captain's tunic was the only long sleeve shirt I could find. Probably should have worn a t-shirt over it. It's a pretty expensive item. I don't know if you notice what's below my belt. Jane looked down admiringly at his wiry legs. I followed his eyes to notice he was wearing durable leather pants. Ghost Rider pants, a replica from the 2007 Marvel film. The boots help prevent bites down there. As a finishing touch, he plucked his belt. Complete with stainless steel chain belt. The kid was pretty smart. He was dressed for success. The leather pants were a little creepy. At least he was no poser. I wondered about his lair. So what kind of food do you keep in the comic shop? Jane was more than happy to answer. I've got enough cold red and pizza rolls to last for weeks. I grinned. Did he plan to hunt 24 hours straight and use explosive diarrhea as a weapon? It was impressive. Jane deserved props for surviving for being calm and well-dressed during the zombie apocalypse, for taking the fight to the enemy, and especially for being a badass and slaughtering zombies with his bare fucking hands. He looked over our collection of firearms, pointing at the shotgun cradled by my sidekick. That aqua bus seems pretty powerful. Smokes raised an eyebrow. Aqua? Motherfucker, this ain't no Mexican water gun. This here a masterpiece of iron and wood. He was busy gesturing to the features of the rifle like one of the chicks on The Price is Right. I wanted so badly to interject that there was no iron or wood in his tactical 12-gauge, but the fact that he was full of shit didn't affect me. I wouldn't get anything by winning the argument, and if Jane believed him, that was his problem. Smokes continued his description, pulling some random caliber number out of his ass. I hoped the new guy saw through him pretty quick and with good humor. Otherwise... I might have to clean up the deck of the Korra after the Luke Skywalker vs. the Blob celebrity deathmatch. Still under time constraints, I wanted to get a move on. Awkwardly, I was unsure of how to invite this amalgamated nerd along. I should have realized that a formal invitation wasn't necessary. Jane simply became one of our party members. 
No one felt the need to question it. Our clan tags were simply added to his screen name and he fell into rank with the group. As Smokes had prophesied, we had our tech. As our delegation journeyed ever closer to the Korra, our fellowship was automatically increasing. We moved along as one force, Smokes and I a few paces in front, while the newest member of the sextet acquainted himself with the other two survivors. Well, three, including Mary. Jane spoke in an intelligent manner and told of the college degree he was in the process of earning at the Robotics Institute at Athens. He understood the old world was gone, and had come to grips with the fact that he could not attain the legal title of doctor. He felt he'd already garnered the rank anyway. He freely offered his mechanical expertise to our clan. The others were deep in conversation about reloading ammunition, but would occasionally say, great, or cool, or thanks, man. Smokes leaned in conspiratorially. Told you, brah, all is going exactly according to plan. I'm guessing Jane is the tech. Smokes put his arm around my shoulder and smiled maniacally. Shit yeah, cuz. The minor characteristic sword wielder for sure. Ten. Mo. Journal Entry Ten. After several minutes of hollering up at the deck, Crow finally peeked over the side of the boat. While she seemed completely unexcited and indifferent that I had survived, she couldn't hide the look of surprise on her face as she took in my new companions. Nevertheless, she could not be bothered to lower the damn gangplank. Her welcome home present to me was to throw a climbing rope over the side of the fucking boat. We almost lost Smokes a couple times on his treacherous climb up, but I was not expecting the lifting of Bradley's chair to be such a bitch. The old friend himself posed no difficulty. In fact, it was just the opposite. Hammer nearly fainted when Bradley pointed up in our direction and said something inaudible to Mary. She immediately jumped from his shoulder to the rope ladder and began vaulting up. He then threw himself from the chair, lashed onto the rope and scaled it with only his hands, ascending the rope like Andre the Giant climbing the cliffs of insanity holding the prince's bride. I will admit that I was not prepared for him to do something so superhumanly badass. Still in all, the expert and I lowered a couple ropes to lasso and pull up a wheelchair that weighed just as much as smokes. It might have had something to do with the dozens of weapons and the thousands of rounds of ammunition attached to it. I had never really thought about the reasons why this ship never had any handicapped tourists. If I were Bradley, I'd call an ACLU lawyer. Crow casually walked over and lowered the plank for hammer. Why didn't I drop the gangplank rather than lift the damn chair with ropes? Same reason we walked home through streets lined with vehicles, I guess. Well, hindsight is twenty twenty. Once we were all finally on deck, I volunteered a recap of my almost two-day quest. There was no way Crow was going to ask. She just stood there looking at me like she hadn't noticed I'd been gone. I didn't know if I was expecting her to be happy to see me, give me a hug, or even shake my hand. Well, I broke the uncomfortable pause. We got the ketchup. Crow simply nodded in acknowledgement. We also picked up a few stragglers along the way. I spread my hands in the direction of my traveling companions. Not really knowing if I should have asked for approval, maybe I should have given prior warning for letting them stay with us. I began by introducing each with a short bio. This is Hammer. She runs a pawn shop across from the Magnolia. I then pointed to the next character in line. Gene owns a comic book store in town, and this is Bradley Gage. We went to high school together. His little friend here is Mary. I think Crow actually cracked a slight grin at the monkey. Could have just been hopeful thinking on my part. Most of the day's discussion regarding our previous lives hadn't produced many crucial details that she might desperately need to know. Anything she was curious about, she could ask for herself, and they would be welcome to fill her in later. I could tell by the murderous fire in his eyes Smokes was upset I did not formally introduce him for a second time. Maybe that will compel him to actually speak to her. In any case, I refuse to become some kind of matchmaker. She nodded her head in grating to each. I was initially shocked when she verbally welcomed the only other surviving female, though after some contemplation, I guess this really was not too out of character. My jaw almost dropped when the expert shyly blushed and replied, Hey. I addressed the entire assembly. This is Crow. She's a ship's cook and the only other surviving crew member. Honestly, I didn't know what else to say about her. I didn't know a hell of a lot more than that, despite the fact that we'd been shipmates and basically were now cohabiting. 
We moved over to the umbrella table that Crow and I had conveniently borrowed from a neighboring yacht a few days before. It was accompanied by six chairs. Thankfully, our seventh comrade had brought his own. Crow asked Hammer if she was hungry. Jean obviously thought she was addressing the group as a whole. I'm famished, he said. Fortunately, only I noticed the evil eyes she threw back at him. The cook spent most of her waking hours fishing. It was almost certain that we had more than enough to feed a few extras. I explained to our guests that I would go down and help Crow round up the food. On our way downstairs, I had to shake my head to make sure I had not somehow confused Fat Albert for Pocahontas. She said something that hailed an uncanny resemblance to the words of my overweight friend. That bitch is fine. Superhero boy ain't hitting that shit, is he? What the fucking? To this point, Crow had never formally admitted her sexuality to me. Not like it ever came up. It was certainly none of my business anyway. I merely assumed by her demeanor among the crew that she was a penis hater. Why would she think Jean was romantically partnered with the expert? Hammer could have possibly been Smoke's old lady, or even Bradley's mom. It was just strange and somewhat bigoted that she automatically assumed the two whites with working legs were obviously coupled. Although, to be fair, Jean was the cuter of the three. The silence seemed to stretch as I had to think through the possible answers to avoid blowback. I was instinctively sure Jean was not hitting anything beside his worn fleshlight named Rhonda. I had literally no idea of Hammer's sexual orientation and wasn't going to ask. Even if the expert did swing in that direction, I wasn't versed in the courtship rituals and guidelines of a homosexual relationship. Most straight people tend to look for a significant other that was born within the same decade. Let me go out on a limb and say that Hammer does enjoy eating pie. She still might be a conservative traditionalist who was only interested in other middle-aged ladies. I could accept, overlooking the eye patch, that the redhead would have been a handsome lady in her time. I just found it a bit strange that anyone could find someone of their parents' generation fine. I hesitantly answered with a non-committal shrug. I was hoping Crow could take the hint that what I really meant was, I don't know, I don't care, I don't want to discuss this, and that's all I have to say on the matter. Thankfully, she let the subject rest and we retrieved a couple of pans of grilled fish without another word. Smokes is going to be pissed to know that he assuredly has no chance. Before we exited the galley, I made sure to grab a stack of solo cups and a gallon of water. Before I continue, I need to get something off my chest. The color of the plastic cup you are drinking out of has no correlation with the beverage inside. I've drunk water, sweet tea, hunch punch, and Dr. Pepper all out of red solo cups, and no one with an ounce of brain matter has wondered if I was drinking beer. I don't even like beer. I drink liquor and get drunk much easier than you retards playing beer pong. Stop playing that stupid country song, Red Solo Cup, on repeat at every single party where alcohol is served. I really have no idea why solo cups are commonly red but it is not some sort of secret code or status symbol for beer drinkers, and Toby Keith did not invent the disposable beverage container. The more toasted you morons get, the better you think your singing voice is. Wrong. One good thing about the zombie apocalypse is that I will never have to endure another slurred group rendition of the worst party song since Louie Louie. We reemerged on deck to the sounds of a screaming argument that seemed about to come to blows. Unsurprisingly, Smokes was the loudest of the group. Hammer was the quiet but interested spectator. Gene was using some sort of Jedi calming technique to restrain himself from force-choking Smokes. And Bradley seemed humored while stroking Mary, barely keeping her from throwing herself on to and gumming Smokes to death. After all, I was the captain. When I came within reasonable distance, I felt the need to be the peacekeeper. I asked, What's the deal, guys? Gene hoped I would take his side. He took a step in my direction. Still facing smokes, he feared to turn his back on him. Dawn of the Dead! Yeah, that explained everything. Every American had seen that badass zombie film and probably its reboot, too. I was unable to see what could have caused such a violent altercation. Now I suddenly felt personally invested in the argument. What about it? If one of them disliked Dawn, I would have to make him leave the boat. The hater wasn't smokes. The dude had probably studied this screenplay like the Bible. They fight with me cause Ving Rhames black. Of course, the film guru had explained to each new comrade his naming of main characters and description of coming events. 
he had described the roles that each of them were destined to play. Apparently, this was the first Gene had heard of Smoke's theories. It wasn't going well. They had been sitting down waiting for a meal. Smokes was obviously referring to the fact that the lead protagonist was usually a Caucasian. The tech must have questioned his wisdom by mentioning that the main character in one of the archetypal films, Dawn of the Dead, is black. Honestly, I had not taken the time to think about it. Well, Ving Rhames is black. Motherfucker, this guy got to be Ving Rhames. It okay, sides Kenneth Hall a popo, so that don't count as black. This was probably the most reverse racist thing I'd ever heard. About to respond, I decided staying on point would be more effective with these two. I took a quick mental overview with the plot for the production we were discussing. And what about the betrayer? You said that role would be played by a later appearance and was always a white person. I left this open for one of the others to pick it up. The light bulb snapped on over Bradley's head. He pointed at Smokes. The betrayer in Dawn of the Dead was the other black dude with a Mexican girlfriend. Smokes was the reddest black person I ever saw. Narrowing his eyes and aiming his fury at my former classmate, he bellowed. Listen, you crippled up some bitch. I'm gonna throw you over the side and call you Bob. Bradley was genuinely offended. He gave the seven-pound foaming at the mouth monster on his knee a few more inches of slack in the direction of her target. I can still use my arms, you fat fuck. Smoke appeared to temporarily deflate. Glancing nervously at the demon straining at her leash, he tried to extricate himself with his dignity intact. Yeah, well, not if days broke. It was fun picturing a brawl between this monument to junk food and a paraplegic bodybuilder with a creature that could only be more terrifying if she had a pair of symbols in her tiny hands. I was seriously tempted to back away and tell them to have at it. Crow spoke up in defense of Smokes. Okay, calm down. He ain't no traitor. She aimed her chin in the direction of my sidekick and then caught his eye. Now you, apologize. Seeing the gentle giant angry to the point of nearly having a stroke was just as funny as seeing Crow turn into a scolding mother, even if she was only showing off her hammer. Smokes dropped his head and scuffed his tennis shoe against the deck as a child who can find no other way out of trouble. I sorry I call you cripple. Both Bradley and his scary little companion eased. It's okay, man. I wasn't calling you the betrayer anyway. I was just making the point that we can't go by color. It was disappointing. After all the raging emotions, the only wounds on either combatant throughout the conflict were against male sense of pride. The tension immediately dissipated as we all prepared to feast. It was amazing how quickly the two went from being at each other's throats to being relaxed comrades. They were now making jokes and completely forgetting the fact that they had been ready to murder one another. Were they ever really angry? Maybe it was all part of the script. So what is on the agenda for tomorrow? Smokes fell back into the routine of speaking proper English, as if he were some sort of strategist working on plans for the war effort. Hammer was the first to make a suggestion. We need to go up to Walmart. She paused and jammed her thumb over her shoulder and up, indicating that the city Walmart was a few miles up on Sand Mountain, on the outskirts of the city limits. And Lowe's is only a quarter mile farther down the road. We should see if there's anything worth getting there, too. Walmart would be a prime target for the survivors of any sort of apocalypse to raid. A group could live for years off the supplies gathered from that cornucopia of everything. Not only were there guns, but non-perishables, clothing, tobacco, hygienic supplies, medicine. Well, most likely you've been there. Plus, they have really low prices. The help for hardware place would also be one of the first locations looted by any party. It would probably still hold everything we would need to secure the entrances to the island and then some. We were good to go as long as not one single other individual survived and both superstores were pristine and completely untouched, or at least unlived in. I would have bet you money if both hadn't been burned to the ground by now. They're occupied by bands of malicious hillbillies who would rather murder and rape anyone they come across than turn over one box of ho-hos or a sheet of plywood. We've all seen those movies or read those books. The unfit and uneducated yokels who miraculously survive and are somehow able to control large swaths of territory unchallenged while sexually molesting anything with at least two holes always end up setting up camp in the Walmart. I guess they feel right at home there. I was about to say something on this when Jane broke in. We really need to go over to my place. It's just on the other side of the Arab Causeway. 
I have some tools and supplies that would be really useful. There was no urgent need to retrieve every season of Battlestar Galactica on DVD. While I'm sure the tech had the stuff to build an R2-D2, I felt it would be more important to load up on cans of beans. Maybe he has some Legos. We could build a tiny castle. Smokes looked around the table with a knowing grin as if he carried the deciding vote, just waiting for more input. I added, We need to hit the grocery stores first. I turned to Jane. Sorry, man. We can get your stuff later. Though he seemed disappointed, I was sincere about helping him out. He seemed hopeful that we would make a run on his abode soon. The prophet nodded in approval as the others agreed with the decision. As our plan to take a trip to the top of the mountain was finalized, the experts set up party member armaments. She discussed the degrees of damage done by various calibers of ammunition with the tech in her new Native American shadow. Then the group faced it. They watched in amazement that Smokes clearly must have been vying for some type of Guinness World Record for the most fish consumed in one sitting. He devoured his weight and it drowned in his beloved ketchup. No one moved from the table, but the split of two different conversations was obvious and I turned to encompass the prophet and the old friend in my vision. Smokes and Crow already have bunks. I was going to talk to every new crew member as soon as possible to decide sleeping arrangements. I didn't want to hear bitching during the middle of the night because someone didn't like their bunkmate. I was about to continue. Smokes chimed in. So you want top bunk scats? It was horrifying that he could actually ask the handicapped guy a question like that. His mischievous smile made me realize he was being sarcastic. Maybe I needed to let them work out their relationship on their own. Bradley was apparently good-humored about things like this. He grinned back at him. I know you like being on bottom, so yeah, I'll take the top. Besides, I am a bedwetter. Even though they had just met today, these two were shooting the shit like longtime friends. Though I had yet to attend one of my high school class reunions, I pictured that the atmosphere must feel like this. I don't know why I found their exchange so funny, but after an excessive bout of laughter, I wiped a tear from my eye. Stopping cold just about to offer to give Bradley a brief tour, I had not even thought about him being unable to go downstairs. Holy shit, such a small detail was sickening. How the hell would a paralyzed person have been able to travel 500 years ago? Bradley could see I was struggling. He understood my dilemma. It's cool, bro. I know I can't go downstairs. It ain't gonna rain. I can just sleep out here. Mary loves to catch bugs. The monkey coincidentally chose that moment to leap into the air, successfully snagging some sort of flying insect and consuming it in one bite. Smokes congratulated Mary while I shrugged my shoulders. There was no way I could make the ship ADA compliant. I'd try to pick up a tent or some type of shelter on our trip to town tomorrow. Maybe the weather would be fair tonight. It wouldn't stay that way forever. Things seemed to be happening in sequence. Though I've always debated whether or not to believe in luck or just coincidence, Smokes really had me wondering about fate, predestination. His earlier words seemed to ring true. You was always at the place you was always supposed to be. Yeah, that is fucking creepy. I can't recall if that's a paraphrasing from the Bible or a rock song, but it's almost familiar. It's actually become in fact. Is this Smokes' plan? The director's plan? God's plan? Maybe I will survive through enough seasons or sequels to know the answer. Either way, I can no longer see any event as mere chance. Smoke's role was neither the token nor anyone's sidekick. In that moment, I cast him as the Oracle. 11. Mo. Journal Entry 11. We laid out the plans to make our scavenging run on Wally. The company made its way below deck to bed. I still felt horrible about leaving Bradley to sleep outside, so I brought him a blanket. Even though it was hot as hell, he assured me that it was okay. By the way, Wally is Hammer's name for Walmart. It let me know without a doubt that she was at least the same age as my mother, the only other person I've ever heard say that. Who the hell says that? Especially in sober adult company. That is something I would expect to read in a text message from a 13-year-old girl or hear from a redneck survivalist. Oh, wait. Never mind. Again, Smokes pleaded to sleep in my quarters. Other than that heated argument, it was fairly easy to settle the rest of the sleeping arrangements. I was finally able to get to my quarters and write up this journal entry. 
I'm not sure what time it was when I started or when I'll finish, but I'm sincerely glad I do not write as slow as I talk. Throughout my life, I've been accused of having an extremely heavy southern accent, even by my peers. I make no attempts to deliberately sound like a backwoods yokel, and my hickish speech patterns obviously do not determine my IQ any more than Smokes' dialect determines his. I may sound like a toothless inbred, but I've never had any cavities and wouldn't have sex with my sister even if I had one. Probably. When I woke this morning, I felt refreshed and ready for a quest. I stuck my head in and noticed that the crew quarters were awake. Crow had already gone to the galley to prepare some fish for breakfast. As the rest of us walked up the stairs to the temporary open-air quarters of the sixth crewmate, I promised them all we would scavenge enough that none of us would ever be forced to eat fish for breakfast again. Crow can make some tolerable fish, don't get me wrong. I just don't think I can bring myself to eat it for every meal for the rest of my life, with or without condiments. Hammer made those stupid baby noises adults make in an attempt to communicate with infants and animals, which we all found annoying. As we approached the table, Mary was drinking out of a water bottle before returning it to her master. Oh, it's somebody thirsty. That's a big old sip. Goo goo ga ga and all that shit no one wants to hear. Bradley must be used to people talking to Mary as if she were a toddler with a learning disability, because he just smiled and basically ignored the incessant gibbering. I think we'd find a truck before we head out. The old friend went straight to business and skipped the usual small talk. I was beginning to think we were in the graphic novel The Beyonders, or Lord of the Fucking Rings. The entire party was seemingly content to walk cross-country for the rest of our lives. It took a guy in a wheelchair to remind us that Henry Ford gave us an easy way to get from here to there without spending days traversing less than a handful of miles. A weight seemed to physically lift from the shoulders of each delegate. The realization that almost every automobile was now available hit us like a blast of refreshing water. We all readily agreed. Hammer volunteered to search for a worthy automobile. Immediately, she began scaling the rope ladder. The task wouldn't be difficult, but it was easy to guess that the job would be taken by the only other healthy individual above deck. The new tribe members had been listing the smoke stories about how I was the lead protagonist. Though I felt kind of weird when he called me the hero, it was growing on me. Anyway, they all seemed to accept my role. I became the boss, or at least some sort of star character that did not lower himself to do menial tasks. In no way do I think I'm better than anyone, but I can blame Smokes for raising me onto a pedestal. The captain of a pirate ship. I am the first survivor he met. Our only other choices for vehicle recon were a man who gets winded after merely walking a few steps, an asthmatic who lives in a fantasy world and keeps a bottle of SPF 50 in his pocket at all times, the arrogantly uninvolved Apache, and Ironsides. Just so it did not appear that I was being lazy, the best excuse I could give Hammer before she disappeared over the side came. I'd go with you, but I stubbed my toe this morning. I'm fairly certain no one was convinced. Can we go to my house tomorrow? I've never been the leader of anything, so it took me a minute to realize Gene was asking me. By the time I looked at him, he'd reminded me. I've got a few things that could be useful. I knew that his DeLorean and Starfleet communicator badges were precious to him, but I still wasn't convinced that this should be a priority. We should be able to, if everything goes right today. Since this infection started, I'm always on edge waiting for the next fucking shoe to drop. Before I could continue, Smoke spoke too loudly to Bradley. He was one of four people sitting quietly on the deck of a docked boat in Dead City. You call the zombies undead or living dead? I'm not sure why, but Smoke seemed to be baiting Bradley again, testing his knowledge. Despite the fact that the Peavies were technically not zombies, I wasn't going to argue for either side of this debate. Putting a brotherly hand on Jean's shoulder, we all walked over to lower the gangplank. Jane spoke low to me in a conspiratorial tone, as the argument behind us quickly escalated until both men were screaming. Mary began her hissing, and I wondered if these hot debates were going to be an everyday occurrence. I faced Jean, turning my back on the others. He said, I have some solar panels at my house that I believe I can use to convert the ship from propane power to solar. I had thought about that. Propane would never be expensive, and I'm sure we could easily find bottles at Walmart, but there could be a propane expiration date, 
It will definitely run out at some point. Then what? At least with solar, we wouldn't have to worry about getting refills. I wondered if cloudy days would be a problem. If the tech had told me, given me just one practical reason for hitting up his pad, I would have agreed to go first thing this morning. Well, hell, Gene, you should have said something. I thought you just wanted to pick up the rest of your Wolverine costume. I'll make sure we get over there tomorrow. He smiled sheepishly and dipped his head. I had pegged his true ulterior motive. The tech stood there with a completely oblivious look on his face, assuring me I was currently the lone sailing ship expert on deck. I began single-handedly lowering the gangplank. We both remained speechless as I worked. The tech finally asked a typical question only a movie fan would ask. So who do you think Hammer looks like? I guess it was my inner nerd that understood his perspective. I somehow knew he was asking which popular science fiction female character she most closely resembled. Dr. Crusher? The only leading redhead that came to mind was the doctor from Star Trek The Next Generation. Jane was too busy contemplating my answer to realize that I had just outed myself as a closet Trekkie and admitted that Hammer was potentially good-looking. He responded, Well, you could compare her to Gates McFadden, but I believe she is closer to Admiral Natasi Dalla of the Imperial Navy from Star Wars. That fucking bullshit, yo! Living dead is vampires! Could be heard shrieked from behind. The argument is built because the things we call zombies are nothing like the traditional monsters in the Romero movies, so shut the hell up! I wanted to shout over my shoulder, but that wouldn't mean getting involved. I was about to ask Jane if there might be anything else at this place worth taking as we heard a vehicle pull up and looked to see a giant white Chevy Dually truck approaching from the near distance. I'm not a car fanatic, nor a mechanic, so I couldn't tell if it was a 3500 or a 2500 without reading the number, but I could see Hammer had made an expert decision. This automobile looked formidable and could probably plow through any barricade that wasn't solid concrete. I have discussed the issue in these pages. The idea of human hostiles was always at the back of my mind, but I realize now that the former pawn shop owner had found a vehicle capable of outrunning most others, plus hauling a shitload of supplies. I could tell by the look on Gene's face that he was appreciating this masterpiece of machinery at an entirely different level than myself. It appeared he just had a spontaneous nerdgasm on himself. Holy stang! He exhaled with quiver and excitement. It's the Gorgon! I raised an eyebrow. Wasn't that a monster from Godzilla or something? The tech understood my confusion and clarified. Admiral Dallas' Imperial flagship! Oh, that should have been obvious after his earlier comparison. I just can't quote Star Wars canon like a preacher quotes the Bible. Although it wasn't in the shape of a wedge, it was quite massive compared to most vehicles so I suppose one could think of it as a Star Destroyer. I turned to inform the two master debaters that our chauffeur was en route and noticed they were practically drooling over the truck. Smoke screamed louder than the distance required. Dad a pimp-ass ride, dog! Then quietly he spoke. Is a little get it done for my taste, but I ain't gonna be picky. As the expert parked in the middle of the small lot, exited the vehicle and came on board via the recently lowered gangplank. Crow emerged behind us with her favorite staple. She began to set the table. We gathered around without any sort of conversation. I would like to have been told some details on our new horseless carriage, like where the hell Hammer found such an awesome vehicle, its projected reliability and amount of fuel, overall engine health, etc., and whether she had found the keys or was some sort of fast and furious genius car thief. None of us spoke until the food began to circle around the table. The oracle, predictably, was first to break the silence. Shit, brah, hand me that Heinz. He grinned excitedly and hurriedly reached past Bradley to retrieve his prized condiment. He immediately became stone-faced, totally silent and deliberate when he remembered that the woman of his dreams was in the vicinity. I was the only one who noticed his forced masculine dignity. I imagine he pulled his gut in, too. I sat down and noticed that Crow had conveniently positioned her seat next to Hammer's. I sincerely felt sympathetic toward the overweight prophet. Smoke sat across the table with a muted look of desire for the unobtainable woman in his eyes. The other three around the table discussed a grocery list with occasional additions made by Crow and me. When cokes were mentioned, 
I remember that pretty much all of the chips were on the same aisle. We gotta get some salt and vinegar Pringles. Okay, it was more of a demand than a request, but it was reasonable when considering they were some of the greatest potato chips ever. The thought of them sort of started me off. And some of the spicy Doritos, whatever the new ones are. Bradley added that he and Mary would like some blue tortilla chips. Gene hoped there might be a couple of bags of cheddar cheese popcorn left on the shelves. Apparently all we really wanted was a truckload of junk food, so I could not do anything but stare as Hammer replied casually. Oh, there was a Frito-Lay truck driver that made it to the shop. His 18-wheeler's still parked behind Bottom Dollar. We could stop on the way back from Wally to pick it up and grab some more outdoor gear from the shop. What the holy hell? There was a definitely drivable and fairly memorable vehicle with a shit ton of food in the back within a few hundred feet of us yesterday morning, and it just slipped her mind. We could have been back here for lunch yesterday eating fish and chips. Yes, I know I'm a fucking comedian. The supposed professional survivalist of our crew simply neglected to mention an easily accessible, stocked, mobile fortress that would exponentially increase our chances of survival like she had forgotten an extra pair of socks. If Hammer were a dude, I might have tackled the bastard or at least said several mean things to him. Why didn't she mention this yesterday? And what the hell happened to the driver? I was offended, angry, and wanted some answers. How am I supposed to take charge under these conditions? Rather than walk away or scream, I chose to remain seated and dumbfoundedly replied, Okay. I knew that if I asked Smokes his thoughts on the subject later, he would say something like, It was fate, homeboy. If Cyclops had told us about her ride, we wouldn't have got legs or Freddy Krueger. He never actually used these names. I just made them up. It sounded like something he would say. I guess I wanted to believe there was a reason behind it all and exploding in anger would be pointless and very unheroic. Plus, what's the complaint about? We'd survived, got some exercise, found a couple of new party members, and could now retrieve another plentiful food source. When we were not busy planning another quest, I would have to get the story of the missing truck driver. I guess the mystery of where she had gotten those bags of chips was solved. I must digress once more. As I mentioned earlier, when Alabamians say Coke, we are not necessarily referring to Coca-Cola products. Coke is our generic term for any soft drink, soda, or sparkling beverage. Or as my evil Yankee ex-girlfriend referred to it, pop. The same conversation is had each time one person in the vehicle goes into the gas station while others remain seated. Do y'all want a Coke? Yeah, what kind? Mountain Dew. I know that's not hard to understand, and it's just a reasonable way of speaking but that Yankee ex of mine could not get it through her dense skull. Well, more on that subject later. 12. Mo. Journal Entry 12. No one else seemed to notice Hammer's casual admittance of having neglected to inform us earlier of a reachable treasure chest. They all just continued eating and chatting. If it had been fate that we were to recruit our two most recent compatriots, it should have dawned on her after we'd met Jane. We could have backtracked to retrieve the year's worth of meals on wheels. We would have still been back last night. I remained silent, trying to harden my newfound faith in the gospel of my comrade, the Oracle. I caught the ass end of a conversation between the expert and the old friend. And I'm experienced with driving Humvees, so you boys can man the windows. She was obviously volunteering herself to drive the pickup. She reached over and patted Crow on the knee. And we need you to stay here and hold down the fort, honey. I'm fairly certain she ended her statement with a wink to the cook. This did not upset me as I'm sure it did smokes. I didn't expect the display. Did Hammer swing that way or could she just sense the attraction from Crow and was humoring it? I swear to God I have seen this in movies before. A barely conceiving strategy was proposed and without asking for any other ideas or opinions, the quest-bound party members were already loading up in the truck ready in rifles. It had rapidly become accepted and expected that there was some sort of romance between our two female companions when they remained alone on the deck and were the last to join us at the truck. Hammer and Crow said their goodbyes. It was a given that the fishing enthusiast didn't so much as wave to the rest of us as our truck exited the small marina parking lot. There were rifle barrels sticking out of each passenger window and a wheelchair resting in the bed. 
This had to be the most poorly thought out plan since the invention of plants. We were going to scavenge a few necessities from a completely abandoned building full of supplies. Any retard could use them to fortify the location and trap wayward explorers leaving absolutely no alternate routes if everything didn't go 100% according to the consensus. It was a consensus that really hadn't been reached by everyone to begin with. I'm pretty sure this is not I am legend. The virus is not airborne, as far as we know. It, it's not realistic. Not that any of this is realistic to assume that we are the only surviving humans on the planet. There are surely other people, possibly even on the peninsula, and some are bound to be unfriendly. How many post-apocalyptic stories can you name in which the lead group stumbles onto a grocery store and is not forced to fight hostiles? You can't, because that story would be pretty fucking boring. Nothing more than the usual banter filled the cab for the majority of the ride. Suddenly a snap pop could be heard from the driver's seat. This was followed by a long inhalation. Smokes poked his head between the front seats from behind the driver. Lady, the fuck you doing? Hammer guiltily grinned as if she had just been caught by a scolding parent. She glanced up to her rearview mirror with a cigarette dangling loosely from her lips. Sorry, hun. I've been trying to quit for twenty years. Smokes looked close to having a stroke. She thought it was because he didn't want to be in the cab full of tobacco smoke. You got cancer sticks and you've been hiding them? Well, like I said, I've been trying to quit for years, and the chew gives me something else. You think I give a damn? What kind you got? Newport Lights. I'ma kill every cracker in this truck if you don't give me a motherfucking smoke. I found this to be the perfect opportunity to make a smart-ass interjection. My hand shot up. I'm 116th Cherokee. He cut his eyes at me from the opposite side of the rear bench. You go first, white bread. I chuckled at the non-threat. Hammer was already reaching back with a precious cigarette. The nicotine-deprived smokes nearly burst into tears of joy as he thanked her. He looked as if he had decided to simply eat it before magically producing a lighter. We had traversed at least half of the way there, and the Gorgon had come across almost no automobile accidents or breakdowns, changing lanes only once to avoid a dead dog. Yeah, it doesn't appear that zombies enjoy eating things that are mangy. I've seen some pretty malicious stray dogs that refuse to eat another animal if there is something wrong with it. Maybe it's just beneath them to eat rotten meat, or possibly just because it's not as fun. I guess it's kind of like that. Other than Smokes moaning between drags from his cigarette, no sounds were made. Since I had taken the opportunity of this car ride to finish up my journal entry, I realized that I might as well go ahead and get Hammer's story, starting with the initial outbreak and ending at the point she had spit on my shoe and threatened to murder me. There's no time like the present. We had a few more minutes so I grabbed my extra notebook to record her words. 13. Hammer, in her own words. Ever since I got out of the service, I've been preparing for any sort of national or global collapse, whether it was inevitable and natural or completely man-made, such as a stock market crash or a pandemic. I've been setting myself up for years to deal with it. When the story broke about the sick monkey and the first human infected, I knew that this was it. I checked my supplies and started hunkering down in the secured locker at my pawn shop. Of course, most people didn't see how bad this could be or how fast it could get that way. I played along with everyone else and kept my open sign up like the other businesses around here. Finally, on the day the power went off, people started to worry. There was some panic. Obviously, it was too late. Wanna be tough guys that thought they were super survivalists because they wore hunting camouflage and had a 30 out 6. Police officers that pretended they were on secret service SWAT teams and quasi gangbangers screaming about solidarity. They all swarmed by bottom dollar for guns and ammunition. I sold to those that came ready to pay and behave themselves like human beings. When folks started with that looting mentality, I shut the shop and armed myself up the blind till they cleared off again. I was confident that most of these guys would not see another sunrise. I had Fox News running nonstop. On that last day, I sold nothing but guns, and then only the folks I thought were just there to arm themselves and leave. The people coming through would pay whatever I was asking for nothing but a basic bolt-action 22. According to most, every sporting goods store in the county, even Walmart had sold completely out of everything, including bows and arrows. 
Pretty much every store that sold guns and ammo had closed up shop for miles around. Sure, I could have saved my for sale ammunition for myself. Since I'd been preparing for this eventuality for years, I already had more than enough of every caliber to last me a lifetime. To tell you the truth, I was hoping these amateurs would put at least a couple rounds through a few tangos. It was inevitable, almost funny in a sadistic sense. The Ruskies began rushing the city just in time for lunch hour. Pretty soon the Magnolia's parking lot filled up. One person would attempt to help a sick individual and summarily get bitten, followed by a witness to the attack attempting to help the infected. They would rush the newly bitten to the ER and probably stay there until they themselves turned blue. It was heartwarming that people were such good Samaritans and simultaneously stupefying that they could be such ignorant sheep. After the first few crossed the causeway, I decided to lock up for good. My very last customer happened to be an intelligent young man who I initially thought would wind up holding down the fort with me. He turned out to be a pacifist idiot. He seemed normal at first. Then it started. This sickness was brought here by religious extremists. The only reason they hate us is because they are unemployed. He almost got shot for that one. Before I could even chase him out of the store, he started talking about me getting paid less than a man and that minimum wage should be increased. I told him to leave, and he started crying about his 14th Amendment rights. Then I just pointed my 45 at his head until the door shut behind him. I should probably feel guilty for sending him out unarmed, but then again, I can't abide those damn Democrats. After the socialist split, I set up a pole and a curtain over the doors that I'd painted with Alive and Armed Inside. Enter at your own risk, in day glow orange marking paint. The power went off sometime that afternoon. Next, I spent most of the next few days in my safe room with my cases of wise free dried rations, bottles of water, and red bin. I had taken the curtain down the night before you showed up to rob my place. I remember the news talking about how all of the tango stripped their clothes off, had a noticeable blue tint to their skin, and normally only came out at night. Something about UV light and the size of their irises. Their eyes turned a solid yellow color or something like that. Anyway, I was getting pretty low on chew after just a few days. When you have nothing to do but load magazines, clean guns, and play darts, you dip more than usual. I decided to make a midday run to the Exxon station in front of Publix and see what kind of tobacco products I could bring back with me. Confident, I believed I would not run into any insurgents or IEDs. The crazies would be easy to spot being blue, naked, and probably stumbling around like someone who's been out celebrating at the cave-in. There was no need to waste gas on a round trip that was less than a mile. Soon I started a quiet walk down the highway. I was surprised to be confronted with complete silence and putrid filth scattered everywhere. They leave a heck of a stinky mess behind them. I made it to the gas station with absolutely no interruptions. Smiling, I was happy to see that the door was unlocked. I began my shopping spree by opening a bottle of water and filling an entire grocery bag with chewing tobacco, another one with beef jerky, and one more with packs of Newports, just in case I got stressed. As I was pulling down rows of cigarettes from behind the counter, I saw a parked Frito light truck through the window, on the opposite side of the store. Just that name. Right away I start craving rolled gold pretzels. Maybe I would pay a visit to the truck or just drive it back if the keys were accessible. Hankering, I made my way across the parking lot. I was happy to see it unlocked and began fumbling through the console to find the keys for the back. After an unfruitful search, I simply walked to the back and used the butt of my carbine to break the lock. I rolled up the rear door and froze. Just like the stunned man who was sitting in the back eating out of a bag of barbecue potato chips. The guy was wearing a Frito-Lay cap. He dropped the bag as I raised my gun. Both of us understood the other was human. You could have heard a pin drop. Eventually, we began our introductions and stories, myself first, then my new friend. Earl Buckaloo had painfully thin and blonde hair. He was short, a former bodybuilder. That characteristic definitely made up for the hair. He was in his late 40s and lived in Atala. He'd been distributing chips for Lays for decades, planning to retire in just two years. This was the first person I had seen in days. Even though he was just a boring, bald-in chip delivery man, I was more than happy to have some company so I invited him to the bottom dollar. He fished the truck keys from his pocket and stuck a thumb to his right. There's a red man truck over there. You mind if we raid it before we head out, Petunia? I'm out of dip. I had bags full of tobacco over one arm, but almost dropped them and fell over at his revelation. Anyone who is addicted to tobacco knows there is no such thing as too much dip. 
this man rose a full two points in my admiration scale. Well, why not? I said, immediately exiting the truck and making my way to this piece of heaven on wheels. Now let me tell you, there is enough chewing tobacco and snuff in the Frito-Lay truck to last for years. We pulled up next to the smaller Redman rig and cleaned it out. Then we drove over and parked the Frito-Lay truck right up against the back door of the bottom dollar. We unloaded a couple pallets of chips and snacks, some boxes of chew and a few rolls of dip, then rolled the door down and locked the shop behind us. I felt pretty confident no one could get into the truck, the way we had it parked, but every time I think of those cans of tobacco back there, I get nervous. I can't wait to get back to it. Anyway, I led Earl on an abbreviated tour of the shop, going over the blocked entrance and the reinforced storage locker. He was pleasantly surprised that I was set up to last almost indefinitely and initially seemed content. After only a few hours, though, the typical testosterone-laden male started poking around uninvited. At first, I didn't pay any mind to his accidental brushes against my breasts and rear end, but eventually it became more obvious and pronounced, especially, well, sometimes I thought he was walking around with a broom handle. The next day, I walked into the bathroom and he was standing there completely naked. Presumably, he just dropped his towel. For a minute there, I feared he had turned. I looked him up and down. I swear I was just checking for blow. But naturally, he noticed me looking down. Oops. He looked back at me and grinned. Well, I guess you'll have to help me with that. I had not really been expecting it, but I guess it is commonplace in a survival situation to just give your companion a blowjob if they have contributed chips and tobacco. I tried to explain to him that I didn't swing that way. Offering polite explanations of my sexual preference were not going through to the naked chip man. I remember my daddy once told me to defuse a threatening situation with humor. So I finally ended the embarrassing confrontation with, Look how small it is! Ain't it cute? What's the little feller's name? I learned a long time ago that penis insults work on any man, no matter the circumstances. You can trash their IQ, their work, even their mama, but nothing shuts off their brain like a pecker slam. Of course, the fact I had my pistol on my hip gave me an added edge. Earl picked up his towel, wrapped it violently around his waist. His face turned red as a beet. Fine, I'm going to Publix to get some fucking spaghetti. It was probably wise of him not to try to insult me in return. I kept a smile on my face and simply stepped to the side, gesturing for him to be on his way. Earl quickly dressed and began gearing up for his journey. I called after him. Normally you'll have no problem with Hodges during the day, but you can never be too careful, especially inside a building. All of my warnings seemed to go in one ear and out the other as he prepped to leave. He didn't speak as he went out the door, and I wondered if he would return with spaghetti, just forget his attempt to get laid, and forgive my personal remarks about his gear. I wouldn't have minded simply looking past the naked episode and was actually craving some of that spaghetti. Looking back, I guess I should have gone with him, but figured he might need some time alone after my insults to his manhood. I never heard any gunfire, screams, howls, or anything. I just never saw Earl again. I am still wondering if he died, or if he's still out there somewhere. I guess we'll find out when we see how much dip is left in the truck. He may have been a man, but I still kind of miss the guy. Who knows? Maybe he made it and will show back up. 14. Mo. Journal Entry 13. Hammer turned her attention back to the road. With that, I was startled into reality. I was making notes on a few finishing touches. Blink and I looked up to see that the tech and the oracle, who were seated to my left respectively, were just as transfixed on the uncommon sound as I was. It's amusing that only a few days without motorized transportation would cause us to be alarmed by the sound of a car blinker. After the extra milliseconds it took me to recognize what I was hearing, I looked through the windshield to see that our driver was slowing merging into the traffic lane and preparing to stop at the non-functioning traffic light to turn into the Walmart parking lot. I didn't understand the importance of obeying traffic laws when there was no one left to enforce them. I asked, Really? The expert threw up her hand. Hush, I've been driving longer than you've been alive and I've never got a ticket. Not going to chance it now. Hammer was obviously still thinking this was just a hiccup in her daily life and things would soon be back to normal. 
I'm pretty sure she would never again have to worry about tarnishing her pristine driving record. The Walmart Supercenter was still standing, thankfully. Though the parking lot was not even a quarter of the way full, there had been a few shoppers willing to buy groceries on the day the world stopped turning. I was unable to see the parking lot of the shopping center up the hill, next to Walmart, but the other businesses that had popped up along the highway in the shadow of the retail giant had not been looted, and most had at least a couple of cars in the parking lot. You know, it really pisses me off when people bitch about Walmart stealing patronage from local businesses. These people must have never been through rural Alabama where a Walmart has been constructed. There was a gas station, trees, and pasture land before Walmart. Now there were thousands of jobs where local businesses had congregated around the supercenter. It would take even less than my mediocre education to realize Walmart exponentially grew our economy. One thing I hope the zombie apocalypse has done away with is those liberal pussies who hate capitalism. But I digress. We traveled squarely up one of the lanes of the parking lot. Hammer seriously slowed to turn into an available parking spot closest to the store. Naturally, after the completely emptied handicapped parking section. Whoa! The driver seemed startled by my exclamation. She applied the brakes to a vehicle that was barely moving anyway. Then she looked at me in the rearview mirror. What's wrong? This fucking parking lot is basically empty and we ain't got to worry about the fire department showing up. Park in the damn fire lane. This outburst would have been expected from Smokes. The entire party was taken aback by my uncharacteristic ranting. I honestly attempt to always keep my cool. I was just not willing to be run down by Peavies as I ran back to a truck that was halfway across the fucking parking lot while my arms are full of groceries. All because the driver wants to be a law-abiding citizen. Speech was not necessary. The reflection in the mirror told me that I could threaten her with bodily harm and she would still refuse to park closer to the doors. I was preparing myself for another tirade when Bradley interjected with a compromise. I've got a handicap tag on my track. I think it's legal to park between the blue lines as long as it's easy provable that there's a handicapped person in your party. I call bullshit. I'm not exactly sure, but I would bet you that he just pulled this out of his ass. I'm glad he did. Apparently so was Hammer, as we had been provided with a reasonable compromise. This was farther away from the door than I wanted to be, but it was the best I was going to get. Even as she pulled into the parking spot, she still tried to appear skeptical about this law. She asked Bradley, So if the cop is writing me a ticket, you could just show him that you're in a wheelchair? Jesus, that's beyond complete denial. I wasn't the only one disturbed, and Bradley stammered. Uh, sure. Did she really think there would be cops writing tickets ever again? Here's an even better question. Let's say that there was no world-destroying plague and everything was as normal as it had been just over a month ago. There were dutiful police officers constantly scouring the Walmart parking lot for minor traffic infractions. If we were all inside loading up buggies with groceries, how the hell would we be alerted to a cop slapping a violation slip under the windshield wiper? Though it would be entertaining to see the expert fret over the answers, I chose to keep my mouth shut and take what I could get as she killed the engine. The entire delegation filed out. I stepped up on the running board, grabbed Bradley's wheelchair, and tossed it on the ground. It was a lot lighter than I expected, once his arsenal had been removed. Bradley dropped himself out of the truck. While it scared the shit out of me, he expertly landed in the right spot. Mary jumped down to land perfectly on his shoulder. I'd almost forgotten that she had taken this trip with us, spending the entire ride quietly curled up in her master's lap like an anorexic cat. The only movement was that of an empty plastic bag that got swept up by a gust of wind to fittingly mimic tumbleweed as it rolled between the group and the doors to the store. This was not the Old West. It was a brand new world. While following some of the same archaic rules, the two ages looked nothing alike. But I found this modern tumbleweed almost poetic. Hammer was somehow able to catch the attention of all party members. She lifted a finger to a mouth to remind us not to be loud. Smokes probably needed this reminder, but I'm fairly certain the rest of us realized that there were aggressive, sound-sensitive, bloodthirsty monsters that might hide from the sun in easily accessible, enclosed dark buildings like the one in front of us, which we had volunteered to enter. The expert took point, dashing and rolling ahead of the company like she was behind enemy lines. 
She hid behind abandoned shopping carts for cover on the few yards the journey took from the Gargan to the front door. It was readable on her face that she felt credited for our unhindered traverse across the asphalt. If I had not seen several zombies in earlier days, I would have a hard time believing this was anything more than a quiet day during a power outage. Once again, I nearly questioned whether there had actually been some sort of infectious outbreak. There were no bodies strewn across the parking lot, no bloody smears on the glass before us, no sign of catastrophe. While not directly in front of the doors, we were angled at the glass and were able to see through. We could glimpse nothing more than a few sunlit spots under the skylights throughout the store. There was nothing remarkable. It was almost disappointing to see no bloody stumps or eviscerated organs. Not that I really wanted to see horrible death, but it would have made me feel that there really was imminent danger. It would validate our carrying live firearms into a department store. At nearly every opportunity, the Oracle reminded us that he was black, and that in typical horror epics, a lone minority in a mostly white group was usually the first victim to fall at the hands of the undead, or the murderous maniac. So I'm sure I wasn't the only one shocked when he moved to stand directly in front of the glass doors. Shit's broke. He waved both arms at the sensor, and he was clearly trying to be funny, considering Smokes wasn't stupid enough to believe the doors would open without electricity. I wouldn't have expected him to stand in the open like that for the sake of a lame joke. Regardless of his incessant warnings of how the brother gets eat first, perhaps he was able to see the timing of his own death along with everyone else he had prophesied. The oracle remained before the glass confident as the expert abruptly broke from her hushed conversation with the old friend and pushed him aside with no announcement. She wedged the combat knife that materialized in her hand between the doors to slide them open just enough. She squeezed through and finished the job with masculine strength. It was hard to tell if she had done this merely to finish the job quickly or to prove that men were useless and inferior wakelings. She could do this without us altogether. Sigmund Freud would have diagnosed her with daddy issues. We followed her into the entrance room where there were several arcade games, a movie dispense and red box, and one of those stupid claw machines that's supposed to grab a stuffed animal, but never really does, although it would wind up eating tens of dollars of my hard-earned quarters because my stupid ganky ex-girlfriend begged for a cheaply made teddy bear. I could have just gone in the damn store and bought one for less and not embarrass myself with my inability to capture one with the claw. The party had passed through the first set of formerly automatic doors and was partially through the entry room en route to the second set. I smiled as I realized happily that we had entered the doors on the grocery side of the building. This was one of the older Walmart centers and had been here for decades. I'd visited the store so many times in my life that I knew its layout almost as well as I did the house I grew up in. Until now, I had not really paid attention to which of the two sides we had approached. Three days ago, I would have attributed our entry choice to luck, even though I was certain Hammer knew this Walmart as intimately as I and has simply decided this would be the most prudent path, I was no longer able to credit chance or even personal choice for any predicament, good or bad. I fully believe now that the screenwriter, or the director, or ultimately God had already chosen our destiny, and that we would have been in the exact spot we were at the exact moment the place we were supposed to be, regardless of our prior decisions. Once we pried the inner doors open, it was only a few dozen yards to our intended department. I was sincerely glad we had not entered on the other side, because that would have meant passing by a shitload of checkout counters and an untold number of other perfect hiding spots for PVs. This set of doors was no more of an obstacle than the first. Once through, the expert instructed the rest of us to grab one of the waiting buggies, reddening in fear that she had offended our comrade who would have been unable to do so, and then quickly changed her command to encompass only the three of us who were upwardly mobile. As if to set Hammer at ease, Bradley gestured and Mary had aptly retrieved two of the small hand baskets from a stack beside the row of buggies. He simply hung them from the push handles on either side of the back of his chair as I'm sure he had done every shopping day of his adult life. The four of us pushing buggies remained side by side when possible, long guns resting over handles. The old friend stayed close behind with his early warning system perched lightly on his shoulder, constantly watching our six. I was stunned that we had encountered absolutely no hostile humans, and it was creepy that I had not actually seen a PV in almost 24 hours. 
Wow, I just fucking wrote that. It just feels wrong to have to be constantly wary of an enemy that never exposes itself. You can't be sure if it's simply waiting to strike you once you let your guard down, or if it moved on, or if it ever existed at all. Think of The Village, a thriller where these people live in an isolated little burg, always afraid of these unseen monsters that hang out in the woods nearby. This retarded kid starts killing people. It's your typical, who's really the enemy here kind of plot. Now, if he hadn't started raging, and the monsters were blue shitters, okay, maybe not the greatest movie ever, but it is pretty good comparison. And don't try to tell me I'm the only one who makes up alternate storylines for every movie I've seen. In fact, some of my reboots might even be better than the originals. So if you're still alive, give me a call, Mr. Knight. The Isle of Spoiled Meat almost knocked me down when we entered. It only got worse with each step. I shivered at the thought of moving ever closer to the freezers and the intermingling of the two smells. I've always felt that I have a pretty strong stomach, but this shit was incredibly intense. It was without question that all of our troops knew the basic layout of this store from experience, and we moved to the farthest aisle and would work our way through and back towards the front of the store. The most apparent problem was the rear of the grocery section, which was lined with refrigerators crammed with milk. Along the sidewall, front to back, was the deli. Fresh meat and fresh vegetables, the ice cream and various other frozen foods were on the first couple of aisles we passed. In other words, we were going to be surrounded by rotten, stinking food until we could not stand it. I hope Smokes had been working on his cardio because I was going to run through this nightmare. So the first aisle we would actually shop down contained coke, chips, and beer. I would not drink that horse piss if I was dying of thirst. But it would be useful to trade, and perhaps some of my comrades that were beer drinkers. I would get a few 30 packs of beer and maybe a couple of cans of Guinness for any of the other crew members. Did I seriously just say that the beer could be traded? Since the day of the outbreak, I have met a total of four new people and have not had a single reason to struggle to survive. I haven't been hungry, cold, or desperate in any sense. Why would I need goods to barter with? Am I expecting a fucking trade caravan or a flea market? I just decided that Smokes was full of shit and there were no survivors or sadistic mohawk marauders holed up here or anywhere else. As if on cue, Hammer stopped and raised a fist. The entire group stopped in mid-step, or mid-wheel, and waited. She gestured that she heard voices ahead and to her right. I could tell by the look on the oracle's face that he had absolutely no clue what any of her gestures meant and probably wondered why she wanted him to fist her ear over in front of the peckles. I need to remember to go over the meaning of basic hand signals with my large friend later. At least he stopped when the rest of us did. We all listened closely and eventually heard two distinct voices coming from within one of the aisles before us. The high-pitched whining of Fat Albert had not alerted them, so apparently a deaf couple had somehow survived and were now out grocery shopping. Scratch that. If they couldn't hear, then they wouldn't be speaking to one another. Maybe they were just so engaged in their own conversation that they were oblivious to all else. We moved at a snail's pace, checking for movement before stopping at the next end cap. We realized that unless our hearing-impaired friends were loading up on putrid milk, they had to be down the next aisle. They were about to walk out into us. I didn't know whether to be scared or excited. The anticipation was nerve-wracking. Thankfully, they still had not realized that they had company and spoke without worries. An unintelligible male voice could be heard giving a command followed by a young female voice. Well, I don't know. I'll go get some. The female's voice was getting closer. She was obviously going to walk out right in front of us. Gene and Bradley guarded the rear as Hammer, Smokes, and I prepared to defend our front. I put my hand on the barrel of Smokes' rifle. If this survivor turned out not to be hostile, I didn't want her to be riddled with bullets. Even though he gave me a go-to-hell look, he quietly loosened his shoulders before grinning with the knowledge that the two of us would be able to take care of one interloper. The building was bright enough to see from one end of an aisle to the other, but it would not be safe to read under these lighting restraints. The expert pointed a flashlight at where our new friend would be appearing in seconds. As the individual walked into the washed-out gloom, Hammer hit her with the small spotlight. She froze and covered her eyes. Yup, just like a deer in the headlights. Blonde hair was pulled back from a young face. She stood just over average height. She was still trying to block the light from her eyes. She said, Don't shoot! 
By this time, a request like this really isn't called for. If we had planned to shoot, she wouldn't still be alive to ask it. This unknown girl looked through her outstretched fingers and squinted. Who's there? Hammer ready to answer, as a summer from years ago flashed across my mind. Holy shit, was it possible? I knew exactly who this female was. My brain was screaming, but my mouth filtered it to a restrained inquiry. Sarah? 15. Mo. Journal Entry 14. Prophecy from the Book of Smokes. The love interest really needs no introduction. He or she is instantly and obviously the romantic attraction of the main protagonist. This character may or may not be aware of the feelings of the other and may or may not initially reciprocate those feelings. But the whole audience knows. Regardless of whether the love interest shares the enamorment of and with the main character, they will inevitably end up in a romantic relationship before the story is completed. Two summers after I graduated high school was definitely the greatest time of my life. Sure, I went to parties and had some memorable occasions during high school, but nothing compares to that summer. I still worked at the grocery store that had been my place of employment since I was 15. Even during that time, I worked 40 hours a week for little pay. Somehow I was able to attend more than one party per week and only remember scattered hours of being at my job. The non-rich kids and people from schools I had never even heard of partied in the cow pasture owned by a guy I barely knew until that summer. Scott motherfucking Chandler. He was tall and lanky and thought of himself as a cowboy. At first glance, most would agree. Note, no one called him Scott, or even Scott Chandler, because when intoxicated, he referred to himself in third person always as Scott motherfucking Chandler. And yes, I know that adds syllables which defeat the purpose of a nickname, but it just sounded good, and it suited him. After going to just a few weekly parties at Scott motherfucking Chandler's, I had learned the name or had become friends with almost every regular attendant. One night, someone got the bright idea to invite a large group of unknowns. Remember that Tracy Bird song, I'm from the country? Where I'm from, everybody knows everybody, and everybody calls you friend. Well, we treated new faces like we knew them. Either that, or Scott motherfucking Chandler would try to kill them with a chainsaw, which he had tried to do several times before. One of these new faces was Sarah Ogle, a cute, skinny blonde a couple years younger than me that somehow graduated the same year from Guntersville. How had we never met before that summer? Just to give you a mental image of Sarah, remember that movie The Quiet? Okay, probably not. There isn't an IMDb anymore where you can find out about it. So I'll just tell you that the story was really fucking weird and it was a box office failure. The chick who has sex with her dad in the movie, told you, fucking weird, was unbelievably gorgeous. At least that's what I remember. Though Sarah was not a lookalike to that actress, you could put her in the same category of phenomenal hotness. The type of girl who was out of the league of 90% of guys. I'm not sure how I got the time of day from her, but we immediately became friends. She came over to my house, or I went to hers almost every day for months. That entire chapter of my life is something of a blur to me. I don't remember many specifics except that unsafe amounts of alcohol were consumed. I'm pretty sure that I did not once try to get any from Sarah. I know I really don't understand it either. I'm normally self-centered and shallow, but I simply enjoyed being with her. Maybe that's why she trusted me, because she was drunk several times. Yes, I secretly regret that missed opportunity every day of my life. Almost anyone would have called Sarah fucking hot. By all means, I would agree, but I guess I loved her beyond physical appearance. She was my best female friend. After that summer, and even just recently, we would occasionally see each other. Even though our work schedules never seem to coordinate, we have gone out a few times, only as friends. On the other hand, I've been madly in love with her since we met. Although this is obvious to everyone, including her, I'm sure, I've never been able to bring myself to tell her, nor have I really discussed it with anyone. I have had one serious relationship, which was a horrible mistake, and a few other reasonable facsimiles of girlfriends throughout my life, but I would have dropped any of them instantly if Sarah needed me. A psychiatrist would most likely diagnose me with some sort of repressed obsession if I told him about Sarah. All of those emotions came back the moment I saw her. 
My initial instinct was to shut them off. Momo? Sari interrupted my moment of reminiscing, using the pet name she gave me during that summer, a name that I only tolerated from her. I had to shake myself back into reality before things took a turn. I spoke to my companions. This is Sarah Ogle. She's a close friend of mine, and she... Close? Smokes was sure to add a sarcastic, insinuating tone to his question. I refused to explain myself while the expert was pointing a rifle at the only person not blood-related to me I've ever truly cared for. Captain Sledge. I put all the force I could muster behind this statement. Relax. She's a friendly. Hammer hesitated before easing. She lowered her rifle. I also relaxed as attention dissipated from the situation. Next, barely understandable profanities could be heard as the second figure rounded the corner. He stopped stone cold before raising his hands in surrender, dropping his armloads of beer. I was having a hard time believing what I was seeing. There was Walt. I mean Dean Walt Sneed during high school. Like most of my friends, he was younger than me. He got his nickname because his drunken slurring of his name sounded like Disney. Walt was a caricature of a typical hillbilly, short, wiry, premature, balding. He also had single-handedly paid for a private jet for both U.S. smokeless tobacco and Budweiser, had a fucked-up set of teeth, spoken a slur that was barely intelligible by anyone, happily dropped out of high school at 16, and was damn proud of all of it. Picture Jim Varney as earnest with a legally blind dentist. I kind of lost touch with him a few years ago even though I knew he still lived only a couple miles from me. Just like me, he would never move away. Okay, I realize that I've said this several times in this journal, but I have to say it again. What the fuck? This is not close to possible. I know I spent pretty much all my life in this area. It is beyond coincidental that two people I know fairly well survived a plague that destroyed over 99% of the human population of Guntersville. By luck, I happened to run across both in the same locale. This is something I would expect to see in a movie. My life was scripted to occur nowhere other than a film set. Walt, what the hell's going on? I was incredulous. How could these two wind up here at this moment? Mo? He said. Mo Collins. How you been, boy? God, Walt is the most unobservant dumbass I had ever met. I merely gave a confirming nod. Walt, I said. He goofily replied, God damn, son, I thought that was you. They both appeared unarmed. I gestured once again for Hammer to lower her weapon after she had raised it upon the appearance of a second unknown. I was quick to ask, Are you alone? I doubted these two would be involved with a crew of murderous vandals, but I really didn't want one of their stray party members or mine surprising the other and winding up with a bullet wound. He replied with a wave of his hand. No, man, there ain't a goddamn soul with us. Before I continue, note that I very rarely use the word goddamn, and only write it in the dialogue of others to recreate actual speech. You may also notice that I contract or change the spelling of words during some dialogue, and that is also for authenticity. I am not some holier-than-thou Bible scholar who would condemn others for saying goddamn. Hell, Walt uses it at least once in almost every sentence, and I use every other profanity known to man. Before you get picky, I know that using Jesus Christ or Oh My God would also be considered taking the Lord's name in vain, and there is really no difference between those exclamations. I don't personally make a habit of using them, but I do what I must for journalistic integrity. I was relieved that no other friendlies would be appearing. Hopefully this was a high-budget film, not some indie B-movie. Could I expect any more main characters to be popping up soon after the love interest? The Oracle, my go-to for plot, would affirm that Sarah is the love interest. So if anyone else was in the Walmart, we could shoot first and ask questions never. Looking back, it should have been obvious that it would be Walt making his way through the beer aisle at Walmart after the apocalypse. It takes a truly devoted alcoholic to scavenge for warm carbonated urine right after the end of the world. I still want to know how the hell you two ended up here. I was looking at Sarah, but of course Walt answered. Well, me and my fiancé here. He gestured to Sarah before continuing. We was picking up some stuff for everybody, and I reckon since we was here, I would just get me a few goddamn cases of beer. 
Of course, he spoke as if I knew exactly what he was talking about. I looked at Sarah with raised eyebrows, shaking my head. Did he really just say that they were engaged? It is a well-known fact that Walt is a complete fucking moron. Although it's usually an endearing quality, it's irritating to try to force an explanation out of him for anything he says or does. Now, I love dogs, as I've said, but I don't expect them to successfully recite a complex monologue. Sarah gestured for me to follow her off to the side. I began moving as she turned to walk down the closest aisle. We walked at an even pace with a few feet between us. Though I knew she would calmly explain the entire situation, I wanted her to hurry the hell up and make me understand. All group of survivors made a sweep this Walmart earlier this morning and found it to be clean. Me and Walt came up here to get some supplies. Sarah began in her easy way. Pausing, she reached into a shelf. She opened a jar of pickles and crunched on one. It doesn't look like anybody else has raided this place yet. We planned on grabbing mostly non-perishables and ammunition. Sarah looked at me and answered the question on my face. Yeah, I know. There aren't as many survivors as I had expected either. I'm guessing it's because they ain't the slow-type zombies. It was good to know my little band wasn't the only group of survivors calling the infected zombies. I briefly wondered if they also referred to them as peeves. There were so many other questions for her that I didn't even know where to begin. I started with the most pressing. Are you really going to marry that idiot? She chuckled, delicately wiping a little pickle juice from her lip. God, no! I found myself trapped by a group of guys who were probably going to hurt me and Walt was nearby. He remembered me from years ago and chased them off. Lucky he was roaming around, I guess. I said, a little jealous that it hadn't been me to rescue her. First, he started calling me his wife. I told him that we had to get engaged first, so he's been calling me his fiancé ever since. He keeps me safe and has been a gentleman. I really don't know if he's joking or not. He can call me whatever he wants, as long as he protects me and doesn't expect you know what. At that moment, the western Appaloosa flashed across my mind. Sarah sounded a lot like Allie French, beholden to whoever offers the best package. Please tell me you know what I'm talking about. I could vividly imagine the situation of Sarah being forced out of her car. She was encircled by roughnecks who were thwarted at the last moment by an unlikely protagonist. I would mull this over later. I decided to continue with my line of questioning. Where the hell were you when this happened? She looked at me as if I should know. I was on my way to your house. Or at least your parents' house. Don't you remember that you told me that at the end of the world I should come to your house? An off-handed comment that I made years ago when I was drunk after reading what may be the greatest post-apocalyptic novel of all, The Road, was not at the front of my mind. Shame on me. I may not have remembered saying this, but of course I would want her with me after some sort of catastrophe, not doubting that she was quoting me. I was just surprised that she would have remembered something like that. I was torn between feeling pride because Sarah took my words to heart and thought of me as her safety or horror that she had almost come to harm by following my advice. I was also sad that I had not remembered giving it and then wasn't even there for her when she needed me. Her words depressed me beyond reason. I should have gone to Mama and Daddy's when I had the chance. I would never see them again. I stood there wishing I had been a better son who'd spent more time with his parents or had even thought to go home to be personally safer. I also felt that if I had been where I should have been and where I told her I would be, things would be different between us. Who else had needed me while I hid out at the dock? I know we can't predict how our actions will affect our future, but every time I see Sarah, I feel like if I had done one thing different or could go back and change one small action, our friendship would have moved to the next level. Remember that Nicolas Cage movie, Next? If I could see every possible outcome for my actions, even just to the end of the conversation, I could have everything I want. Even with Nicolas Cage, it was still a good movie. It goes without saying that if I had gone home and not remained on the Cora, I would never have met Smokes or any of my other party members. Maybe I never had that choice. I'm sure the oracle would tell me something like, you was always at the place you is always supposed to be. If I had gone home, Sarah might not have made it, and she would not be here now, or she could be married to Walt. I'm thinking of the butterfly effect. 
She stopped walking when she saw that I had gone still. Wait, so where did you and Walt come from? I asked. I had originally felt this unsupportable inclination that my parents were alive, but I had pushed thoughts of them to the back of my mind and had refused to contemplate their circumstances. Suddenly a surge of hope now washed over me as I knew what she was about to say. Well, your house, of course. My jaw went slack and I gaped, waiting for more. When she realized I wanted her to continue, she smiled and pulled a piece of paper from the front pocket of her jeans. Randy made a list of stuff we need to get, and Mrs. Collins told me to go back to the sewing department and clean it out. Just so it is clear, Randy is my dad's first name, and Mrs. Collins is obviously my mom. From elementary school onward, everyone who was anywhere close to my age called my dad by his first name, and I doubt if most of them even knew my mom had a first name. It was never meant as disrespect to my dad, nor did it mean that my mother was not personable. The formality shown to her probably stemmed from the fact that she was a substitute teacher at my school for years. I had never been so overjoyed in my life. My parents had survived the Armageddon event that had wiped out almost everyone else. Sarah was alive, and as glad as I was about that, it was impossible for me to think of anyone but my family as I almost danced a jig. I was unaware that Sarah and I had reached the end of the aisle and had turned toward our waiting friends. The silence between us was not uncomfortable as it would have been for most people. She had learned shortly after meeting me that I show as little emotion as possible, and she's always been okay with it. I wanted to hug her, scream for joy, ask her a million questions, but I simply swallowed all feelings and reverted to my default setting of placid. When I'm riled, I can get pretty sarcastic. I have a decent sense of humor and laugh fairly often. I get pissed about a few things, but the majority of the time I simply exist. I'm sure Jean would say I'm letting the force guide me. I suppose that's a decent description. I always try to remain calm. On rare occasions I flare up, showing excessive anger or an illogical fear. Must be the dark side gaining control. Wow, I'm a fucking nerd. When we came closer to the others, I wasn't surprised to hear Walt speaking loudly. I got my licenses revoked about four months ago because I got three DUIs in one week. How about you? My alcoholic friend sounded almost proud, as he usually did when discussing his petty criminal activity. He'd paused as if waiting for a response. None came. Walt's grimace could be heard. Shit, sorry, man. He had obviously been speaking to Bradley. Walt just realized he was paraplegic. That didn't mean Bradley couldn't possibly drive, Perhaps he has one of those motorcycles with three wheels. On the other hand, if he did have a rig like that, he probably would have been on it and not simply pushing himself down the highway. Well, there would have been a lot of obstacles after the apocalypse, so he might have left it at home. Hell, maybe it was out of gas. This is really not the place to argue with myself. I guess I'll consider it quietly rather than write everything down. We stepped around the corner to face the other travelers. They had not noticeably moved since Sarah and I had made our way down the pickle aisle. Boy, Randy ain't gonna believe we run into y'all. You gotta come back with me and my lady. Walt said, taking Sarah by the arm. He just offered to take me to see my own family. Walt had been in my house. Maybe I wasn't too keen on the fact that Sarah was engaged to marry him. He would undoubtedly remind me of that fact every time he spoke. My folks would know I hadn't called when I made port. I had promised Mama that I would never let Walt operate any vehicle that I occupied. I had to take him up on his offer. Walt had been heavily intoxicated since before he was able to drive. I'm not sure where he got it, but he always had a beer in his hand, stumbled and slurred his words, making his already exaggerated southern grammar completely unintelligible. Within the first month of getting his license, he'd had three automobile accidents but could only remember one. Regardless of his slurred speech, he actually seemed pretty sober. My parents did let Sarah ride with him, so I was guessing it was safe enough and figured my mother would approve. I excitedly agreed. I don't remember much about my farewells to the Cora company other than the conversation with Hammer where I swore to return within two days. So, I paused, trying to sync the time schedule. That means I can stay tonight and tomorrow night? I was about to have two days of mama's cooking, or so I thought. 
Special Ops Captain Petunia Sledgehammer crushed my dreams by pinching the bridge of her nose and sighing. You have 24 hours. This was a bummer. As I was desperate for dietary variety, I pushed my luck. 24 hours starting... She figuratively slapped her forehead. Starting now. You will be back for supper tomorrow night, period. Or what? You're going to ground me? Give me extra KP? I looked at her defiantly, attempting to win the debate with mind control. After a moment of our staring game, I caved under the unbearable weight of the woman's single evil eye. My shoulders slumped. Fine. You win, Cap. Twenty-four hours. Shit, lady. I would have preferred at least a week with the family I had presumed lost. It was understandable I had thrown my lot in with other pirates. Anyway, our clan and my father's delegation could stay in contact, become trade partners, or whatever. One group could mutually benefit the other as if they were neighboring towns. Eager thoughts of my home kept me from focusing on the details of our departure. I remember now Walt mentioned a hammer he and his woman had discovered a goddamn break room or some shit. There were easily identifiable keys for a few of the 18-wheelers behind the building. I don't recall his explanation for why he did not plan to take one of these himself. The expert was more than happy to pilot a truckload of groceries back to the ship while one of the others drove the pickup. The three of us parted from my group of protagonists. We made our way across the store to the automotive section. There was the exit to the express lube garage where Walt had parked his truck. It was, not surprisingly, already loaded with beer and very little else. One thing I remember of our walk across the dimly lit Walmart was the sight of one of the very few dead humans I had seen since the outbreak began. A Walmart employee whose name tag Red Howard sported a dried bullet entry wound on the right side of his chest. He lay slumped against a rack of shoes. There was a grimace of fear and pain frozen on his face. I don't know why this scene bothered me so much. The body wasn't horribly mutilated or particularly bloated. I suppose it had something to do with the look on Howard's face. It innocently said, Why would you shoot me? We're both human and just trying to survive. I'm sure Howard's end will haunt my dreams for a long time. My parents still consumed most of my thoughts. Now this face of death took what was left. So my memories of leaving Walmart are a bit fuzzy. If I did not, I should have asked Walt where he got this awesome king cab that surely cost more than he had made in his entire life. I am finishing this entry on our trip to my parents' house. Hopefully I will have time to make another entry before leaving my former home to return to my current one. 16. Mo, Journal Entry 15 I had just finished the previous journal entry when I looked up to notice that we were less than two miles from the house in which I grew up. The truck was coming to a stop at a small bridge which had apparently been made into a checkpoint. Almost every road that entered this corner of Douglas featured a bridge to cross the various narrow and winding shallow creeks that crisscrossed the area. My father had always discussed the strategic importance of these bridges to manage any traffic coming into the area during any kind of emergency so I was fairly certain who had arranged the approach and roadblock. Walt came to a complete stop as the guard sauntered up to the driver's window. I almost gasped as I recognized this watchman, Tyler Elroy. Tyler was at least nine years younger than me, and I really knew nothing of the kid. Well, besides his grandmother was a sweet old lady who lived just a few houses down from my parents. Oh, and his older brother was a little bit girly and had better hair than most women. Almost every piece of clothing Tyler had on was camouflage. He held a semi-automatic hunting rifle at his side, and I believe he had a pinch of tobacco in his lip. If Tyler had been a few years older, we probably would have been buddies. Tyler and Walt casually conversed as if nothing out of the ordinary had occurred recently, and this bridge was normally guarded by armed militia. Tyler stuck his head in the open window. You get it? Walt goofily chuckled. Goddamn right, son. I got more beer than I can drink in one night. You can swing by when you get off and get drunk with me. It was obvious that Tyler wasn't 21. My trashy friend did not give a shit and would share a beer with anyone old enough to hold a cup. Hell, the only times I can recall him being sober himself since he was old enough to walk into a PG-13 movie alone was when he'd just gotten out of the drunk tank at the county jail. 
our driver had paused for entirely too long. Just as I opened my mouth to alert the attentive border patrolman to my presence, Walt seemed to remember that I was sitting beside him. Oh yeah, I got Mo Collins in here with me, and we was about to go see his daddy. Call Randy and tell him we're fixing to head that way. Tyler nodded in the affirmative as he leaned forward into the open window. Holy shit, Mo! I knew you weren't here when shit went down, so I didn't know if you'd made it. Good to see you, man. I dipped my head at the young guard. I made it, man. How you doing? And how's your granny? I ain't seen her in a long time. I would kill for some of her chicken pot pie. My mouth started watering just thinking about it. Tyler looked at the ground. She died about five years ago, Mo. Oh, shit. Sorry to hear that, bud. The silence was awkward. Even Walt felt it. He graciously bid the newly depressed rifle-bearing guard farewell. Well, we ought to get over to see the boss before it gets too dark. We'll see ya. The driver threw his hand out the window in a wave as the truck left the bridge behind. Marshall County natives have always used the excuse of leaving before it gets too dark whenever they are ready to go away. It was a logical reason for my grandparents, who didn't exactly have 2020 vision, but it just seemed pathetic when people my age or younger said it. Hell, it wasn't even that late in the afternoon. It interrupted my thoughts as I was debating whether this was an acceptable usage of a lame excuse. Walt spoke as we drove away. Cause I reckon the boss would want to see his youngin' before much longer. Wait, why did you just call my daddy the boss? Walt looked at me like I was the idiot with a 10th grade education. I should have known something so elementary. Cause that man knows how to get shit done, goddammit. This was probably a dream come true for my dad. He had been casually preparing for the end of the world for years. The fact other survivors saw him as some type of figurehead must have enlarged his ego past the breaking point. Though he was a Walking Dead fan, I seriously doubt he expected the apocalypse to come close to resembling fantasy. However, I was sure he had accepted this ridiculous reality and was thriving. My father didn't give me unlimited freedom when I was a teenager but I didn't expect him to be with some type of fascist despot in the post-apocalyptic world. I expect he'd be doing his best to help the residents of his community. So is he the mayor? I questioned. Shit, I reckon. He keeps things straight and keeps them goddamn zombies out. I wasn't going to assume there had been any type of elections. Definitely I wasn't going to ask if he was the governor. From what I know of that chapter of the Walking Dead story, that would be like calling him Der Fuhrer. And I'm sure Smokes would scream about copyright infringement, motherfucker. The community looked as it always had, peaceful and orderly. We passed the occasional vehicle as we leisurely continued on our journey. This surprised the hell out of me. I had not expected to see neighbors out traveling. There were harvesters, tractors, and humans in some of the fields we passed. Also, in every cow pasture, the obligatory armed shepherd watched over the herd. Visually absorbing my old stomping grounds, I offered almost no conversation. Walt was probably too busy thinking about beer to talk. I realized Sarah was awfully quiet and wondered if she had been traumatized by almost getting gang raped. When I looked over my shoulder, I saw that she was simply sleeping. Perhaps surviving was a lot of work. Although she had told me that she was not actually going to marry her rescuer, I was somewhat curious, so I kept my voice low. Y'all got a house picked out yet? Walt grinned and matched my volume. I goddamn wish. She's one of them girls that ain't even gonna goddamn put out till we get hitched. I had expected this answer, but was still relieved. Yet I did my best to force a sympathetic expression for a friend who was forced to remain celibate. Perhaps Sarah had recently made some sort of chastity vow. We bumped from the asphalt of the road to the gravel driveway of my parents' home. The yard, including the garden, was surrounded by a chain-link fence with a drive through gate at the start of the driveway and a small walk-through gate on each of the four sides. One story and three bedrooms. The foundation of the house was a very wide rectangle. It resembled an exceptionally large double-wide trailer. I found it strange that the gate was open when we arrived. I remember that Tyler had radioed ahead and alerted my parents of our approach so they could have opened it. I briefly panicked that the property had been overrun by zombies. Seeing my mother make her way from the garden across the driveway to stand on the steps leading to the side door and waiting for the truck to stop made me almost slap myself. 
Pavey's unlocking and opening a gate? I'm an idiot. The truck stopped in the driveway, even with the steps to my parents' shop on the left and the side of the house to our right. Sarah woke as we turned into the driveway and the three of us exited the vehicle almost simultaneously. My parents owned and operated Heaven Sent Survival Food and Supply. It's the little store sitting opposite the house that sold freeze-dried food, water filters, fire starters, and various other camping equipment, including all kinds of expensive prepper shit. They opened the store a few years ago and advertised for people to prepare for natural disasters and power outages. I know that my dad has probably been having multiple orgasms every day since May Day. Truth be told, he has been dreaming about the zombie apocalypse. That was his real inspiration for starting Heaven Sent. I grinned upon seeing the store. Any freeze-dried food was better than fish. We didn't know where you were. Why didn't you call? My mother forcefully demanded with tears in her eyes. It was impossible to tell if she was mad at me or joyful. Maybe she was both. I was about to respond I was going to the day I got here, but my mother charged to hug me. Her short frame wrapped me in a good impersonation of a bear hug. She told me that she loved me and other emotional things that were muffled into my shoulder. It appeared that she was going to tackle me. I briefly contemplated sidestepping. I loved my mama, and I had no problem responding in kind. I just don't feel comfortable showing much affection or reciprocating any of that other stuff. When she finally pulled away, she moved to engross Sarah in a hug. She looked over to Walt with still teary-eyed. Did you find everything you needed, Dean? Whenever he talked to my mother, his state of perpetual drunkenness seemed to dissipate. He soberly replied, Yes, ma'am, and how you doing? I need to note a few obvious characteristics of my mother. She refers to everyone formerly, never once using anyone's nickname. Even though she was born in Marshall County and has spent almost all of her life here, she speaks proper English and with little accent. Her name is Debbie, and not Deborah. Her mother didn't want her to have a nickname, so she just gave her the shortened form. I never understood why, but she refuses to use the local slang of us country bumpkins. No living person, even upon their first mating, uses profanity in front of her. To anyone else, Walt would have responded, Goddamn right, and how the hell are you? But even someone who can barely finish a sentence without using at least three profanities is incapable of using improper language in conversation or even in the room with her. I can't decide if it's a sign of respect or if she actually puts fear into the hearts of grown men. But it's just a fact of life that you are a gentleman when talking to my mama. As you have most likely noticed, I enjoy using cuss words quite often but I cannot recall directly using any obscenities in conversation with my mother, ever, in my entire life. Though I'm sure she has heard more than one four-letter word exit my mouth, I have no clue how she would react if I did do so deliberately in her presence. I'm not about to find out. Walt and I flanked the two females up the steps, through the dining room which was separated by a bar from the kitchen on our left and into the office. The woman spoke in hushed tones as if either of us really cared to hear girl talk. This made me realize that my mother and Sarah had grown close since the end of the world. Even Mama had been aware for years of my hidden feelings for this girl. She tried to remain distant in an effort to let me work things out on my own. It really didn't make a difference because nothing ever happened. Now, though, they seemed to share a bond that came from being haphazardly forced together by the apocalypse and I was not surprised when I discovered that Sarah had been living with my parents as some sort of surrogate daughter. We entered the office to see my father sitting at a desk. He was writing on paper. I could instantly see why Randy Collins had become the community's leader during these times. The fact that he had two or three decades worth of food stored up might have something to do with it. The walls were lined floor to ceiling with maps of the country, state, county and even blown up versions of the town with areas on each highlighted green. These obviously designated safe zones and marked points of interest. My mother walked farther into the room. The rest of the group stopped after only a few steps inside the door. Randy? She called to get his attention. Time for another pet peeve of mine. My mother can call my father Randy with no qualms. Notice I must suffer the indignation of her always referring to me by my full name, Elmo. I can never catch a break. Yeah, 
He broke off as he lifted his head and saw me, doing exactly as I wanted him to do. No running to hug me, crying, or any other sort of emotional outbursts. He remained seated. His eyes grew wide in surprise, and he simply nodded his head. Mo? He said it as if he knew he was going to see me. I was respectful of his reserve, replying with my own nod. Daddy? I stepped forward as he stood. We shook hands. Although it was a warm, slightly extended shake that was the extent of our emotional reuniting. We might later discuss personal events since our last meeting, but neither saw a need to be too expressive. Walt came to my side in front of the desk with my father opposite. The fairer part of the group carried their own conversation into the dining room. Well, looks like ain't nobody else been there. Walt began. My father had obviously sent the self-proclaimed redneck on a simple reconnaissance mission. His report continued. Most of the groceries was still there, and I found keys for some of them trucks out back. Walt pointed in the direction of the dining room. Oh, she's got the grocery list. Good job, Walt. My father wasn't ignorant or naive. Was there any beer left? The man beside me looked at the ground and chuckled like he had just gotten busted. Yeah, I got me a couple cases. That was a gross underestimate of the quantity he had taken. It really didn't matter to my dad who skipped over the subject. He gestured for the two of us to each grab a folding chair. As we sat, he asked the inevitable. Where have you been, anyway? He was obviously asking me. I began. Well, after you dropped me off at the Cora in Chattanooga last year, we sailed all the way up to Minnesota. We were headed to the Gulf. The boat actually just docked in Guntersville when things started getting bad. I was going to call, but... The sentence trailed as I mumbled into embarrassed regret and shame. I felt unbelievably guilty that I had not made more of an effort to get in touch with Mama and Daddy. Now that I was here, I was hoping the fact that I was an asshole would be forgotten. My dad pointed to the dining room. It really tore her up. You need to go tell her that you've been trying your best to get here. And make it convincing or you'll be dealing with me. I was briefly confused if he was talking about my mom or Sarah. A moment of thought made me realize that of course he was referring to the woman that had given birth to me. It was obvious that I had crossed Sarah's mind, at least briefly, or she would not be here now. But I should have expected my mom to be upset that I might have been lost. She was always a bit overprotective of both of her offspring, especially the firstborn for some reason. I tried to think of something comforting to say to her. I was about to stand as she came into the room, followed by Sarah, so my apology would have to wait. My mother spoke to the entire room. Alma, you are going to stay the night with us, but you will have to sleep on the couch because Sarah has your old room. She ordered like she had already decided. There was no reason to argue. My feelings were mixed. I felt strange pride as if I were a teenage badass because I was having a hot chick sleep over at my house. Also, I felt childish at being commanded by my mom on where and when to sleep. On top of all that, I was mildly shocked and simultaneously angry and jealous because my room had been turned into the guest room. Easy's room had probably been turned into a museum for all of the first place trophies, medals, and awards he had received for winning at everything he did throughout his life. Seriously, he had been the best player on every team in every sport that was played in the area when we were kids. I'm not sure how, but I even remember seeing a hockey trophy. Fucking hockey! I have no idea why there would be a hockey arena in any state below the Mason-Dixon line. I can picture the walls of trophy cases and various mounted black belts. I'm still convinced some of those martial arts types are made-up words. Talk about childish. Here I am letting bitterness for my expertly talented brother distract me. Where was I? All right, my mom continued. We are having deer steaks for supper. Dean, you are welcome to stay. She looked at my friend, who, not surprisingly, turned down the offer. Thanks, but I gotta get home and drink some... I mean, I need to feed my chickens. Walt stood and abruptly excused himself to escape my mother, discovering the fact that he drank the devil's elixir. He was back in his truck down the driveway before I could even offer my hand. In recent times when my father was prepping... I recall my parents talking about Cherokee refrigerators. It's some kind of old Native American trick about lining holes in the ground with animal hides. I was guessing that was how they were keeping the meat for our venison steak fresh. 
My mother would never question a man's dedication to his chickens and walked out shortly after Walt to retrieve our uncooked supper. The refrigerators were probably in the small tool shed behind the store. The rest of the night was a blur from that point forward. I can't recall any specifics, only that I enjoyed being home. Before that night, I honestly do not remember the last time I was happy to be with my family. The fact that Sarah was there was not awkward and she contributed to our reminiscing. Again, I regretted not coming home sooner. Things quieted down and everyone was getting ready for bed. My mother had laid a pillow and a blanket on the couch and I sat down to remove my boots. Most of the lights were out as Sarah came out the hallway in a t-shirt and lounge pants. I had dreams similar to this for years. Of course, I was unable to smooth talk her as I did in my fantasies and could only look up confused. The object of my affection clasped her hands together. I missed you, Momo. I'm glad you're here. Sarah wasn't the total bastard I was. Though she had shown friendly affection to me before, this statement surprised and embarrassed me so that I was having trouble formulating the response. Before I could stammer out a goofy line, she spun on her bare feet and disappeared. I love you. Her final word came. This was unexpected. I doubt she heard my halt and quizzical reply. I love you too. As I said, this was not a completely new thing. She had shown platonic love in the past. I had known for years that she cared for me as a friend. Even though my prayers for more than that had always gone unanswered, I swear I detected more than just the fondness of a close friend in those words. Hopeful before, misunderstanding her friendship as some sort of declaration of passionate love, always been too much of a pussy to initiate any sort of decent reciprocation. It's embarrassing when I realize I'm just too hopeful and pathetically shy. Of course, even now with the world already over and we could die at any moment, I wouldn't dream of taking the initiative and telling her how I feel. Maybe I'll just have to wait and see what happens, as I've always done. Wait and see what happens. You can see how well that has turned out for me so far. 17. Mo, Journal Entry 16 Prophecy from the Book of Smokes In most but not all zombie epics, the similar is often referred to as a single character, yet can actually be any size group that resembles the main party. It is collectively a protagonist, and is somehow related to the original group of survivors. It has so much in common with the main group of protagonists that it might be called the Twin though it cannot possibly be mistaken for the other. Eventually, this second party will either go away or dissolve and leave characters to join the main survivors. I didn't feel extremely tired last night after I finished that last entry. Groggy, I didn't wake up until Mama hollered, Biscuits are ready! My parents don't have milking cows. It was flabbergasted and we were eating buttermilk biscuits fresh out of the wood-burning stove. I'm going to have to remember to ask her how the hell she has any sort of dairy product after days of no electricity. Freeze-dried biscuits? After breakfast, my mother and Sarah headed to the garden. I followed my father into the office where he pulled a radio from its solar charging cradle by the window. One of more than a dozen he had stockpiled. Hey, Doc. He spoke in the radio. Soon he received a reply. I read you. Now let me say it again. I'm not racist. I could immediately tell that the guy on the other end of the radio was Indian. When I say Indian, I mean dot on the forehead and cows Indian, not feathers and buffalo Indian. The accent was so thick that I could barely understand the three simple words. Sorry for the stereotype, but I could honestly picture the voice saying, Thank you, come again. My dad continued. Could you pick up Bob and stop by the house in a little bit? I want you to come meet my oldest. We can do that. Until then. Daddy smiled despite his irritation. Sounds good, Doc. Over and out. When he began preparing to survive the end of the world, my father became a stickler for proper radio etiquette. Though he was just a year or two too young for Vietnam, he constantly used correct military lingo over the radio. Laying his walkie-talkie on the desk, he filled me in. Philip George was the cardiologist at the hospital. My father paused for questions. I obliged. A cardiologist lives around here? My dad shook his head. 
Well, he didn't until a few days ago. His family was visiting his sister-in-law down the road when the zombies came through. This was the first time I heard my father speak of the infected. Since I'd been safe in my parents' well-protected house, I hadn't given them a thought. It was easy to forget that the world was dying when things seemed so normal. I took in a breath at the remembrance of the plague. I opened my mouth to ask another question that was answered before it was paused. Yes, he is Indian. He said his wife is Mrs. Duckett's sister. I would have expected something like Kumar, Mahatma, Rajis, or Sanjay. Something that sounded a little more Indian. But his name? My father snorted. Yeah, I know. Something about the part of India he's from being predominantly Christian. He explained it to me, but I can't really understand most of what he says. Well, at least it's not just me. So he was supposed to pick up Bob? I tried to think of anyone close with that name. Bob? Roberto Martinez? He shouted a finger at me. That's the one. Bob is a short Hispanic man in his early 40s. He moved to the area about 20 years ago from old Mexico. Regardless of how long he's lived around Americans, I don't think his accent will ever be any more understandable than the doctor's. Other than the fact that Bob lived close by, I knew little of the diminutive bachelor beyond his background as a whiz mechanic. Even without Smokes present, I believe he has educated me enough that I could label my father's group of survivals as the similar. My dad was obviously the expert, Walt is the old friend, and I would soon meet the medicine man in the tech. Smokes never said two characters can't duly hold the label. Could one be the betrayer? That brings another pertinent question to mind. What role does Crow play? I will have to get the answers from the Oracle when I return to the ship. Also, I must point out that I am unsure of Walt's role. He is a former schoolmate, friend of mine, but also a rival for the love interest. Seems he fits better into our crew than Daddy's. Could he be the old friend for me? Can there be more than one? Does that mean Bradley's going to die? Shit, maybe Bradley will turn out to be the villain. Better keep my eye on him. I've got to remember to clear this up with the one who has all the answers. Maybe I should stop asking myself questions I can't work out. 18. Mo. Journal Entry 17. Do y'all have anybody who can work the dam? I wasn't too hopeful, but it couldn't hurt to ask. Maybe the screenwriter would be smiling down on me. It was expected an awful lot, so it wasn't really a letdown. Not that I know of. Why, you got somewhere to be? My dad asked. I chuckled. No, I don't think we got another stop in the itinerary. I just want to know that we can get out of here if we need to. As if to prove I wasn't in a hurry, I added, and we'll still be eating this damn lake fish no matter what. Is that irony? We are safe from the peavies in a boat. That is, unless they learn to swim, but we'll just have to wish for death and force down seafood for the rest of our lives. Well, you are on a boat. He chuckled. I would never have guessed fish would be the most easily accessible meal when living on waterways. I hung my head. He couldn't understand. His after Armageddon diet of biscuits, eggs, and homemade dishes had spoiled him beyond being able to grasp the torture of my soul staple. I shook thoughts of my hideous meal plan from my mind and offered, Y'all need to come down to the Cora for a visit when I leave here. My dad clicked his tongue. I might just take you up on that. Things are getting pretty settled around here, and I ought to be able to afford a couple days off. I'll have to ask your mama, of course, but I'm pretty sure she'll be up for it. He ended to allow me to speak and then quickly tacked on, oh, and maybe we can set up some kind of trade agreement while I'm down there. That would be pretty cool. I could imagine a trade route like in Fallout. I just needed to figure out how to fast travel. Before I go any further, did anyone else notice that my dad, as all locals would have, was able to tell that my first reference to y'all encompassed the entire community while my second utterance of the word applied to just my family? It has to do with voice inflection. Sorry for the digression. Back to the story. I'm not sure if he realized I now considered Sarah part of the family group. I haven't even been here 24 hours, but I can already see that my parents, my mother especially, needed her with both Collins' children's MIA. Though not blood-related, she has obviously become a surrogate in our stead. Is it strange that I have been in love with the girl that is now my adopted sister? Well, after all, it is Alabama. 
Anyway, I wanted her to come to the Cora. I knew there would be no romantic reunion between the two of us. I'll just miss my best female friend and figure we might catch up before either of us were somehow killed by Peavy's. I decided that now, while we were alone, was the best time to ask my father about something that had been weighing on my mind ever since I had returned to my childhood home. So, easy? I let my question trail, knowing he would immediately realize I was asking about my brother, Ezekiel. He looked away and mumbled. Nothing. We haven't heard a thing. Just like we didn't hear from you. He turned back to me with lifted spirits. But here you are. I'm still hoping. You never know. Yeah, I guess you don't. It really wouldn't surprise me if he walked here from his dorm at UAB with absolutely no weapons. Easy would be defending himself in a group of minority children with nothing but his hands and his winning personality. As unlikely as survival seems, being bitten is something that you would expect to happen to a normal person. Easy is probably immune and has somehow used his blood to create a vaccine that will eventually save the world. If I haven't been clear enough, Easy is the culmination of everything perfect. The marble statue that every straight guy secretly wishes he could be. The Herculean model in every woman's head when he shuts her door, lights candles, and listens to Sting. At some point, I knew I was going to have to get to Birmingham and try to find my brother. It won't be difficult to find him. It was a given that he would be leading the successful city's worth of people. I guess Smokes was dead on about the raisins. That will be explained in my next entry. A polite knocking came at the front door. My dad called. It's unlocked. This proved that the visitor had not been to this house many times. The side door was the main entrance used by anyone who had been here more than a couple times. In came two parts of the similar. The first that entered was a tall, dark, and sinewy man who was obviously Dr. George. Next came the welcome side of the short, dark, and pudgy Bob. They entered the opposite side of the office nearest the front door. The doctor a little too enthusiastically shook hands and greeted my father. Somehow still socially awkward, Bob did not approach to shake hands, but stood near the chair where the doctor sat. Hola, Effie. When I asked the meaning of that word later, my dad said that his Spanish to English dictionary translated the word to chief or boss. I learned something new every day. I was just glad it didn't translate to governor. I didn't realize how much I missed my Mexican neighbor. He was extremely likable. Bob wore random baseball caps, had a Saddam Hussein mustache and scruffy hair, wore a scruffy flannel shirt and jeans, and was completely ageless. He had appeared to be between 35 and 45 for as long as I'd known him. I don't recall him once stating any political or religious preferences. His ethnic name, appearance, and Speedy Gonzalez accent made him the epitome of a stereotypical Mexican. That reminds me, why the hell does modern society view Speedy Gonzalez as racist? When I was a kid, he was just part of Looney Tunes. It never crossed my mind to compare Spanish-speaking peoples to the cartoon character. I'm from rural Alabama. There have been Hispanics around me my entire life. Speedy Gonzalez was never the base for my opinion of anyone. It goes without saying I learned more Spanish from that cartoon character than I ever did from high school Spanish class. It was no easier to guess the age of the seated cardiologist. His equally dark hair and smooth face left me wondering. So I simply assumed he was somewhere around the perpetual age of the Latino mechanic. I didn't know why, and I don't think I'm the only person who cannot correctly discern the age of a racial minorities. Maybe I am racist, and I just don't know it. I nodded and grinned from across the room to the reciprocation of the doctor. Even if my dad had not told me Philip George's profession, it would have been easy to figure out because the man was wearing a fucking doctor's coat. Sure, it was probably handy for carrying things, but it seems like an over-the-top way to let everyone know that you are a doctor if you are not actually working. And it's not even slightly cold outside, so he's not wearing the coat for warmth. Shit, maybe he's just stopping here before making house calls. That's probably why he has a stethoscope. Maybe I'm just a racist dick who also reads too much into first impressions. Okay, I just reread this entry. It's easy to verify where I'd call me a racist. All I've done is talk about the cultural differences between these two and myself. God, I hope Crow never reads this.
Anyway, after our introduction, Dr. George excused himself to go make rounds and see patients. What was the point in him coming here? He honestly didn't do anything more than just meet me. It's not like I would have been able to understand him if he had talked, so maybe it was a blessing. Truck leaking. You fix? My dad asked the mechanic. Bob gave the obligatory response. See, si, Hefe. Our diminutive neighbor walked in the direction of the back door and the truck beyond. It's somewhat humorous, albeit annoying that my father always talks to non-English speakers in clipped, exaggeratedly slow, broken sentences, as if it's going to make a damn bit of difference. Anyway, if he had spoken to Bob as if he were speaking to me, I'm betting Bob would not have given a different answer. My dad isn't overtly racist, it's just the way he communicates with foreigners. Hell, I saw him speak to a Frenchman at Six Flags like that. The guy almost slapped him across the face. He was facing me in the door behind me. I had to say it. I figure I've just met your tech and your medicine man. I saw no need in giving him the entire cast rundown or mentioning the role of a token. I continued. You could be the expert and maybe the main protagonist, but where is the innocent or the man of God or... I trailed off, realizing that my dad would have no fucking clue what I was talking about. He stammered. Man of God. I haven't seen Brother Morris since the Sunday before. He didn't need to say before or what. It would have taken entirely too long to explain everything. I had a feeling I would sound like an idiot compared to the Oracle, so I decided to abruptly change subjects. So I kind of need you to go ahead and tell Mom and y'all are coming down to Guntersville with me. Hammer told me I needed to be back by tonight, and I want y'all to come with me. He began walking. Hammer. I grinned. Nickname. She's some kind of super black ops Delta Force secret agent Soviet slayer. Captain Petunia Sledge. She lives on the boat with us. I'll introduce you to her and everybody else when we get there. My dad seemed in awe. Like Sledgehammer? My eyebrows shot up. I knew we were on the same wavelength on this one. I thought the same thing. I keep forgetting to ask her. I think my dad will have a lot in common with our expert. He nodded in understanding as he made a wide arc around me to the door. I rotated to follow him and grunted. You know I meant for you to bring Sarah, right? He almost chuckled. Yeah, I guess that. Opening the door, he turned. I'll be back in a little bit. It's about lunchtime. Really? I had not realized how much time had passed, and I wasn't very hungry. I can always eat, though, and I might as well stuff myself with good food before I have to go back to the all-and-only-thing-you-can-eat buffet. I sat at the kitchen table waiting for the return of my father, and in complete silence, it was normally peaceful in the boonies. But the fact that this couldn't really be an extinction event made the stillness and quiet seem depressingly better. It could have been hours before my reverie was interrupted, probably more like 20 minutes. My mom walked in like it was just another Sunday. It's been years since we've been on a family vacation. Sarah and I can get a tan while the two of you fish. Later we can all go swimming. Not sure if she was speaking to me, I just nodded my head and smiled. We live in the same county as the lake. She was acting as if we had never been anywhere near a body of water and can barely fathom the possibilities for fun. My mother's American Indian ancestry is prominent enough that she doesn't really need to get a tan. I'm not sure about Sarah. My mom will always find a way to work rather than rest, and frankly, I'm counting on her spending most of the time teaching Crow how to cook. I believe the Cora cook had already caught enough fish to fill a freezer, so fishing was pretty pointless. Since I've been around the wake basically my entire life and had seen how fucking disgusting the water is, I wouldn't be swimming in it unless I was on fire. I have seen people ship directly into the water from their boats and dump piles of steaming garbage from the shore. Eating fish from the lake after the impurities have been cooked away is probably safe enough. But swimming? Well, that's a different story. I just don't feel like getting an incurable disease from immersing myself in a giant petri dish of malevolent bacteria. Am I wrong here? I wouldn't let my dog drink out of that sewer. One is more likely to get a deadly infection from being splashed with that water than if they were to swap spit with a PV. You know how once you've worked at a fast food restaurant you can barely bring yourself to eat the food there? It's kind of like that. I live near the tourist attraction, and I'm sorry, future Guntersville Lakebound, 
it's not as pretty as the pictures. I guess I'm jaded. Okay, it's pretty, just not safe to drink. I cannot argue about something like this with my mom. The best thing anyone can do is smile and nod. I'm sure you've noticed by now that most communication between my mother and me consists of her rambling on and on and my smiling and nodding. It's what works. She continued telling me how much fun we were going to have. Because my mom talking at length about things that are not important is an everyday occurrence in the Collins home, I've trained myself over the years to ignore most of the things I don't care about. I did pick up her saying something about their accommodations. I fully understand that she said we would be having roast and potatoes for lunch. Damn it, I had not even thought about that. I could not make my parents sleep in the communal crew quarters with people they don't know. My mom would die before she let a legally and biologically unrelated female, especially one that I am madly in love with, sleep behind the same door as me. I guess they'll get to sleep in my room. Maybe Sarah can make a pallet on the floor with extra blankets. I'll bunk with the other survivors. Shit, that almost made me reconsider the invitation. Roast and potatoes? What the hell? For all of my adult life, Mom had always found a reason to be too busy to cook often. It took the near annihilation of humankind for her to decide to become a full-time chef. Someone around here must be slaughtering cows and bartering the meat. The meal and the fellowship were just as enjoyable as the night before. It was even topped off with banana pudding. Banana fucking pudding. I'm not even going to ask how the hell they are keeping bananas fresh after the zombie apocalypse. I'm just going to thank the screenwriter for the unbelievably awesome dessert. When I pushed myself away from the table, my mother was overjoyed. The three of us need to go pack. Just wait here, Elmo. I grimaced at the use of my full first name. Maybe I should have expected it with my mother's primal abhorrence to nicknames. Bob is always Roberto, Walt is Dean, and I am Elmo. I'm pretty sure Smokes is not going to have much of a dialogue with her. The fact that he cannot help but refer to everyone as cracker and motherfucker will definitely mean conversation between these two will be short. Once she calls him Marlin, that's probably the last time they'll speak. It was almost comical that my family was packing suitcases for a vacation less than 30 minutes away. I characteristically nodded my head and smiled as they all exited the room. This won't be anything but fun. I've been working on this entry for over an hour now. When the vacationers emerge ready for a trip, we will probably need to go ahead and leave before we lose our momentum. I'm guessing my dad talked to the rest of the similar over the radio while in his room and discussed the reasoning behind his short getaway, which I'm sure will be more than just a father-son bonding experience. He must have assigned leadership in his stead and all of that good shit. So I don't see any reason we really need to stay here any longer. 19. Mo. Journal Entry 18. Prophecy from the Book of Smokes. In every epic, the lead protagonist always has a reason for staying where he currently is. Once he feels he has completed his mission to the best of his ability, he ultimately has a reason. One of the reasons. A purpose that makes him leave his predicament, thrusting himself into new surroundings, undoubtedly meeting new characters. His reason for remaining could possibly be to rescue the love of his life. Once that task is complete, his priority will be to reach a safe haven where the couple can live out their days in relative peace. He may stay in his position to simply save a friend or a town, but may inevitably depart at some point to save another friend or another town. Regardless of specifics, the main character is compelled to stay until a certain point when he knows he must move on. Amazingly, I have found both my parents and the woman I've been madly in love with for years all alive and well. Surprisingly, they were all living in the same house. Yet again, the Oracle proves he has already seen this movie. Now that I know they're safe, my goal is to stupidly, unselfishly abandon the safety I've surrounded myself with, find a way to Birmingham, and look for my brother. My parents clearly live in the sticks and could live off the land indefinitely. In truth, they have never feared the end of the world, and seem to be tolerating it rather well. My dad has safes full of guns and is an avid hunter. My mom was educated by her parents in the old school ways and can sew, 
cook anything, and whatever she plants grows like a weed in her garden. On top of that, they've got enough freeze-dried food stashed away in stock for the store that they would never have to eat anything else. Though we have had our many disagreements, my parents are two of the smartest people I know. I feel stupid to have even considered they could have possibly been among those morons overtaken by the wave of the undead. As I already mentioned, my younger brother Ezekiel has always been the perfect son. Too cool to use a common and obvious nickname like Zeke, at some point after beginning peewee football, he was christened Easy. He was the athletic superstar of my small county school. He was regularly featured in almost every edition of the local newspaper for every sport Douglas High School ran. There were articles about Easy's entire career, from his unprecedented leading of the varsity track team while still in 8th grade, to the knee injury that destroyed his chances of a scholarship and a future in sports at the end of his senior year. But that life-changing injury did not slow him down. He became a bodybuilder who had time to be a full-time student and a part-time personal trainer. And ladies, Easy can simply ask politely, and any woman will immediately strip naked. He lives, or lives, I hope, in the dorms of UAB, and makes enough money to live unbelievably comfortably. I have always wondered why the hell he bothers with school. I especially cannot begin to understand the reason he lives in a dorm instead of a mansion with an armed security team, guest rooms for his concubines, and an Olympic-sized pool. Maybe he's one of those strange individuals with life goals who doesn't like to be alone. Of course, much of Easy's success has come from academic scholarship and intramural sports. Maybe he just likes school. I cannot deny that I am somewhat jealous. Everything has always been easy for Easy. Women, physique, money, cars, grades. While I feel like I got slapped with a mediocrity stick at birth. I am not sure how it is humanly possible with my mother's family swearing to have American Indian ancestry. I ended up one of the whitest non-albino Caucasians alive. If I did not so closely resemble my grandfather's in appearance, I could easily assume that I was adopted. I am so pale that I nearly glow, but neither of my parents come close to my near-translucent skin tone. Naturally, all of my mom's Indian genes were obviously saved for easy. Once, he was pulled over by the cops because the ungodly attractive female officer initially thought that he could be an illegal immigrant. He also uses some of the wads of money that beautiful women throw at him to make trips to the tanning salon. I do not believe this is a very masculine way to improve one's appearance, but he's the one with potentially more illegitimate children than Benjamin Franklin. I doubt the opinion of mere mortals such as myself means much to someone like AZ. Mama and Daddy would both deny it, but Easy is hands down my parents' favorite. By high school, it was ridiculously obvious. When I was 15, I worked after school, bagging groceries for the entire year to earn enough money to buy my very own piece of shit rusted out, nothing more than a mode of transportation car. Of course, they made more than a down payment on Easy's. Not fresh off a lot, but built within the past decade sports car. I used to have a joke with my friends that if I was not home before the moon rose on a weeknight, I would get my ass whooped even during my senior year. My 16-year-old freshman brother did whatever he wanted to do until at least midnight. I could give several more examples of the blatant favoritism shown to my sibling, and I'll more than likely detail some examples throughout this journal. A couple of notes come immediately to mind, though. I realize my parents could have simply used the gas money wasted on driving me to and from work on my vehicle. I guess they just wanted me to suffer to earn my wheels, and I almost view with a sense of pride the fact that no automobile I've ever owned has featured a CD player. I am a bare necessities type of guy. Tanning booths? Who does that? After these envy-laden descriptions of my younger brother, you may suspect that I hate him, but you would be very wrong. I'll admit that while I dislike my brother, and undoubtedly that dislike springs from jealousy of his natural talent at everything, I actually love Easy. I would not say this to him for anything, and would vehemently deny it to his face, but I am sure he knows. I guess it was just the way I was raised. Blood is thicker than water. I'm certain we would have barely known each other's name in a high school of less than 500 students if we had not been closely related. But I would defend Easy if I ever felt that I needed to. 
I'm not a muscular jujitsu, karate, taekwondo, whatever the hell else kind of Bruce Lee fighting skills there are, like he is. But I could surely throw some fairly mean and hurtful words in your direction, or slap you with an insult that would leave a mark. 20. Mo, Journal Entry 19 Hammer had given me a radio along with a tactical vest upon our first meeting. I used the radio to contact the Cora crew when we were within two miles of the boat. These walkie-talkies could not come close to the quality of my dad's radios with a range of up to ten miles. He had to have bought these either on clearance or from a moron, because I seriously doubt he paid the hundreds of dollars each is worth. He had never been hardcore about his survivalist activities, and he certainly wasn't rich. Rusty Nail, this is Candy Cane, do you read me? I pitched my voice fairly high, imitating the scene from the movie Joyride. I was feeling pretty jovial. My life had been going phenomenally well considering the death of the entire planet. I had survived Armageddon, had stumbled upon other survivors with very useful skills, walked into a fully stocked and unmolested Walmart, discovered the love of my life and my parents together and safe. It seemed okay to joke around. Apparently, Smokes didn't catch the reference. Motherfucker, I know it, you. Where the fuck you at? If he had given me the opportunity, I would have warned him to watch his language with my mother listening. Until now, I don't recall witnessing anyone actually using profanity within earshot of my mom. There's absolutely no way she could have missed that. I was dumbfounded when she completely ignored it as if it had not happened. This was an intriguing development. I would have to remember to test it out again later. Who the hell gave Smokes the radio anyway? What if the Red Cross came on to our radio frequency to offer help and decided not to send a rescue helicopter after they were mean-mouthed by some racist asshole on the radio? I was caught between being offended at his scathing tone and total disbelief at the fact that my mom now had some sort of obscenity filter implanted in her brain. I shook my head before simply answering, I'm at the Magnolia now. Be there in a minute. Go ahead and drop the gangplank for me. It would probably cause my dad to question my worth as a man, but I did not intend to end the conversation with over and out. I did add, Oh, and I got some visitors with me. Three. He didn't miss a beat. I don't give a shit how many fucking white devils you bring with you. I ain't scared. You wouldn't know it if you had never met him. It even took me a moment to realize the entire conversation was in jest. We were traveling in my mom's Corolla. It seemed spacious. There was a Katy Perry CD playing just audibly. I looked in the mirror for the disgusting and horrified face Mama had to be making. It was impossible that my fellow vehicle occupants were unaware of the shrill vulgarity spilling over the radio. Again, nothing. She had to be willfully blocking the words. I must briefly broach a topic that deeply troubles me as a person. Katy Perry. I'm not denying that she has a phenomenal ass. It really makes no difference to me if she survived the zombie apocalypse. My problem is that she ever became a popular singer and that her inane noisemaking, which my mom considers music, survived. Humanity is an endangered species. We should be listening to something badass like ACDC or Pink Floyd. The soundtrack as we ride to our possible demise must include fucking Dark Horse. If we do actually survive and repopulate the planet, I'm going to make sure pop shit like this never happens again. When I go down in a blaze of glory, I want my moviegoers to hear something epic and unforgettable, not teenage dream. If we succeed in defeating the zombies and miraculously invent a cure, I refuse to have the celebration scene of rejoicing civilians under bright and popping fireworks to fade to black with the ear-splitting firework. Our car ride featured sparse dialogue. No one broke the silence with commentary on the seemingly unrated gas stations, lack of bodies, or abandoned vehicles we passed. I always found it unforgivably rude when someone in the car with you carries on a ridiculously long conversation on their cell phone leaving you basically alone while sitting right beside the person. I would never mention it to her, but my mother has committed this crime more than anyone I have ever met, and it pisses me off to this day. I've been tempted to rip her phone from her ear and throw it out the damn window.
Well, I felt that I might now be doing the same thing while on the radio. But if I hadn't thought it was necessary, I wouldn't have even made the call. It doesn't bother me to be an ass, but I really try to avoid being a hypocrite, considering it is another one of my many pet peeves. Almost all of the gas stations we passed were completely unmolested, and this begs the question, why? Had every single person been morally bettered because of the zombie apocalypse? Did realizing there were so few people left cause everyone to show Christian decency? That or even criminals were taken so quickly by the wave of undead that burglarizing did not have time to occur. The scarce pockets of survivors only took what they needed and fled, conserving for later. On Guntersville Island, a few businesses had been raided, but I assume that had something to do with the population density and the fact that the zombies were only able to reach the island through a few choke points. We passed the courthouse. I was actually just about to tell my dad to slow down when I saw the local coffee shop, Jamocas. Maybe Hammer's insane denial is contagious. It took me a second to snap back into reality. There would be no barista running the French press. I sighed and stored this location in my memory banks. I would have to stop by here at the next opportunity and see if there were any Tattoo's coffee beans left. I love me some of that dark stuff. At the end of our quiet car ride, my dad entered the small parking lot at the marina. I noticed not only the Gorgon and the Walmart 18-wheeler, but also the unexpected addition of a new off-the-lot Cadillac Escalade and a Frito-Lay 18-wheeler. Scratch that. Knowing my crew members, I should have fully expected the Escalade, and I guess the expert had retrieved the Frito-Lay truck. I would not have been surprised if the Batmobile or a pod racer were in the next parking spot waiting for the tech. We parked and made our way from our vehicle to the dock beside the Cora. Then I realized the gangplank had not been lowered. After a few minutes of hollering, I finally got the attention of Crow, who peered down at me. In her normal bitchy tone, she asked me, What the fuck you want, white boy? I'm here to sell vacuums. What the fuck do you think I want, dumbass? I assume Smokes forgot to tell you to lower the damn gangplank. Smokes? Jesus, I hope he didn't hear that. I don't want to have to talk him out of committing suicide by jumping off the boat. The fat black dude. Just let us in. I tacked on for emphasis. And if you throw down the rope ladder instead, I'll set the boat on fire. She turned and began screaming at other crew members to lower the gangplank. I gestured to my family to follow me. As we walked up the gangplank, I realized that this would be my parents' first trip to the Viva Ancora. Before I could show them around, I would have to get an update from my crew on recent developments. After we made it onto the deck, it was obvious that there had been some construction going on. A small building that looked like a tiny shed had been put together on the deck. It immediately reminded me of a greenhouse my pawpaw had in his backyard. I instinctively knew that this was Bradley's quarters. Though I had expected such a construct and was aware that it was necessary, I cringed when I noticed nails driven into the deck. There was obviously no other way to secure any sort of building onto the boat. It just bothered me that a pristine replica like the Cora had been treated like a back porch. It would be like attaching a green replacement door onto a cherry red classic convertible Corvette. You know the door is needed, it's just temporarily so damn offensive to the eyes. And no, I'm not talking about the three mismatched doors on my worthless Ford Taurus. That ugly thing was offensive to the eyes when it came off the assembly line. My parents and Sarah slowed behind me, finding something to become interested in as we approached the table occupied by the male crewman that I had parted ways with a day earlier. I was not surprised that the trio was engaged in a heated argument. Now I understood why my family had chosen not to intrude. Cause vampires is dead, stupid fucking cracker. Living just mean they look live. I'm a Jedi mind meld you to death. Smokes ended an insult to Eugene. I could see fire behind the text lenses. He was offended by the multitude of obvious universal breaches in canon. I am stuck in some sort of fucked up, undead, that 70s show-esque nightmare like Tom Cruise in Vanilla Sky. Remember that 70s show? They all sit around the table, get stoned, and eventually end up talking about the same car that runs on water. This was just like that, minus the recreational drugs and can studio audience laughter. Oh, plus we had the threat of horrifying death and no FCC to censor Smoke's colorful dialogue. I greeted all three. 
they took a breather and gave me notice. The trio greeted me with arbitrary platitudes. Our conversations were short and meaningless. I looked at Smokes. Fucking thanks a lot, dick. Man, fuck you, white bread. I was busy doing shit. Ain't huge, thanks for asking. I raised an eyebrow at his final statement. He knew what I was talking about. It wasn't that it had slipped his mind. He just didn't want to get off his fat ass or even tell someone else to lower the damn gangplank. The busiest he has been on this boat has been performing the strenuous task of walking to the fucking bow and pissing into the lake. I was using profanity and my mother was within the one mile radius, so my volume was instinctively lowered. I felt it was my duty to notify all present that my mom was within hearing distance. Dude, take it easy with the language. My mama is here. That was usually all the warning I needed to give. That was sure as hell all the oracle was going to get anyway. As attention from the recent debate visibly lifted, my family group moved toward us. Smokes made a show of walking around me to greet the new arrivals. It's nice to finally meet you. Mo has told me so much about you. Bullshit. I don't even recall telling him my parents' names. He said this as he vigorously shook my father's hand and leaned over to hug my mother's neck. If we had not run into her at Walmart yesterday, he probably would have assumed that Sarah was my sister. By the way, I'm pretty sure that's the first time Smokes had called me anything besides motherfucker or some type of racist slur. Our interracial lesbian couple spontaneously appeared nearby as the Oracle introduced everyone. Sincerely, I was impressed he knew the entire crew in such detail, though I began to doubt his knowledge of each person when he said that his good friend Eugene and Captain Sledge shared a birthday. When Hammer and Jean nodded their heads in agreement, it was difficult to say that he was making it up. I will be right back with our food. Petunia? Crow gestured for the expert to follow as she made her way to retrieve what I correctly assumed was fish. Smoke simultaneously moved to grab three of the folding lawn chairs from Crow's usual fishing spot. Why the fuck are these bastards suddenly saints? Because my parents are here? We all had that friend in high school, the one whose younger brother was a some bitch that would do evil shit like hide all the toilet paper or put dog turds in your food. Then turn around and tell your mother she looked like she'd lost weight. And wasn't she celebrating her 29th birthday this year? This was like that. Okay, maybe the last example didn't apply to you, but I actually started carrying my own roll of toilet paper when I went to a certain friend's house. So you own the comic book store? My dad looked at Jean as my parents sat. Yes, sir. You're welcome to come by sometime. I think I'll do that. Would you be able to tell me the value of some classic comics? I have a few in pretty mint condition. My dad left that sentence hanging. Jean excitedly offered. I collect all kinds of things. If you could bring them by the shop sometime, I'll take a look at them. My father gave a friendly grunt that signaled agreement and intrigue. Were they really discussing the sale of comic books after the apocalypse? I understand the theory that acting as if life were normal helps everyone cope, but come the hell on. This conversation was about as productive as if they were planning to rob a bank. On the far side of the table, my mom and Sarah were in a conversation with Bradley that I was unable to make out as the two fish bearers returned with our meal. My dad looked up from his chair at Hammer. Mo told us that you run the pawn shop. He began and gestured with his chin in the direction of bottom dollar to the nod of the expert. I bought my favorite SKS there. You think you can get me a deal on at least one more? Hammer thought for a second and then nodded. Well, I don't have any in stock right now, but I know a guy who spends a lot at gun shows. I'll get with him and let you know. My dad smiled. Sounds good. Can't wait. Holy shit, Daddy. This woman was already at the fragile state of insane denial. Don't encourage her. I was fairly certain that he was coherent and understood what was happening and was only making normal conversation but I was still going to have to remember to have the man-to-man -man with him to be absolutely positive that he had not also lost his mind. While Hammer had dozens of AR-15s at her disposal, my father had decided to load up on SKSs for his after-Armageddon armory. He told me that he wanted a bit more punch than one of those little 22 size 556 bullets offered. I jokingly questioned his masculinity at this. Yeah, a 308 could reach out and touch somebody, but if you really had to shoot at a zombie, it would probably already be coming at you and it wouldn't be a one-mile shot. 
ARs and SKSs are both beautiful guns. Don't get me wrong. I just think my Marlin 17-inch Amar lever action is better for this particular situation. It is accurate as hell and packs more than enough punch. Another plus is that the discharge is no louder than the average stapler. I just hope it's still in one of Daddy's safes and he didn't throw it away or sell it to make more room for his armory of 762. Once, I got a rabbit with that thing from probably 400 yards. The only part of it that I could find was its tail. That tiny piece of lead basically vaporizes anything it touches. Zombies are pretty much naked people, so even at a distance you wouldn't need armor-piercing elephant gun rounds. 21. Mo. Journal Entry 20. Everyone at the table was talking. There were at least four conversations going on at the same time, which generally bothers me. This is one of those pet peeves that is completely unfounded and illogical. I don't believe I have ever voiced my irritation about it. People fellowship when given the opportunity, so in understanding, I have always suffered in silence. Given the fact that any of us could die horribly and painfully at any moment, I uncharacteristically chose to join in on several discussions. I am one of those people who enjoy total silence and could live happily in utter quiet most of the time. I understand how crow can fish in silence all day. It's kind of weird for a female, but I guess that's one reason she plays for the other team. It just so happened at that moment a peavy was heard groaning. We looked over the side of the boat to witness it trying to run down a dog for its evening meal. We watched as it chased the poor animal across the southbound side of the river bridge. When the canine gave a cry, I chose not to think about it being someone's pet, but just a wild beast. In an effort to ignore the death throes of the canine, we turned back to our conversations. It would be better for my psyche to think of it as a big cat. I looked down the table. Hey, Crow. When she leveled her attention on me, I gestured at my mom. Mama's going to show you some new tricks on how to cook fish. I was really hoping that she was just going to show her how to cook anything besides fish. Her eyes were screaming silent obscenities at me. Motherfucker, you got a problem with my fish? I kill a white boy. But all that came out was a sweet and innocent. That sounds great. Thanks, Mrs. Collins. I stood from the table when I realized I needed to drain the main vein, instantly understanding that my usual ritual of pissing off the side of the boat wouldn't be happening. My mother would notice and make me feel like less than dog shit for being rude or not taking the time to show proper respect in mixed company. Of course, the only way I could reply would be to guiltily smile as if I understood the error of my ways and would forever try to be a better person than not. She inherited it from my nana, her mother, it being the ability to make anyone she scolds immediately feel like they do not deserve to exist. Her words are not necessarily hateful or even particularly mean. But coming from her, any admonition is excruciatingly worse than from anyone else. Even as a child, whenever I did something wrong, I would rather be beaten with an extension cord until several bones were broken than endure the unbearable torture that is a brief tongue lashing from my mother. I'm going to make a note to build some type of toilet inside of a stall on deck so I won't have to take 15 minutes getting to a damn commode. We can even make the toilet handicap accessible so that Bradley can use it. Then no one will question why it's being installed and cannot point to my laziness as the true reason. As I made my way to the stairs that led below deck, Gene appeared from seemingly nowhere as if he were Star Trek's omnipotent Q. Psst, Amo! He gestured for me to approach. I decided I could control my bladder for a little while longer. Yeah, man? I wasn't sure why he felt the need to whisper, but inspired in me to need to speak softly. Do you think we can go to my house tomorrow? I was going to get the Admiral to take me today, but stuff just kept coming up. The tech used this name for Hammer because his inner geek identifies her with Admiral Dalla. I felt ashamed, like I had lied to the kid. Now he was calling Hammer the Admiral. I guess she had trumped my rank while I'd been gone. Shit, I'm sorry, dude. We will definitely go tomorrow. I promised. I wanted to spend time with my parents, but I had already made a commitment. Even though I am pretty lazy, I could not keep putting him off. What if his home was raided while we sat out here eating Pringles? I'd feel horrible. I did my business and went back to the mail. The most memorable conversation I took part in during the feast was when I looked over to Smokes. 
I asked with a chuckle. So were the spinners and marijuana leaf decals already on the purple Escalade when you boosted it from the dealership? I was pretty sure he'd picked it up from the Cadillac dealership right across the highway from Walmart. I didn't remember seeing that specific color choice on the lot. I wasn't accusing him of wrongdoing by referring to his taking of the vehicle as boosting, but as if he thought I was calling him a thief, his chest swelled with pride. He was visibly straining in an attempt to use appropriate language in the presence of my mother. Heck no, man. I had to find my cousin's shop up on the hill to get this stuff and put it on there my dang self. Other than his dictation of the zombie gospel, this was probably the longest stringing together of words in which he had not used my fucker. He probably couldn't keep it up much longer. Smokes detailed the speaker system and entertainment setup that he had installed to those of us who had not been present when he rolled up to the Cora. I was fairly certain that he had neglected to mention that Gene had traveled with him and the tech did the majority of the electronics work on his new pimp-ass ride. So it was already purple? I had no problem with the color, I just imagined that I would have noticed the neon purple behemoth at the dealership before now. For all I knew, Smokes was rich as hell and had ordered the damn thing himself. He narrowed his eyes and pushed himself to his feet. You got a problem with that, homie? He pointed a finger at me, and I could do nothing but look around as he continued to lie into me. You see a purple Escalade, you think a black man behind the wheel and probably boosted it. You racist! I will admit that while I am not bigoted, I do unintentionally racially profile, so yes, I would expect the driver of a purple Escalade with a vanity plate that I later witnessed said TKT2THD to be black. I was seriously proud of him for not using one single profanity throughout his tirade. As I debated whether to futilely defend my innocent curiosity or congratulate him on his restraint, he stormed away from the table and disappeared in the darkness on the end of the bow. Do all minorities think that all white people are inherently racist? The few blacks and English-speaking Hispanics I went to school with didn't seem to. I had not experienced racism directly toward my person until Mayton Crow. You could have heard a pin drop. Once Smokes was out of earshot, my dad loudly spoke. Well then. I'm not really sure what that meant, or if he expected some sort of response. Everyone at the table immediately forgot about the episode and re-entered random conversation. Everyone except Bradley. He called me from his newly built apartment. Apparently non-ambulatory people and their monkeys are a lot sneakier than you would think because I certainly had not even noticed his leaving the table. I approached expecting an almost bare lean-to. It was surprising to see the old friend had lavish furnishings in his spacious building. The quarters only looked inconspicuously tiny from the outside. Hammer was more than willing to stop by my place after we left Walmart, and there was nobody home. I'm hoping Mama and Dad had found somewhere to go, he said. I could not help but notice the sadness that crept into Bradley's voice near the end of the sentence. He wished his parents had made it as mine had. It was clear that he was not stupid. My parents had survived, and I was happy beyond description for that. I tried to imagine how I would feel if they had not. The old friend continued after a brief pause. Mary's cage, some clothes, and some gun cabinets were pretty much all we had to get at the house. We picked up some building supplies and the basics from Walmart. He pointed over to what was obviously Mary's cage. It was about the size and shape of a refrigerator with a water bottle and a food bowl sticking out the front. Beside this was a chest of drawers, followed by several cabinets that were more than tall enough for long guns. I'm assuming this was one of the twin beds from Walmart because it looked as if it had not been broken in. But other than the fact that he had a small bed, I was a little pissed because this room was a hell of a lot nicer than anything else on the boat. So what does Mary eat? I was genuinely curious. Earlier at the table, I had been tempted to offer the malnourished-looking creature giving me puppy dog eyes a bite of fish. He explained, I have a good bit of monkey chow in that crate over there. If I run low on that, we'll figure something out. He told me that monkey chow was basically large chunks of dog food specially designed for monkeys. In a pinch, she could basically eat anything we could eat. Shit, how long was I gone? They had accomplished more in the past 24 hours than I had done in a week. Oh, and she only weighs seven pounds, but that's by design, so she doesn't get diabetes. I suppose he could read my incredulous look when he started describing her food. This was enough to put me at ease. I laughed. Well, maybe we should put smokes on that same diet. I imagine insulin will be hard to come by from now on. 
My former classmate agreed with a chuckle. I'm not the type that needs to fill the air with constant conversation and have no problem with comfortable silences. I felt the conversation was over, but Bradley continued with random monkey facts. Mary's 21. He began. So, I was about to say something about that being pretty old for an animal. They usually live to be 40 or 45. That was pretty damn surprising. We began moving out of Bradley's presidential suite after I gave a final once-over to the cage. The lower quarter was solid in the front, and I quickly realized the reason. Poop has to go somewhere. This is cool, man. I said, which really meant, thanks for giving me some insight into your relationship with Mary. This has been very interesting, but just seemed a lot more masculine and saved time. Mary wasn't a pet, and I have no problem with indoor service animals. Throughout my life, no dog I have had has ever been allowed in my house. I, like my mama, couldn't fathom an animal being inside without a damn good reason. It just makes sense to keep a service animal inside. How else could they help you out? But a pet should live outside where God intended. What's worse than a chihuahua or some other useless ankle biter stinking up a house? There are those people that find a way to call their everyday pets service animals. I saw a special on TV about a woman with a service dog that helped her with anxiety. I shit you not, it supposedly stopped her panic attacks. If I had to carry one of those ugly little rats everywhere with me, the nasty looks people would give me for dragging the shit machine through Walmart would make me feel so humiliated that it would counteract whatever anxiety relief the creature supposedly provided. After we were through talking about Mary and I had admired this palatial room, we moseyed back out to rejoin the rest of the group. As I had expected, soon after we returned, Smokes came back to the table and joined in the various talks as if nothing had happened. Even later, I wasn't sure if I needed to apologize or explain myself, or even broach the subject. I'm not sure what the hell the actual subject was. He never mentioned it, so neither did I. After the entire group was finished eating, we all scattered about across the deck. If my mother had not been present, I would label our current activities as shooting the shit. Smokes, myself, Gene, my father, and Bradley, basically every male member of our current delegation, plus the female imp who rarely detached herself from the shoulder of the old friend, sat around the table as the oracle spoke his gospel to my dad who listened, accepted, and was saved, or something akin to that. Once my father had become a faithful follower, he was quickly accepted as a member of our congregation. We began quickly passing the baby food and diving into the meat of my dad's newfound faith. I noticed the female side of our party was over near Crow's Lounger in Umbrella, undoubtedly talking about us, jewelry, clothing, or something equally stereotypical of the fairer sex. So you're saying that we will eventually start some sort of settlement that will be fairly safe from the peavies and we'll be secure for how long? My dad was seriously enjoying trying to get Smokes to make a slip and prove that he did not have an early copy of the script. The oracle chose to be somewhat vague. Non-specific. The zombie-free city will be attacked by a group led by the villain. The undead will become a weapon. Hadn't I seen the movie to which he was referring? It was still amazing to me how almost every saga in the genre followed the same basic storyline. My father nodded in acknowledgement as if this was more than enough answer. I almost laughed. The oracle had explained that my dad was the later of the similar. Smokes had apparently already decided that he was included in us and not them and was part of our merry little band, even though his own band was still complete. Smokes walked away from the group at this point. Maybe he was getting more information from the screenwriter, or maybe he was still pissed at me. I was half-heartedly working on an apology, defense, rebuttal, or something. I figured I would go ahead and go over to where the oracle stood, by himself looking over the side of the boat. I spent the entire walk coming up with absolutely nothing, and just supposed I would wing it like basically everything else I did. I really didn't understand my own reasoning here. I normally catastrophically embarrass myself and butcher every damn word I say. There was no advantage in ad-libbing monologues, certainly not ones designed to restore peace. It didn't appear he was aware of my approach. I began as I came up to his side. So, I jammed my hands into my pockets as I tried to begin my bumbling apology. I nearly jumped as he spoke, almost like he'd felt my approach. 
Looking back, he probably already knew every word that would ever be spoken between us and everyone else mentioned in this journal. We stop on my crib next time we ain't doing shit? Well, I wasn't exactly sure where he lived, but hesitantly agreed. I guess I was planning on taking Gene to his house tomorrow, so while we're out, I let the sentence trail as he nodded. I got some grass in my pad, you dig? I hung out with stoners in high school and was accused of partaking more than once. Honestly, I never used marijuana. That is not to say I hate people who smoke. It should be legal everywhere. I just prefer getting intoxicated with liquor. Yeah, I will admit that I smoke cigarettes when I drink. I'd rather be too drunk to walk than drive to Waffle House at 2 o'clock in the morning with rampant munchies. No, man, it's just not my thing. The fuck wrong with you, you pussy-eating faggot? This horribly contradictory insult might offend no one. It probably even received laughs in the right situation. But I instinctively cringed, remembering the most traumatic relationship experience of my life. Eternity. I'll be the first to admit that I've never had much luck with women. Sure, I got laid a few times in high school and at parties. None of them were anything to write home about or even brag about to my friends. I'm not hung like a mule, nor was I quarterback. None of the girls I've ever hooked up with have even come close to rating 7 out of 10. I've only had one serious girlfriend who I thought I was going to marry. Let me tell you again, that was a big fucking mistake. Even if the human race is to somehow survive, it will still take hundreds of years to see the return of the internet and even come close to what was social normalcy just a few weeks ago. Nevertheless, I will go ahead and let you know something from experience. Never start a relationship with anyone you meet on the internet. A few years ago, a friend and I spent the majority of our weekend surfing Yahoo Messenger, pretty much begging any woman with a webcam to flash us. Yes, it was as completely pathetic as it sounds. We were over 21, and rather than go to a party to find moderately attractive, drunk females, we sat in my room for hours on end, looking for a glimpse of something that a 12-year-old boy would barely find erotic. My mom had to think we were gay. Two guys sitting in a room and whispering for that many hours? Anyway, one night my friend wasn't able to come over and partake of our customary loser session. I was forced to search alone for hours for topless attractive females. Obviously, desperate women spent their weekends surfing chat rooms. During my quest, I ran across username Forever Yours. I was astonished to find that this person was and had been born female, was just a little younger than me, single, and had a webcam and microphone. At first glance, she was not terrible looking. Maybe I need glasses. Certainly, her looks were improved by the effort it took to find her. I shit you not, her real name was Eternity, surprisingly spelled correctly. Later I learned this was due to the fact that both of her alcoholic, unemployed parents were drunk off their asses when she was born. After she told me her name, my first response was that it sounded like a porn star name. Though she was nowhere as pretty as one, as it turned out, she was just as loose as I would imagine a retired porn star would be. She was from Alaska, and my stupid ass began a long-distance relationship with her. After we started officially dating, her favorite thing to say was Eternity and Elmo together forever. Thank God it was not to be. I didn't really want to be damned for eternity. Actually, I started mumbling that phrase under my breath whenever she said it. During the time that we were dating over Yahoo, I started the process of moving out of my parents' house and into a duplex a couple of miles down the road. I refused to go somewhere as cold as fucking Alaska, even for the possibility of getting laid, even during the beginning when I still thought she might actually be okay. So she got a plane ticket and took a trip down here. She was here for a week, during which time I learned she was evil incarnate. For some reason, I did not kick her out of my fucking house. I even agreed that it would be a good idea for her to fly back to Alaska, get her shit, and move down here with me. Yeah, pretty sure that was my dick's idea. I'm not sure what kind of evil voodoo magic she put on me, but I know she had to be a witch, or at least something that rhymes with that. She lived with me for just over a year, so I was obviously temporarily mentally retarded. You can compare this episode to one of the drunken husbands on cops who beat their wives. No, before you say it, she didn't physically abuse me. I was just treated like a stray dog, 
cussed at and only fed a few scraps. Eternity had gone to college to be a music teacher, and until I met her I did not realize they had dropped the standard so low that a psychotic lunatic could be expected to educate children. Surprise! She was unable to find a full-time teaching job. She worked as a substitute and blew what little spare money I had on Applebee's. One day, months after she'd moved in, we were messing around in the bedroom and I confessed to her. You know, I've never put my mouth down... there. I then pointed between her legs and I was obviously willing to give it a go. She realized this and replied, I've never had that done to me either. We both dove headlong into new territory, and as soon as I began this journey, I realized I should have brought my snorkel. I was able to bear prime the rolls of fat off her belly that threatened to suffocate me, and even overlooked the fact that though she shaved every day, she had more pubic hair than I had facial hair. But there was no way I could put up with that taste. You know those baby wipes at the Dollar Tree? The really cheap, shitty ones that smell worse than baby shit they are intended to clean? It was sort of like that, only worse. I had to give up in something like five seconds because I was close to vomiting. After a horrible experience such as that, I don't believe the richest woman in the world could bribe me to try it again. I've heard some of my friends say it tastes like strawberries. That's a malicious lie. Smokes and I meandered back to the group. My dad picked up where he left off with questions for the oracle. Is there any indication of who the main group of antagonists? My father's question was cut off by the hissing of the radio at the center of the table. The area that is Douglas is now under the control of the United States military. If any of the inhabitants surrender without resistance, they will receive protection in exchange for work. All armed citizens will be seen as hostile and shot on sight. We will provide you with safety if you willingly turn in your firearms. Enemies of the state will be given no quarter, and all hostile action will be reciprocated tenfold. This is Captain Jonathan Bobbitt. We will be stationed at Town Hall for an indefinite time. Surrender your weapons at that location and apply for work programs that will consist of... The transmission continued for a while longer, but I doubt anyone at the table heard it. We all stared at the radio in dead silence, as if it were the cause of the current problem and looking at it sternly would put an end to our worries. Okay, am I the only one who remembers Lorena Bobbitt cutting her husband's penis off? Wasn't his name John or something? Either way, I am going to picture a victim of castration whenever I think of that captain. My dad summed up the transmission. We trade liberty for temporary safety. Gene simultaneously spoke his geeky summarization. Resistance is futile. Smokes had a look on his face that said, Told you, motherfuckers. This was unbelievable. It just proved the omniscience of the oracle. We kept our eyes fixed blankly on nothing. It was easy to see that this information had affected my father greatly. The similar, the people he felt responsible for had been overtaken, and some possibly killed while he was out vacationing. Even though his presence would doubtfully have made a difference, he wanted to leave by himself immediately to save his town. Someone had obviously alerted the ladies. They hurriedly rushed over and did the exact same thing we were doing. Absolutely nothing. At my and Hammer's arguments, he begrudgingly agreed that the two of us would accompany him. I know you're thinking it. I thought it was a stupid idea and characteristically wanted to stay here, but felt compelled to follow any immediate family member to our doom. Now is not the time to strike. The full commando unit should depart tomorrow. Using his professor voice, Smoke spoke with such finality that it was clear no one would be going anywhere. Even though my dad's eyes flamed with defiance, he relented to the oracle. Daddy pointed his finger. Fine. We will go up there tomorrow, locked and loaded. Did Full Metal Jacket just flash across anyone else's mind at that statement? I know he wasn't referring to the Stanley Kubrick Vietnam classic, but I personally pictured Gomer Pyle sitting on the toilet in his underwear when my dad said that. The commando unit obviously consisted of our giant black ninja, the cripple ninja and his capuchin ninja, the metal clawed force wielding ninja, the super soldier ninja, and plain old me. We would go shoot people and most likely get shot ourselves. Maybe our women folk can make some damn decent food before we get back. I was sure this was one of those rare occasions my dad would lose sleep. I'm confident he would strategize with anyone that was awake. 
Of course, I'm not that stupid. Showing my mom and Sarah the captain's quarters, I then made my way to the crew quarters and set up a bunk before my dad could start talking and keep me above deck. I'm guessing that the majority of the crew being subjected to his war plans was not enough. After a few minutes, he came down to force me to come up and join his round table discussion. My mom and Sarah were most likely sleeping peacefully. Crow must have been fishing or formulating new bland and tasteless seafood dishes, but the newly labeled commando unit discussed our plans to increase our chances of dying painfully tomorrow. There were now 13 of us. As I ascended the stairs onto the deck, I swear the scene at the table was taken from that last supper painting, redone in accordance with modern sensitivities. A handicapped disciple sat over the side, and Jesus was now a cross between Fat Albert and Buddha, but still had a look of, I got this on his gnawing face. Holy shit! Does that mean Smokes is going to be the sacrifice? If he dies for my salvation, I know I'll never hear the end of it. We'll have to make sure to keep him away from crosses and thorn bushes. I had to shake off that mental image. I approached the table and listened to my father and Hammer strategize. Take two vehicles with guns and I'll come up on the north side. Hammer, you can come up from the east. Hammer readily nodded. Okay, we just need to stay close enough to maintain radio contact and we need to use a frequency they won't be on. Everyone believed what I had initially assumed. The army guys didn't send that radio message because they weren't expecting anyone from the community to be gone or another crew so close. It was only intended to reach the residents of Douglas who had radios. They had just been repeating the same message over several channels since discovering that some in the community had the ability to communicate. My dad would occasionally look over to Smokes as if seeking approval for each part of the plan. Throughout the entire war strategizing, the seer merely gave no in nods. Near the end, he made an adamant declaration. It gotta be me, you, and that old cracker. He pointed a meaty finger in my father and me. Knowing there must be some reason, all I could do was dip my head in acceptance. The expert added gleefully, Oh, and we need to stop by Bottom Dollar on the way. I've got some grenades. She smiled excitedly. Fucking seriously? I could do nothing but gape. The woman has been holding out on us. Hell, she probably had some rocket launchers in storage. My dad had apparently only wanted me to witness the planning because he and Hammer laid out all the instructions. Smoke gave his seal of approval and the meeting was officially over. Crow magically appeared at her girlfriend's side. Bradley wheeled into his little shed and the others went ahead to the crew quarters. I showed my father where to find my mother and Sarah, a small but important task. I am hoping that I will be able to make another entry before we go to our deaths. But if there is no time and there's anyone left alive to read this journal, I'd appreciate you carrying it and even making your own entries. Just nothing too gay. And take it easy on the Star Wars references, Jane. 22. Mo, Journal Entry 21. He might as well have burst through the door banging a metal garbage can. Reveille, reveille! I can't remember the last time my dad was so eager to wake everybody up. The sun had just risen when we were ready and made our way onto the deck. It wasn't that early, but it was a lot damn earlier than I thought was necessary. Having had no more than a few minutes to grab a drink and get a bite of fish, I found it strange to see that the old friend was already waiting in Hammer's truck. Even though I had already seen how expertly raised and lowered himself from the ship, I would always be surprised to see a crew member in the parking lot before the gangplank had been dropped. The short trip to the pawn shop was uneventful and easy as we followed the laden pickup. If my two compatriots spoke, I was too busy sleeping to catch it. The expert slowed and turned on her blinker before making the left turn into bottom dollar. If I had not been waiting for the minuscule amount of caffeine that I had consumed this morning to take effect, I probably would have laughed. My father pulled squarely into the parking spot beside her like we were in fucking driver's ed. It was offered, but I really did not feel like joining the others to watch my father orgasm as he scanned Hammer's armory of weapons, rather choosing to remain in the truck to begin writing in my journal. And if we gonna take him out, we got to build some drawbridges or some shit. I jumped as the oracle re-entered the truck. I had again somehow missed the ground shaking. He spoke to my dad, who was reaching for the driver's door handle. 
I could not hear my father's response. I assumed they were talking about destroying the bridges at the center of each causeway, turning the island into an actual island. Wait a minute, that was my idea. I already had this planned. Now my father would think Smokes was a genius. Damn it! What all did you get? I was genuinely curious, having never seen Hammer's gun collection. It would have been interesting. I just decided that cataloging the events leading to my demise was more important. If I didn't go meet the big director in the sky soon, I was sure there would be plenty of time to check out the expert stockpile of firearms later. She actually had a few cases of incendiary ammo for those ARs. You'll never believe this. He reached into one of his many pockets and tossed a metal ball to me. Willie Pete. By his raised eyebrow, I could tell Smokes wasn't aware of the nickname for white phosphorus grenades. I think my penis just crawled up into my stomach. My dad threw a live incendiary bomb at me. Yes, I know the pin was secure and there were no indications it would explode at the moment, but it's fucking handheld napalm. Very few ways of dying more slowly or painfully come to mind. Taking a bath in a volcano would be more pleasant. I gingerly lifted the device with two fingers and offered it back. That's great, Daddy. Let's not play hot potato with the explosives. Once I convinced myself I was still in one piece, I noticed he was wearing a tactical vest with weapons similar to what Smokes and I sported. Maybe Hammer had suited him up in the shop. We remained on recently paved roads for several miles, allowing me to continue the current entry for a while. 23. Mo. Journal Entry 22. Before the zombie apocalypse, I'm pretty sure I didn't make the kind of rash decisions that my entire group has taken recently. Do these people think before jumping headlong into a firing range of automatic weapons? How the hell did they, my dad included, survive in the world before it was totally hostile? Next time we make any decision that could possibly end in the deaths of us all, we need to take a step back and think up the possible long-lasting repercussions. Then we choose the option that does not end in our complete annihilation. Shit, maybe running full tilt into a target-rich environment might be the best strategy. I would just like the opportunity to discuss my choice. My priority will be survival. I had to sigh. The laden truck slowed and came to a full stop at yet another red light. Next, she turned on her right blinker. We finally came off the highway and took the twisting roads that approached my hometown. I'm not sure if he was simply being courteous, was doing it out of habit, or was as batshit nuts as the expert, but my father readily followed Hammer's insane obedience of obsolete traffic laws. Are you privy to what's going to happen, or do you just make guesses? My father kept his eyes on the road as he asked, but I didn't need to wonder who he was talking to. Also, privy? I know what that means, but I believe it was poor word choice. He would probably have to explain the meaning to the oracle at his side. Once he had been given the definition I expected to hear something like, no one knows except for the father, not even me. It wasn't surprising when Smokes answered with a calm and cryptic question. Let's say that I do know. Would you really want me to tell you when you will die? Well, a rabbit just ran over my grave. That was fucking creepy. Apparently, my dad had been mulling over the same questions I had about our predestination and the plans of the screenwriter. At this chilling rhetorical question, the conversation was over. My father lowered his head in knowing an admission. Wait, did that mean my dad would die during this saga? If he does and it is sometime soon, I'm going to beat the shit out of Smokes for not giving us forewarning. I think I'm envisioning a movie where this guy travels back in time to save his wife, and no matter how many times he saves her, she always dies from one thing or another at the exact same moment. You could say it was just her time, and there was nothing any action could do to change it. After I think about it, I really don't guess it would matter if he did tell me. Does that mean Smokes is a time traveler? I've got to stop letting my mind run. The theme song for Quantum Leap is running through my head. Where's Scott the Cooler when you need him? We're about three miles from our target. Gray Fox, over. Approximately same distance from LZ. Contact soon. Red Witch, over and out. 
My dad had finally found the woman of his dreams, one that used proper radio etiquette and had napalm grenades. If he had not been married to my mother, he'd probably be swooning. Red Witch? Gray Fox? Why the hell are we using radio handles? When did they decide on these two? Let's say that Captain needs a penis and his army buddies are listening in on the radio broadcasts. I doubt he's going to know Randy or Hammer. If he somehow did, it would be impossible for him to know they are planning to ambush him or any of the other fine details. Daddy lowered the radio. Log and load, boys. The two of us checked our long guns, sidearms, and pouches of grenades. Our firearms were ready, and I was getting that jittery, nervous, anxious feeling you always get right before you do something really stupid. The adrenaline was pumping. I thought about asking Smokes if we were going to make it. As much as I bitch about marching to my death, I'm not really worried about it. Once you get right down to it, the Oracle has convinced me without a shadow of a doubt that I am the hero, and this is nowhere near the end of the story. That means I am basically untouchable. I'm fairly certain Smokes will survive as long as I do, even though I could see a tear jerk and parting at the end. I was mainly thinking of asking for my father's sake. I almost jumped when I saw that the Oracle was already looking at me. If he spoke, it was a whisper. Mickey Mouse, dog. What the fuck? I could do nothing but stare at him in confusion. Mickey Mouse? Rats? Are we going to be saved by the Pied Piper or a fairy godmother or something? Until the bullets start flying, I'm going to be pondering this. What a weird way to enter a shootout. 24. Mo, Journal Entry 23. Prophecy from the Book of Smokes. Not to be confused with the main antagonist, the zombies. The villain is the leader of a group of humans with malevolent intent. There is always more than one of these groups in the saga, but they normally never meet. The sadistic biker gang, for example, does not run into the pack of insane cannibals, the iron-fisted, power-hungry ex-military unit, or the ragtag band of deviants that exists to cause as much havoc and destruction as possible. One group of bad guys will be terminated, or temporarily disappear before the main protagonists come upon the next group. Not every set will necessarily be a large obstacle but there will assuredly be at least one group of human enemies that will define the main characters and that the audience will find memorable. Others will be eliminated in a timely fashion. Due to a minor hiccup in our rushed plans, I have the opportunity to make a final entry before our D-Day. I'm sitting in the office of the First Baptist Church of Douglas. Should I stop writing and start praying that I don't get horribly maimed or disfigured during our coming battle? As I will detail, Cockless and his buddies are clearly pyromaniacs. At least a third of the houses within the town limits have been burned to the ground. This proves resistance against the government was heavier than I would have assumed. I had hoped we could avoid contact with the villain. It is still my belief that we probably could have just kept to ourselves aboard the Kara but here we were, running headlong to meet them. As we slowly passed the Welcome to Douglas sign at the first bridge going into town, my dad actually let out an obscenity. There were bodies of locals hanging from the trees around the sign. Daddy has never been much of one for profanity. My mom would start quoting the Bible any time he let slip any four-letter word. Even when she was not present, his language typically remained pretty PG. Any deviation into PG-13 was a good indication we were in a world of shit. Mm-hmm. Smokes nodded as if he'd been expecting such barbarism by the villain. My dad radioed Hammer to cryptically fill her in on the atmosphere to expect. She replied just as cryptically with stories of equally violent displays. Apparently this military unit was not fucking around with all that life and liberty stuff. They were making it clear that if you are not fully compliant, you are fully murdered in a grotesque fashion. After taking into account the dozens of bullet wounds on each hanging body, it was fairly confident that at least these people had been dead before their corpses were strung up as some sort of message. We passed several houses with clumps of trees or hay fields between each. 
More than one had been raised and was nothing but smoldering wreckage. We slowed nearly a mile before reaching the school, where we planned to stop to avoid alerting the villain to our presence. We were greeted by a group of camouflaged men on foot, all pointing shotguns or hunting rifles in our direction. My dad came to a stop and we all instinctively raised our hands in surrender. A member of the group approached and gestured for my dad to slowly get out. When the two men faced one another, the gunman pointed his rifle at the ground and lowered his bandana. He slurred. By goddamn time. Walt spit a stream of tobacco juice to his side. This was unexpected. I lowered my hands, turning to explain to Smokes that this armed group was obviously insurgents. The Oracle had already known that there was no threat, returning his hands to his lap. I can't decide if he had predicted this was coming. Maybe he recognized Walt, whom he had only met once. This would all be so much damn easier if he would just tell me what was going to happen. So, you know what happened to my fiancé? Walt, the rebel leader, asked my father with genuine concern for Sarah. Oh, she went with me and Mrs. Collins down to where Mo is staying. I reckon she told you before we left. I could see the younger man shake his head in the negative. It just answered my question of whether she had alerted her future husband of her spur-of-the-moment post-doomsday vacation. This would probably have been a deal-breaker if it was a real relationship from the get-go. The other survivalists stopped pointing guns at us. My large friend and I approached the two men in conversation. Completely? My dad looked like he was about to fall over. Hell yeah, there wasn't a goddamn thing left. You didn't even bother to grab some walkie-talkies. Walt could only look on stupidly at this question. Apparently a few of the freedom fighters had been using my father's house as their headquarters. The military swarmed it with machine gun mounted Humvee and a Bradley tank. While the only military casualties were ammo and fuel, only half the rebels escaped with their lives, and according to Walt, nothing else. My dad was changing colors and I wasn't sure if he was just going to start shooting everyone in sight or would save his rage for the villain. The radio crackled to life in his hand. Gray Fox, I'm in position to land my boat and continue swimming. Are you going to meet me halfway? Over. My dad stared off into nothingness. I was about to ask if he had heard that message when he lifted the radio. Roger, Red Witch. Some expected friends are going to tag along for the swim. Over and out. I winced at the use of both nicknames. Honestly, when did they have time to discuss code words? I'm guessing Hammer's team was leaving their truck and walking the rest of the way like we had already talked about. As my dad mentioned his unexpected friends, he looked to the gorillas in hunting camouflage and then to Walt who nodded his head. I had no clue as to why six roughnecks were camped out at the side of the highway. Maybe they were on their way to Assault Town Hall, or maybe this was just their weekly hunting club meeting and it was pure coincidence that we ran across them. It sounds pathetic but I am still trying really hard to find a logical reason why things are happening like they are. I should just go ahead and give credit to the Oracle and the screenwriter. There's no way I could deny the obvious divine intervention. The three of us with assault weapons and body armor waited as Walt instructed the band of camouflaged militia members. We going with them to shoot them goddamn bastards at Town Hall. Yeah, even I've become accustomed to referring to semi-automatic rifles and carbines with high-capacity magazines or tactical shotguns as assault weapons. It really pisses me off. Just because a rifle is black and looks like an M16, nothing about it makes it any more of an assault weapon than the next rifle. In World War II, millions of people were assaulted and killed with Mauser bolt-action rifles. The British Redcoats assaulted the American colonies with muskets and swords. John Hinckley assaulted Ronald Reagan with a revolver. It's stereotyping all firearms with a certain outward appearance as more malicious than others. It's the same mindset as racism. Sorry, I just had to get that off my chest. Anyway, we walked through the woods to our meeting place with the expert. I started wondering how the hell Bradley was going to be at the spot. Images of R2-D2 strapped to Luke's back on Endor ran through my mind. It was difficult to believe Gene would be able to move the bodybuilding concrete slab that was the old friend, plus a seven-pound monkey. Shit, Bradley could probably just walk on his hands faster than I could run. We approached the designated spot and saw no one before hearing the whistled Ollie Ollie Oxenfree. This froze our party in its collective tracks. 
Jesus Christ, could you pick a geek of your password, Jane? I seriously doubt any of the older guys or hillbillies followed Halo. Sighing, I dropped my head before whistling the reply. I briefly figured this would expose my inner nerd to those around me, but then realized they didn't know what the hell this was. I'm sure they assumed it was from our days playing hide-and-seek in the park. The expert in the tech stepped into the open a few seconds later, and our group entered the small field. When we drove close enough, I could see the look of pleasant surprise on Gene's face that I was on the same wavelength. Hopefully there wouldn't be time for him to say anything about it. Maybe I would not be outed. Hammer answered the question that was about to come. Although the man looped around to the First Baptist Church, Bradley has the targeted building in his line of sight. He's carrying the 50 sniper. Well, I guess that was easier and probably more sensitive to those with mobility problems than my idea. I know I'm an asshole sometimes. He had told me about his shooting championships, but I don't know when he got the sniper rifle. He could probably shoot the damn 50 with one hand. My dad explained to Hammer that our backup was a group of local friendlies. He told her they would provide cover during our attack. We all became quieter the closer we got to our destination. As we traveled, it was easy to see that the two groups remained separate. While not hostile or even unfriendly, our group of backups did not feel like they were part of us. I don't think I knew any of the men personally, but trusted that if they were compatriots of Walt's and were the kind of guys who could be depended on to do their part and then some, Walt must have told them that we promised beer after completion of our goal. With the five of us main protagonists together in the lead, the extra guns at our rear, and Walt occasionally going between the two groups to mumble an encouraging word, we continued on toward Town Hall. Hammer looked around to make sure we were alone and spoke quietly for our ears only. Have any of you had grenade training? I didn't even know grenade training existed. How hard can it be to pull the pin and throw the damn thing? Jane has played enough Call of Duty to have some type of Xbox achievement level for number of grenades thrown. Surely Smokes has thrown a baseball around. It wouldn't be difficult to learn. Knowing the Oracle, he could probably throw a grenade in the wrong direction that would blow up at the feet of his enemy. Well, it's not that hard. Think of baseball. I guess I nailed that one on the head. She shot a thumb in the direction of our newfound allies. And I'm not giving any of these guys grenades. I don't think they would intentionally blow us up. I just don't want one of these drunk old coots to accidentally frag me. That was probably smart. We all agreed with head shakes. Without a word between the two, Hammer gave up the lead to my dad. He was a local who knew we were only a few hundred yards from the end of the tree line that opened to the expansive yard of Town Hall. The only sound that could be heard other than the sound of nature was the low smack of streams of Walt's tobacco spit and packing against trees and fallen leaves. I was not the only one whose heart rate was increasing with each step. My mind started racing, and I asked myself questions at a rapid fire rate. Why the hell are we making our assault in broad daylight? When did we come to the conclusion that there would be no attempt at any sort of diplomatic resolution? Just a gunfight? And what happened to all the zombies? There were over a hundred thousand people in the county. The last living infected I could recall seeing was the one Gene speared through the neck. Looking back, these would have been prudent questions to ask myself and my confidants before making rash decisions. Right as I was thinking this, I heard that noise we all recognize as a dog running to the end of its chain. When I was ten years old, I could remember standing at the edge of my neighbor's yard and harassing his large black mean-as-hell dog, Duff. Maybe the old guy was the Simpsons fan or something. Anyway, the dog was chained and I thought I knew exactly how close I could get. Next thing you know, he took a run and go at me and stretched that chain just enough to reach out a paw and rip my t-shirt over the left breast. He didn't get the slack to even scratch my skin but I was ten years old. It made my short life flash before my eyes. That was the closest I had ever come to death up to that point. That taught me to never bother that dog again. I heard that noise and immediately thought of Duff. I was telling the fellas that after this, we ought to go to that Walmart and get us some goddamn beer. Walt was whispering to my father as Duff leaped into the edge of the woods from the direction of Town Hall. I was looking down at the twenty-year-old tear in the left breast of my shirt. It took me a second to realize it was a zombie on a chain sinking its teeth into Walt's forearm. If Walt had not come up at the exact moment to whisper to my dad, it would have bitten him and not Walt. 
before most of us were even aware there was an undead in our midst. Gene had used his adamantium-enhanced reflexes to spring to Walt and start slashing through the chained yellow-eyed fiend with his claws. On that note, doesn't Wolverine have enhanced sense of smell? These zombies obviously are not bags of rotten flesh, but we ought to have picked up their putrid shit from miles away. There were at least eight guns pointed at the newly eviscerated corpse wearing a collar, and all of us tried to huddle near our bitten comrade. A voice could be heard in front of us. Look at that! Spike's got something! The trees made us invisible from our enemies. We could make out several men in ACUs filing out of the front door of Town Hall. They were steering straight for us. Walt had been too surprised to scream. Gene only grunted as he hacked away at the former human, and the zombie itself had a mouthful of redneck and was unable to make much noise before meeting its demise. None of the villains had yet realized they had just lost a pet. Before I go any further, Spike? Yep, Spike. I almost started shooting at the guy just for being so lame at naming his pet. I mean, that's a pathetic name for a dog, let alone a full-fledged zombie. I understand that it was beyond weird to even consider a PV as a pet, but is our production so poorly funded that the director can't afford a better name? I'm goddamn fine. Hammer and Smokes each grabbed the bitten Walt who was speaking at an above inside volume. They dragged him back into the left as he began blindly unloading his pistol in the direction of the soldiers. The bad guys immediately took cover and started returning fire. A few of the idiot insurgents began charging and firing through the trees ahead of them. We made our way into a field. The firing quickly died down. Only three of our backups, including Walt, retreated with us. Hillbilly nigga got bit, yo! Smokes leaned in and reported to me as if he had just performed a detailed medical exam. Walt was wearing a long sleeve flannel shirt and my large friend had not taken the time to give him more than a glance. But at this point, I could find little reason to doubt anything he said. By the way, it was fucking summer in Alabama. I don't understand why anyone would willingly wear flannel. Yeah, I know my armored vest is pretty thick and I understand the concept of camouflage. Hell, I'm still not wearing long sleeves. The couple of uninjured insurgents walked into the woods and retrieved the few weapons of their fallen comrades that were still behind cover. They gave a report. One of the goddamn bastards is killed and another of the other some bitches is limping. 25. Mo. Journal Entry 24. Prophecy from the Book of Smokes. Though it is not necessarily required, the sacrifice will usually come from the group of major characters. At some point there will be a battle with either the villain or the monsters in which a person will give their life to save one or many other characters. The sacrifice may be assaulted by and distract or destroy as many of the aggressors as possible, while giving others the time they need to escape. If the battle is with human antagonists, this character may literally throw themselves in front of others and will be mortally wounded in an attempt to save some or all of the protagonists. Hypothetically, if the text sacrifices himself, he will soon be replaced by another who may spontaneously appear, rising up from the minor or insignificant roles, or will come from the similar. Simply put, the plot cannot continue without the tech or the expert, so they are an unlikely sacrifice. My dad and the expert were crouched on either side of the recently infected Walt, offering words of encouragement. Hammer's radio buzzed with a low but anxious question. Did they really just kill all of you? No, we got surprised by guard dog Pavy. A few of the freedom fighters that joined us were taken. The strike team survived. One of the surviving insurgents was bitten but is now turned. We will exit to your location. Over. Hammer obviously didn't know Walt or realize that Bradley would know him. I wondered if it would really have mattered to her. Her assessment of our wounded was somewhat cold. I privately speculated how she would deal with him. Understood. Didn't realize what those doghouse looking things were. That's pretty fucked up. One enemy down, one walking wounded. Over and out, came the old friend. Doghouse things? How the hell do they keep guard peavies? I'm not even going to go over the moral implications. How would it be possible to house and transport rabid lunatics? We made sure to give the property a wide berth. 
The strike team made a semicircle across the highway to the old friend's sniper nest. Surprisingly, the surviving backups continued to follow and did not simply turn tail when the getting was good. That showed some courage. Hammer clicked the radio to alert Bradley of our approach. He welcomed us inside a house of God. I am a Christian, and I don't think I can ever be anything else. Yeah, I'm far from even being a decent one, but I've never understood why people in post-apocalyptic stories often deny God. Shit happens, and if the PVs haven't eaten you yet, why do you think that God isn't giving you something? My life was pretty shitty even before the end of the world, but I'm actually doing fairly well with all things considered, so I'm not going to bitch. Okay, I'm done preaching religion now. Just had to mention that. Bradley, shit, son, how the hell are you? Walt asked. He noticed Bradley looking at his arm and pointing. Hell, the goddamn little bastard took a chunk out of my arm. He held his arm up and gestured at the blood-soaked field bandage over the injury as if it weren't visible beforehand. I don't think Walt suddenly became an atheist after Armageddon. He would have been just as disrespectful before the world went to shit. He was still walking and just as coherent as his drunk ass could ever be. According to most of the experts who were interviewed by the talking heads, there was no immunity or even treatment. I wouldn't have been surprised if his constant and unbelievably high blood alcohol level would keep Walt human, at least for a good long while. Walt, just as everyone else around him, knew he was a dead man walking. It would only be a matter of time before he lost his humanity, or Hammer shot him in the head. If it was me, I probably would have been depressed, and I half expected him to go in search of beer and drink himself to death before the virus took him. He showed his gumption during his final hours by spending the majority of his time discussing with the two elder tacticians how he could make his death mean something. We found some crackers and grape juice in the church kitchen to munch on as we waited for darkness. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I just realized we ate the communion crackers. Is it a sin to eat those when you aren't in church? You know, this probably would have been something to think about before now. Well, that might have been our last supper anyway, so maybe he'll cut us some slack. I've never actually seen anyone turn up close. Walt was conscious, cussing in incoherent strings. The pigment of his skin was just slightly bluer and he was sweating profusely. He exclaimed, I'm gonna sneak over there and kill me some of them goddamn bastards before I go. He swallowed and gestured for Hammer to speak in his stead. Mr. Sneed is going to take a few grenades and a couple of pistols right into the enemy's camp. The zombies should ignore him. She was referring to the fact that after the initial infection, but before succumbing to the plague, humans are completely ignored by the undead. She continued, He will throw a grenade into the most crowded room before going through the back to shoot any survivors. Oh, she added as if she had forgotten, and he'll have a couple of grenades on a dead man switch. Thankfully, she didn't describe what that would do. Walt made his way around the room and gave everyone a handshake. I was secure enough in my masculinity to give him a dude hug. It consists of reaching around the other's neck, giving a few rough pats and breaking away with fuck yeah or some other manly exclamation. As I broke away, I spoke. You want me to tell Sarah anything, man? He looked at me and grinned an odd and toothy smile. Shit, I knew we weren't really going to get hitched. She was just keeping me around to keep her safe. This must have been one of those rare moments of clarity during a tribulation. I wasn't going to argue with a dying man who already knew the truth. Go, Danny, you can watch out for him, all. Hell, maybe even get you some. He raised a hand to smack my shoulder as a coffin fit overtook him. I backed out of range of his spittle. Well, I have his blessing if I ever decide to grow a backbone. All of the riflemen followed the sacrifice out the front doors to begin scoping in and setting up on town hall. I'm glad I'm not a precision marksman and can only sit here and write. Now I watch one of my oldest friends willingly walk to his death. Hopefully he will just kill off all of the bastards so we don't have to deal with them. If I'm alive to make another entry, I'm praying it'll be back on the Viva Ancora. 26. The Final March of Mr. Sneed I ain't going down without a goddamn fight. Them some bitches will remember the fucking name of Dean Sneed. 
If Walt had ever been forced to read the poem in any of his high school literature classes before dropping out, he would have been too inebriated to remember it. Do not go gentle into that good night would have summed up his feelings as he jogged away to his certain demise. The pigment of his skin was rapidly turning blue. His clothes were soaking wet with sweat. Soon muscle spasms would begin and he would fall over, seeming to die. Eventually he would rise again as an inhuman animal. He knew that Peavy's hated wearing clothes more than his mama's stupid little chihuahua hated its Christmas sweater, and he was going to make sure he went out with his boots on. Almost to the two-lane highway, he'd need to cross it before coming onto the town hall property. He put himself at ease by brushing his hand over his pouch of grenades. The red-headed old lady wouldn't have given him the grenades unless she knew that he would be able to use them to spectacular effect. There wasn't any chance of his survival. He stopped just short of laughing. That would cause another coughing fit. His group of friends were always mixing bombs and alcohol. Whenever they got together and someone decided to bust out the fireworks, at least one guy ended up in the emergency room. Hell, he smiled. That woman was smart. She had pegged his experience with blowing folks up pretty well. This would be the first time he witnessed a still human but infected, meaning himself, come up close to zombies. Now wishing he ponied up the cash for cable, most news he received after May Day had come from radio and word of mouth. He didn't know all the scientific mumbo-jumbo or if there was any speculated reason why the turn did not touch the recently infected. Maybe they just felt cannibalism was wrong. God damn, that was funny. He almost laughed again at his own joke. It could be that the infection makes the meat taste different. Or they could just be grossed out by the blue skin. Holy shit, that's why they're called zombies. They look like dead people. Walt looked back at the direction of the church before gingerly stepping into range of one of the chained guards. The redneck wasn't even given a glance by the monsters. God damn, if it wasn't for the whole dying and being reanimated thing, this wouldn't be so bad. After waving at and even moving within mere feet of the undead and being absolutely ignored, he stepped up his pace. When beginning to feel faint, he knew he did not have long. Walt had never been a pansy nor had he ever passed out while sober. He wasn't about to start now. I'm not going to let a little thing like some undead hound dogs turn me into a week at the knees, pussy. He peeked into the first window that he came to. Just as luck, there were at least five guys in military uniforms sitting around shooting the shit. Well, one of the men said, we should teach these locals a lesson for fucking with us. If we kill enough of them, the rest will just roll over. I'd like to roll over on some of their bitches. One of the other soldiers exclaimed. This was met with laughs and high fives from a few of the other men in the room. Walt was glad Sarah was out of town. These bastards needed taking care of and for the sake of all the town's womanfolk. He aimed to stream a spit at the ground as he followed what's-her-name's instructions. Push the spoon down, pull the pin, throw it. The window shattered easily as the frag sailed through. Before he could even register any exclamations from within the room, Walt had bolted around the corner into the back door. At the moment of detonation, he drew his dual 1911s and kicked in the door. There were a few mumbled moans and whimpers coming from the room which was belching smoke. He reckoned he ought to let them some bitches take their damn sweet time to die. They deserved it. He looked over his shoulder and noticed that the guard zombie hounds were lying on the ground. At least one had a single giant hole through it. He wondered if they would stay down or if it seriously took a headshot to put one down permanently. This was it. He leveled both of his pistols and charged. Rushing into the building, aiming one of his pistols at the door of the room to his left, he heard only the crackling of the smoldering fires and the dying coughs from a few of those goddamn bastards. He was just about to move in to make sure they were not going to get up as he heard someone hacking from the smoke in front of him. What the hell happened in there? Were you retards playing with grenades or... The unseen enemy was interrupted by repeated blasts from Walt's 45s. The redneck was wondering what would happen when his pistols clicked empty, just as rifle fire began peppering him through the smoke. Dozens of bullet holes sprang up from his chest down to his knees. Save me doing it myself, he thought with satisfaction. Before the massive explosion completely vaporized his destroyed body. He smiled through bloodied teeth and chuckled as he sank to the floor.
I don't need a goddamn bear. 27. Mo. Journal Entry 25. Walt was a lot faster than I would have assumed, given his debilitated state. I could see him slinking in and out of tree cover before stealthily crossing the highway directly in the line of sight of Town Hall. He casually walked by the chained undead guards. They honestly did not notice his presence. They just continued devouring the bodies of the deceased insurgents that the military troops had fed to them. It was disgusting to see up close. As predicted, Walt did not register in the sight of zombies, so he simply walked on by. The insurgents had been gunshot, so they died uninfected, and the ravenous cannibals were sucking the meat off their bones like this was a post-game buffet at KFC. Except instead of grease covering their hands and faces, they were spraying blood and gore all around them. I could only see three since Spike had been put down. There was one collared PV on an extremely long logging chain at each visible corner of the property. The military vehicles were parked in a ditch in front of Town Hall. The soldiers must have kept their dogs on a tight enough leash to create a safe zone to make it to their trucks. I'm going to guess the army guys were just as creative in naming these three hounds considering Spike. Three of our marksmen sided up on Fido, Rex, and Spot in preparation to snap them. It happened the same moment the first grenade exploded. Walt peeked into a couple of windows before rearing back and slamming one frag through the glass. The only dialogue I was able to pick up at that distance was, what the, before a fireball encompassed the room. I did not even register the rifle shots that sounded only feet away as the chain zombies' heads exploded like mailboxes with m 80 shoved into them. I was consumed with watching a soon-to-be-dead hero swing around to the back door of the town hall before the grenade exploded. Walt kicked in the door, screamed an incoherent war cry, and immediately started rapid firing his pistols. The staccato sound of at least one rifle could be heard. Obviously, the antagonists were returning fire. The entire party began rushing to town hall. A huge explosion engulfed nearly the entire building in one massive flash that could be seen through closed eyes. What the fuck kind of grenades did Hammer give him? He had four frags and a WP. She answered my unspoken question as we closed on the building. In hindsight, it probably would have been simpler for Hammer to have brought her damn truck to the church. It would have gone completely unnoticed by our enemy and would have saved the cleanup crew a half mile of jogging. You think my comrades are going to make anything more convenient for me? By the time the assemblage came to a stop near the back door, I wasn't the only one holding on to my knees and gasping for breath. Hell, Smokes must be getting fit. He was at the point of only having a stroke when we stopped. Surprisingly, the Oracle was able to keep pace with us all the way. Hammer went flat against the wall and peeked in the door. She gave us the all-clear thumbs up. I briefly crossed minds once more with Jane. We were both wishing this was Mass Effect. The expert could use third-person camera to look around a corner without actually sticking her head out. One of the two remaining Freedom Fighters pointed his shotgun at the door. The idiot thought he was covering her. I casually placed my arm across the barrel to lower it. Dumbass. We filed through the door after Hammer one at a time. The group checked each corner and found nothing. Just as I was thinking this was pretty anticlimactic and would make for a poor near end into the saga, something dropped to the floor a few feet away. We all looked to see what at first glance appeared to be a silver 16-ounce beer can. Yeah, the first thing I thought of was Walt. The second thing was, oh, fuck. The flashbang went off and blinded almost all of us. Luckily, the strike team was looking for survivors in the room when the sacrifice had thrown his grenade, but our backups were watching our six from the hallway. They were closest to the blinding and deafening bang. Bradley had come up the ramp and was in the room with the rest of us, but fortunately Mary had stayed behind. Apparently, the expert had covered her face while the rest of us were completely blinded. Voices were nothing more than mumbles to any of us. Even gunshots were fairly muffled by the ringing in our ears. More shouting by someone, somewhere could be heard. I probably should have flattened myself on the floor, you know, since there were at least four others in the room who were as blind as I was and were armed to the teeth. Of course, I just stood there like a cow in line at the slaughterhouse. As I stupidly waited in one upright position for my vision to return, my hearing slowly opened up. I could hear several more shouts and quite a few gunshots. 
Gray smoke and indistinct buzzing filled the charred, destroyed room. Making out something that looked like the graphic on a handicapped parking sign to my left, I assumed this was the old friend. In a few minutes, all of us could see well enough to summarize that no one in the room had been injured after the flashbang. Hammer was missing. Our two backups were lying in pools of blood in the scarred hallway where the sacrifice had just made his last hurrah. The marks of his explosives marred the walls which were now splattered with the blood of more patriots. Smokes would surely tell me those guys were in the insignificant roster of the character list. Not knowing the name of either, I don't believe they had a single speaking part. Their deaths will be easily glazed over, soon forgot. But damn, that kind of sucks once you think about it. I was fairly certain they were dead. Don't think I would check for a pulse on guys with obvious fatal wounds lying in more blood on the floor than was left in them. Everyone noticed the captain wasn't present. We all immediately shot out of the room. The bodies of our two backups were conveniently positioned along either side of the hallway. They didn't slow our handicapable companion as he exited the room. He was able to avoid the bodies, but the pool of blood was fairly large. I didn't look for tire tracks, but there was no way he could have avoided getting some of it on his hands. My stomach's not particularly weak, but shit, that's just gross. It was obvious that Hammer had been chasing someone out the front door. There were bullet holes in the walls where her quarry had leveled at her. It was easy to see the difference between Walt's forty-five and five fifty-six bullet holes. She probably would have scolded us for not peeking around the corner before piling out through the front door like amateurs. We stopped on the small front porch. There she was sitting on the steps facing away from us. I was relieved that we weren't going to have to look for her. What happened? She began explaining to me all of the events that had taken place. The rest of the group listened in. The second I saw the flashbang, I turned and dove away. After it went off, the two guys in the hallway were too stunned to do anything. They were immediately mowed down. Before exiting the room, I shot through the wall towards the front, hoping to hit or at least scare that soldier that ambushed the strike team. I used the door frames as cover while we exchanged fire. Slowly, I moved up as they steadily retreated. When I got to the front door, there were two guys loading into a Humvee, about to head south down the highway. They both had pistols and were firing from a couple dozen yards away. I figured one of these skinny little poles on the porch would be enough cover. But one of their rounds hit me. Before I went down, I was able to hit the guy in the passenger seat. The driver yelled, we'll be back. Really? Bad guys actually say that? That's a line I would expect from an old cartoon just before the villain curled his mustache and adjusted his monocle. When she admitted to being shot, my father and Jean, the field medics, began getting ready to perform surgery. She held up a hand. It's okay, fellas. Vest. She lifted her Kevlar vest to show a large bruise just under her rib cage. I don't think it broke any bones. It just hurts like crazy. I wondered if it would hurt less to actually take a bullet or wear a bulletproof vest. I mean, you'd obviously be more likely to survive wearing Kevlar, but it's a different kind of injury. I just wonder if the pain level is greater with an actual bullet wound or that giant goose egg contusion on your side. Of course, I didn't ask her this. It would have been rude. It's just a question I've always had. I miss Mythbusters. At this point, one could conclude the premises was free of hostiles. We had not yet been shot after our bumbling rush out of the front door. Later, we discovered there was no one sitting on the toilet waiting for us with a machine gun. We looked over every dead soldier and were able to read most of the names on the uniforms. Captain Pecker Wanted was unfortunately not among them. Are you surprised? I wish I had met him so I could have made fun of his name to his face. For some reason, I had a feeling we'd run into him again. Christ, that's predictable as hell. I could have dwelt on the fact that I didn't get to meet the victim of a jittery rabbi. Think about it. Currently, I was a little busy loading up weapons taken from dead soldiers. Next, we discussed who would drive the Bradley tank and each of the three Humvees that Captain Dickless kindly left us. Hammer obviously knew how to drive the Bradley tank. The old friend wanted to ride with her, simply because he found it funny that he could say Bradley is in the Bradley tank. I had never driven a Humvee. It wouldn't be much different than driving a pickup, I guess. Obviously, Gene could pull some need for speed moves with one of the vehicles when he almost squealed with geeky delight. I was unsure if Smokes wanted to or even could drive one. 
he hesitantly agreed to after my dad said that Mama would kill him if he left her Corolla. As we made our way to our new vehicles, my father spoke. Mo, I'll ride with you and pick up your mom's car. Then I want y'all to follow me back to the house. I wasn't going to correct him with, you mean where the house used to be. 28. Mo, Journal Entry 26. Prophecy from the Book of Smokes. Some type of physician, be it a general practitioner, a pulmonologist, endocrinologist, or even brain surgeon. The medicine man is always needed in almost every saga of almost every genre. Normally more of a lover than a fighter, the medicine man will always be close by when needed to perform medical miracles and is usually overprotective of his patients, especially when that person is one of the main protagonists. If the medicine man dies or gets bitten, the character will immediately be replaced by someone he has adopted as an aide, and the change will not have that much impact. It should have taken less than 10 minutes to drive to the car and then convoy back to my parents' property. The chain-link fence surrounding the yard had been flattened in several spots. There was nothing but black and charred remains where the house once stood. My dad led our strange parade. For some reason, he thought he knew the route better than most of us did. Of course, I could have gotten there with my eyes closed. It was fairly certain Bradley could guide Hammer even from the rear of a tank. There's no reason to doubt Smokes had some sort of supernatural GPS. I'm guessing he was just making sure Gene could not possibly get lost. Daddy kept bringing the convoy to a halt, hollering out the window, blowing his horn, and finally getting out to call for his surviving neighbors. There was no response, not even once. It was stupefying and depressing to watch my dad scream for people he had known for years, only to be met with stony silence. Had these military some bitches really murdered or chased away every single resident of the town? It appeared so. After finally reaching our decimated home and walking through the ashes, I really wanted to get revenge on those bastards. This was the place Mama and Daddy had reared us, a place many of my friends considered to be a second home, where they knew they were always welcome. The thought of it made even my hardened heart sink. Being the first to reach the driveway, my dad slammed on his brakes and hustled to stand where his office had been only yesterday. He looked between the points of crying and screaming by the time the rest of us had parked and approached. I wasn't sure if I should comfort him or join in his anger. This had also been my home for most of my life. But there wasn't much of the building itself that I would really miss. Hey, I might be shallow and superficial, but I don't consider myself very materialistic. I don't have a metric ton of gold medals to store in a trophy room like easy. He walked to where his closet used to be, pushing the blackened skeleton of the house out of his way. I knew what he was looking for. He found the manhole leading to a ladder. It led down to a narrow framed entrance room that opened to his bunker. It was simply a large shipping crate, reinforced with steel and cement. This contained his armory and guns and ammo. It also stored food and a few other odds and ends he decided would be useful after the end of the world. Yes, I realize I never mentioned this earlier. If I had and my journal was stolen or lost, Daddy would kill me because I had given the location of his secret cache. Preparing to enter the underground metal cane and watch Daddy poke around, I'm guessing that we're going to gut the damn thing when we leave. If you read this entire journal, find this information, then locate this property, that's cool. I don't think anyone is going to be upset if you come to sit in an empty container under a burned-out house. This setup was the poor man's nuclear fallout shelter. Buying the shipping container and making it accessible from the house didn't cost five grand. It was actually pretty cozy. Featuring battery-powered lights, it made a great storm shelter. My dad was able to store some of his survivalist crap down here, even after he had bolted several gun safes to the wall. Most importantly, not many knew of the existence of this bunker. It made me feel like shit to leave Bradley above ground. Even though he would doubtfully have any problem making it down the ladder, it would be completely impossible to get his damn chair through the manhole. There's just no way everything can be made handicap accessible. Everyone had radios. My dad promised it wouldn't be long. A bit disappointed, Bradley agreed to wait in the tank. The rest of us filed down the ladder. 
You can guess who the last down was. My fucking skinny ass white people. Y'all couldn't cut the damn hole bigger? I briefly considered letting the morbidly obese prophet go before I did. That scene where Rabbit tried to shove Pooh Bear's honey-fattened ass through his door hole flashed across my mind. What, I'm not ashamed to admit that I watched Winnie the Pooh as a child? Don't judge me. The bipedal contingent of the squad was assembled at the base of the ladder. We moved toward the closed door of the shipping container. My dad held the door open and gestured for the object of his strange, non-romantic crush to go ahead of him. Compare his infatuation to my gay celebrity crush on Christian Bale. I can imagine the look on your face. But just because I am not ashamed to admit my love for one of the greatest actors of all time shouldn't diminish me in your eyes. He's fucking Batman, John Connor, and Moses. I would bet money he is currently alive, and if the two of us did actually meet, I guarantee there will be no romantic exchange. Even though this topic has been broached several times when my friends and I were drunk, I would not be aroused even if he were wearing the Batman suit. Why the hell do I feel the need to justify myself to you? If you are reading this journal, then I am most likely dead, and your opinion of me means less than shit anyway. Hammer simulated a curtsy as she walked by my dad. General Tommy Franks held the door open for me once. The next thing you know... I'm not going to speculate on where that story was going. Something like that sounded like, Don't kill me came from the other side of the door. The expert fell over. If you'd ever met him, you would immediately recognize his voice. My dad's announcement echoed my thought. Doc, it's us. Don't shoot. It was obviously a little late for that warning. As he stepped over her, I could make out a small bullet wound in Hammer's left side below her breast. After she was shot by the villain, she had decided it would be more comfortable to wear only a loose fit and t-shirt. The Kevlar vest saved her life last time. It might have been too soon to go casual. <gasps> I'm so sorry. I didn't think anyone would ever find me. I just panicked. Dr. George repeatedly apologized to my father and Hammer. He shot her with a twenty-two revolver. Am I the only one that's not surprised we ran into him, especially now? Albeit I didn't plan to discover any more main protagonists this late in the story. I guess that's a good sign. Maybe I'll be around for a couple more volumes, seasons, or whatever. I looked over at Smokes. He was nodding knowingly at the doc, who was obviously mortified that he had just shot someone. The oracle was in turn telling me we just found the medicine man. The medicine man performed field surgery on the expert. My dad said the doctor described the bullet missing her heart but puncturing her lung. She should survive, but may be out of action for an indefinite amount of time. The doctor spent most of the surgery apologizing to my dad and Hammer, who was unconscious throughout most of it. I'm just hoping that I'll be able to understand him better once he becomes a member of the Cora crew. So how did you end up down here anyway, Doc? I asked. I wasn't able to catch everything, but my dad translated Dr. George's answer to my question. Most of this is paraphrased. When you told me that you had a bunker and how to get into it a couple of weeks ago, I didn't really think I would ever need to do so. As soon as they started shooting and ripping through the house, I came back here. Everyone else ran outside. There was enough water and freeze-dried food that I could have stayed here for a long time. When I heard someone coming through the door, I just reached out and prepared to defend myself. I'm just glad that the doc didn't defend himself with a high-powered rifle. Then there would be no chance of saving Hammer. I've got to say, she's a tough old bird. She can sprint like an Olympian, shoot like a champion, obeys the law like she has an angel on her shoulder, and can take more damage than Robocop. I know it only sounds like wishful thinking, but we can't lose her. Cannot. As in completely impossible. It'd be pretty pointless for the rest of us to sit around and twiddle our thumbs while the doctor spent a few hours in surgery and cleaning her up. The rest of us carried weapons and supplies up the ladder and piled them in our vehicles. Yes, I am doing as little work as possible. I'm spending any spare moment writing this entry until I get yelled at for not working. Mo. No. You are never going to believe this. Jane seemed more excited than if he had just rescued Leonard Nimoy. Come look. He beckoned and shot up the ladder. I begrudgingly followed him to one of the Humvees. Damn, he was right. I wouldn't have believed this. 
in the back of one of the trucks the villain stored pallets of M4s. I guess Captain Dickless had made his getaway in the wrong Humvee. Well, unless he decided to take the one packed with rocket launchers. Frackin' sweet, right? I had to agree with the tech. This was pretty sweet. When my dad came up with another handful of boxes, he was pretty stoked when I told him. He probably just wished they were AK-47s. Of course, he stated the obvious. Nice, but we still need to load most everything else up. Despite my drag ass in the text numerous breaks to suck on his asthma inhaler, the oracle being slow and fat, my dad taking his damn sweet time, and the old friend refusing to go down the ladder, we had pretty much everything that we needed to carry up and in the truck sooner than I expected. Yes, I know I'm an asshole. Bradley can't go down the ladder. I just had to say it. Next, the medicine man came topside to report on the expert's condition. He dusted his impossibly white doctor's coat off. She is conscious and I believe she is stable. I do not recommend moving her at the moment. We all know she would just fight him and fucking walk back to the car. My dad sighed. That's not going to work, Doc. And I don't think you have enough sedatives to keep her down there. Oh. Well, I am about out of major sedatives anyway. If we really need to move her, I can keep her feeling okay, but that is about it. Dr. George, my dad, and I went down into the bunker to explain the situation to Hammer. We would offer any assistance she needed getting back to the vehicles. Though she took it easy on her climb up the ladder, moved pretty slow once up and accepted a rifle from Jane as a cane, you wouldn't have guessed that she had been inches from death only a short time ago. She even volunteered to pilot the tank. The medicine man refused at first but finally relented as long as she allowed him to supervise. I swear to God, she had to have taken some kind of super soldier serum back in the day. Adamantium? She's either Robocop, a Terminator, a Borg, or she's got a stash of fully restored health kits in her bag. Didn't Wolverine have an ex-girlfriend with really long fingernails that could heal just like him? I'll stick with the adamantium theory. My dad went down to the bunker one more time. After he returned to us, we walked from the ruins to our home vase. I whispered to him, You know, you, Mama, and Sarah are more than welcome to stay down there with us for a few more days. Without looking at me, he smiled. You really think I'd forget about your adopted sister? He nearly fell over with laughter at my wince. I'm glad you offered. Actually, I already planned on asking you that. Just left a note down on the bunker door in case anybody I know ever comes around here. I nodded as we separated, understanding that this scene had already been scripted. Catching the ever-watching eyes of the oracle, he opened his truck door. He smiled and dipped his head as I thought I heard something on the wind. You was always at the place you was always supposed to be. I'm finishing this journal entry as I wait to start up my Humvee in the line of soon-to-be roaring engines. Why the hell did my dad want to get back immediately? Granted, I yearned for safety as much as any of the others, but we were not really under any time constraints. Why couldn't we just wait in the bunker with freeze-dried food and water? Maybe he felt that he needed to return to his wife. Either that or he just assumed that we would have some more frustrating bullshit to deal with tomorrow. It would be so much easier if Smokes would just tell us what was going to happen. Do you realize that I've been moving basically non-stop for almost a week? Well, I've slept pretty well every night, but I've been doing something all day every day. Shit, I usually don't do this much work in a month, and I'm damn tired. I just need a day or two of not almost being killed constantly. Get moving, white grandpa! Smokes yelled over the radio. Well, I guess I wasn't the only one waiting for the go-ahead. My dad called back. Two minutes. I'm going to speculate he is on the walkie-talkie explaining the day's events to my mother. That's fine with me. It gives me more time to fill this journal with unimportant ramblings. It's been two minutes, fucking blue-eyed devils. I just had to respond. Uh, my eyes are green. I have some Sith contacts at home that are yellow. Damn, Gene, that was random. Secretly, I feel inherently jealous of the text treasure trove of everything nerd. I kind of want to see it. Maybe there will be time to stop by his place tomorrow. My dad's only response was to start his engine. See you at the Cora. Twenty nine. Mo. Journal entry twenty seven. 
I'm so glad to be home. Even better, it's not completely dark yet. Is it weird that in just a few days the Cora has gone from being a place of temporary safety and crappy employment to being home? The job I hate saved my life, my parents, Sarah, and a multitude of others. Cruel twist of fate? Our parade of military vehicles came to a halt in the parking lot of the marina. This band of brothers moved to the ship. I was unsurprised to see that the gangplank was not already lowered. Surprise, the rope ladder was waiting for us. Damn crow, we could have had a horde of zombies behind us and might be in a little bit of a hurry. The least you could do is keep an eye out for us. At least think about your girlfriend. She's badly injured, by the way. Not a heartless bastard like the cook, I started climbing. Also, I could lower the gangplank for the injured hammer, by the way. Bradley and his imp simultaneously pounced onto the net and started climbing. Unsure if they were racing me or each other, I wasn't going to put forth extra effort to be humiliated by a monkey. It took me a second to realize what was happening when I saw another rope fall from the deck. Holy shit! Bradley just lassoed his chair and was now hauling it up. Call me close-minded, I wasn't expecting a paraplegic to be able to throw a lasso. By the time I pulled myself onto the deck, the old friend was already lowering the gangplank, making me feel completely useless. Shit, maybe I need to start working out. Once the gangplank was lowered, I made sure to stand there as if Bradley was just helping me and I did all the work. The others came aboard single file. The expert was the first on deck, followed quickly by the medicine man, making a semblance of assistance. Smoke sauntered on with what appeared to be food smeared on his shirt. My dad strode forward with defeat and victorious pride simultaneously in his eyes. Last came Jean, assuredly marching to the Imperial March. Okay, where the fuck did the Oracle get food? Did they really pack the MREs in his truck? Maybe my dad is secretly trying to kill Smokes by giving him diabetes. Actually, he probably just wants the rest of us to starve. Our arrival was fairly noticeable. As soon as the expert could be seen, Crow sprinted to her and attempted to comfort her. She kept repeating the same question. What did them fucking white people do to you? My mother could definitely hear this screeching Apache. She obviously had her selective hearing engaged. Next, Mama came to hug my dad. I intentionally did not hear their private conversation. Then I turned to see Sarah coming from below deck. Stuff like this is never awkward. So, I hesitantly stammered. You heard about Walt? She nodded sadly. Did I just make a statement or ask a question? Though fond of the little redneck and sad to have lost her protector, it was clear she was not in deep bereavement for a lost love. Did you see what happened? She asks as if she really didn't want to know. My dad must have explained the events of Town Hall to my mom on the radio. The love interest surely heard it. All I could do was nod. He made sure to go out with a bang. That was in poor taste. I started my bumbling attempt at making up for it. And he said that he loves you and that everything will be all right. I'm a fucking idiot. Where the hell did that even come from? She smiled and walked closer to me. Like a bumbling teenager, I spread my arms, and she stepped into my nothing more than friendly embrace. It's okay. He just wanted you to be safe. Looking back at this conversation, if it hadn't involved me, I might find it extremely comical. Where the hell did this guy get these stupid lines? They weren't helpful to him or her. Maybe I'd stolen my dialogue from some shitty romance movie. I could have said something about me being her protector from now on. This always happens when I'm with her. Immediately after making a fool of myself, I think of the perfect thing to say. I'm fucking Casanova in my mind. Reckon we ought to get them guns on the boat. My dad spoke to everyone and no one in particular. I don't think the crime rate of Guntersville is very high at the moment. Even if it was, I seriously doubt a petty criminal would break into a detachment of military Humvees flanked by a Bradley tank. For some reason, I thought my dad had a good idea. Maybe it was fate, something that was supposed to happen by the will of the screenwriter. Perhaps it was supposed to be. All the male crew members went down and retrieved armloads of rifles and cans of ammunition. Next, we hauled MREs and cases of water onto the boat. Far from starving, we weren't leaving the food if we were already offloading stuff. 
Okay, this had to be some kind of supernatural mind force crap coming from Smokes. I volunteered to do extra work that was in no way necessary. We were piling the rifles at the center of the deck for the time being. Once my father and I had unloaded our cargo, the two of us made our way over to Crow's fishing spot. The ladies were currently chatting about something undoubtedly pointless. They were eating jello cups that I'm guessing came from Walmart. Jolly Rancher Strawberry? I want one. I didn't really care if the jello was warm. That makes it even better. Plus, that's one of the best flavors they made. Crow reached around her injured girlfriend and grabbed one from the box. She tossed it in my direction. I caught it and turned it up, drinking the warm quasi-liquid as soon as I broke the sail. My dad said something that nearly made me choke. I don't like that kind. It has no flavor. It took me a second to realize he wasn't going to continue. This was actually the end of his statement. The obvious question was on the tip of my tongue. I was in the middle of laughing my ass off. Even as I walked away, he could be heard over my raucous laughter defending himself. The moment was too perfectly comical to be ruined with an argument. Regardless of how uproarious it would be, the hilarity had to ensue. I was one of the lucky few to unload our last armfuls of boxes of MRAs. The sky was now completely dark, so it was easy to see the pile of boxes besides the pile of guns. Shit! The MREs were in sealed packages and could be stored anywhere on the ship, but firearms needed to be stored in a dry place. I knew we had to bring them on board for at least a moment. Maybe Hammer had some kind of waterproof gun safes or something. The ladies had just finished their supper of fish, and I hadn't yet eaten anything except the warm jello. I was starving, tired, dirty, and I'm sure there are plenty other things I could bitch about, but it just hit me. We couldn't leave guns exposed on a boat. Jesus Christ, I exclaimed. Loves you and me, came from my mom. Doesn't seem like it most of the time, Mama. Just as I was about to say something to her, smokes appeared from somewhere and threw a massive tarp up and perfectly squared over the pile of firearms. Okay, maybe he does. Before I could ask where the huge tarp came from, I decided it was better left a mystery. Always supposed to be, right? As I sat down to eat with the others, I wanted to say something about the fact that my mother was supposed to teach Crow to cook something beside fish. Really, I was too hungry to care. I spoke around mouthfuls of food. Hey, Jean. Tomorrow. He looked back at me and nodded. Smokes, you too. I grinned. He pointed at me over his own piece of fish. With a stuffed mouth, he said, For sure, homie. This has been Zombie Lake, Still Alive, Book One. Written by Javin Bonds. Performed by S.W. Salzman. Forward performed by Kevin Pierce. Copyright 2016 and 2017 by Javin Bonds. Production copyright by If I Only Had a Monkey Publishing and Javin Bonds. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.